Mexico is going to be your last Royale champion. Sergio Ramos wins! Huge. And nothing to stop the Hawkrider. It's going to get switched. On the tips of the next hand. It's said that everyone deserves a second chance, but only a select few here at Clash Royale League get a last chance. 24 players have punched their ticket to CRL World Finals, but eight spots remain, and today we start deciding who will join our finalists for that championship opportunity. Hello and welcome. I'm Rich Slate, and joining me is Andrew Guy. And Andrew, this is going to be a stressful couple of days for these competitors. <laughs> That's right, man. 32 of the best players in the world that don't have that golden ticket are be facing off here at our last chance qualifier every single match we send someone home with the paycheck and then the other person gets to live for maybe just one more day but first before we hop into all of these actions 16 best of threes let's first see how we got here with the journey so far What's up, everybody? I am Andrew Guy, and the Clash Royale League 2021 regular season has ended, but 32 more players have their shot at World Finals. Let's take a look at how we got here. And it spends the, the elixir on the goblin barrel. Nothing for the Inferno Tower. And that's GG. Dark Angel sends Samuel Basoto home early. That was a last opportunity for Tico to stay in the competition. He just needed to catch that flying machine. Maybe he could have made something happen with that Sparky. trouble Josh that flying machine on the tower that's gonna do it yeah brilliant awareness he goes in with a lumberjack on the right lane and what does Fawzen immediately do he goes in with the Royal Hogs at the first oh my gosh the ice was there the NATO not gonna be able to get the fireball out in time and it is Yuya taking the game and the big time win Nato does finish things off. Could he freeze here and steal this tower? He could. Freeze comes in. Lumberjack trying to go for it. Not gonna <laughs> happen. Vitor weathers the storm and takes it in game number three. By the skin of his teeth. This oh is gonna do it. Ta has just won $20,000 and we didn't know who he was two days ago. The ta flop there at the end. <laughs> the LCQ competition is fierce as 32 competitors are fighting for their chance at the last eight world final spots. Let's see who moves on and has their shot at CRL history. It's been a long journey for Clash Royale League for everyone, including the four of us here, because it's not just two casters in CRL anymore. Myself and Andrew this year joined, of course, by the world champion coach of Team Liquid, Eric Benamu, and two-time regional champion with both Immortals and Space Station Gaming, Joshua. Ah, crap. Sharon, guys, it's going to be a whole, fun, a whole lot of fun this weekend. And of course, as always, we're glad to have you here. I'm glad to be here as well, and I'm really, really excited for today's matches and tomorrow's matches. They're all elimination games. Yeah, I mean well, it's it, it doesn't get better than this. Uh, this is this is it. 
Well, we'll see you guys uh, very, very soon, in fact, so hang on to your seats. But first, Andrew and I are going to set the stage for what's sure to be a really great and really stressful day the whole way through, Andrew. We've talked about the, the stress of being a professional Clash Royale player. This year has been, of course, a whole lot of work, but this weekend might be the most tension-filled we've ever seen in Clash Royale. It's just incredible how much you can work all year long, building up the points, building up those cash prizes, participating in all the community tournaments, and you can have it all taken away today. That's what's so cool about the last chance qualifier. Let's take a look at our format. As you heard, best of three, 16 of them today. That's right, we got a whole day worth of clash action for you. 32 players are competing, and there will only be eight remaining tomorrow. Moving on to world finals, single elimination, best of three, three in the dual format, no pre-submitted decks, and yes, we have increased the level cap to 14. Yes, there's the Archer Queen, the Golden Knight, the Skeleton King in the gang, in the game, all that good stuff, but that's in the game that we get to play. Today for the pros, they're playing on a separate build, level nine, no champions, classic Clash Royale action. Yeah, yeah, we're gonna be seeing them play the game that they're ready for, and of course, we will see them adapt as we get closer to World Finals. But right now, they need to stay focused on what's going to be a brutal couple of days because, as Andrew said, it's single elimination. We have multiple four-person brackets to get down to our top eight. You can see some of those right here on the left-hand side of your screen. You have to win two best of threes, and you are in the Clash Royale League World Finals. If at any point you lose a match, that's the end of your journey. As you can see, this is going to be a really, really tough group to get through, no matter who you're with, Andrew. Yeah, some of the biggest names in the game, period. Not just the ones that haven't made it to World Finals, but Pompeo, right? Our number one seed here. Ben Zeridel, a former pro. You got some of the biggest names coming up in the game. Bag, one of the most innovative players in the world. Betfus, who just got ranked number one in ladder. There is so much goodness, and that's only one half of our bracket. Let's take a look at the money, right? Because that's all what this is about today is the money and the ticket. Every single player gets at least $1,000. If you lose your first match, cool. There you go. You're out next year and you get a $1,000 paycheck to think about it. If you win one match, you get to go up $2,000 to 3 k there. But if you get to go through to World Finals, you get a $5,000 prize and that golden ticket, which is really the most important thing about this weekend. And you join the top 24, and what a top 24 it is. We talked about it all season, Andrew, but this really feels like it represents the best players in the game. Mohamed Light, Ben, the number one player all year at the top. Lucas right behind him, and rounding out that top five, Sandbox, Viper, and Sam Basoto. But we have former world champions in here. We have former regional champions in here. Some of the best in the business. And again, it's 24 players who've qualified so far. So you look at these guys right here, and then even if you go down to the second half of that top 24, you have Eagle. Igor, a.k.a. K Hazard Y, who, of course, won a world championship <laughs> with Team Liquid. Uh, Air Surfer in the mix. Line, who won the No Tilt World Championship. You just have a stack, stacked competition. Oh, yes, Elsiop with Nova, the first ever Clash Royale League world champion. It's champion upon champion upon champion, Andrew. That's right, and you know every single one of these players is watching so very closely this weekend to see what their competition is going to bring and who is going to make it on through. And speaking of, we got a bunch of matches coming your way, but first up, we got our match of the day. That's right, it's not going to be happening for just a little bit, about four matches down the road, but it's going to be between Schwatzen and Benzer Rydell. That's right, hashtag Schwatzen or hashtag Benzer in the chat. Let us know who you think is going to take that best of three. Who Who's going to be eliminated? Who gets to move on? Let us know. That is our very first match of the day. Oh my gosh, man. I am so freaking excited. Man, it's it's going to be great. We have so many great matches through this. And of course, after this, we have a little break until we get to Clash Royale League World Finals, where it's going to be insanely stacked. But, you know, Andrew, you and I have to wait just a little bit longer because to kick things off, we have a special pair. Uh, it's not going to be me, not going to be Andrew, but let's welcome on Eric Benamu and Joshua Akrab Sharon to kick things off today for our last chance qualifier. Thank you, Rich <laughs> and Andrew and... Uh... Josh, how you doing? We get we get our first cast together. How you feeling? Uh, I'm gonna be not. A, I'm gonna be honest. My pumping. I'm excited for this. I'm a little bit nervous, but I mean these games are gonna be so good. I mean this entire block is phenomenal. Pompeo, Tico, brilliance. 
Yeah, you could be nervous, but there's no way that we are more nervous than these players are. Obviously, we have two players that are very experienced, but we have seed number one versus seed number 32. This is the whole opposite side of the leaderboards. What do you expect here out of Pompeo or Tico? I know we've both been in these positions and sometimes being the underdog is actually helpful. Yeah, and I mean, it's not a real underdog story. I mean, yes, Pompeo is ranked number one, Pompeo has struggled a lot. He has finished seven times in the top 100 on the leaderboards for ladder, but he has not made it to the monthly qualifiers. He has struggled when it comes to competition. Tico, on the other hand, he doesn't have that many achievements, but he does have a top six. A top six is significantly different than a top eight. You made it, but you weren't good enough. Top six, you showed potential. You showed that you can win with the best. Yeah, that's 100% true. The only thing I'm a little bit worried about here is Pompeo does have a lot riding on this. He has all his ladder achievements. He has all of this uh, great career since day one of the game. But I think in the past, he struggled a little bit to get out of his own way when it comes to analysis. So, you know, Tico's been around for as long as Pompeo. He knows exactly what Pompeo likes. And the only thing that really worries me here is I don't want to see Pompeo really go to that Pompeo deck for the same playstyle. Tico already looks pretty prepared in case he came with that deck. Yeah, he has a Goblin Hut. I want to guarantee that he has a Tornado as well, just because it makes sense against him. But yeah, I, I, I really like what you're saying. I mean, I want him to set himself up with a deck where he can potentially use the Inferno Dragon Loon deck that he's known for, for games two or three, but not necessarily use it. I, I want his opponent to be worried, but not exactly. necessarily for him to use that. Exactly. At this point, it's all about those mind games. We've seen duels evolve over time to the point where you don't always have to play your best deck, but you need to leave those cards available to him. And this is actually a really rough push. Yes, you have Valk, but that flying machine still has to get dealt with. And these elite barbarians do work, even though it's just one. Look at all that damage. The Valk is basically gone. Yeah, I mean, he has... It's, it's not very often where you send troops offensively and your opponent has these supposed perfect counters to those troops and then the troops just die and they owe value right there. We saw that happen. That's the reason why Tico's deck is so popular right now because every time you have that Mega Minion for the flying machine, yes, you, you got a three for four, but the flying machine has already taken out 10 elixir worth of cards. It's such a strong deck in the meta right now. Yeah, and you hate to go up against the a fly machine when you don't have a big spell or at least he hasn't used it yet the problem is he always has to use those arrows for that goblin hut and again what we were speaking about earlier pompeo kind of getting in his own way here with the infernal dragon already being used in the first deck you're already letting tico know you don't have to worry about my best deck for the rest of this match because we are in duels format I mean, he could be extremely confident. I don't want to, like, it's it's obviously these players have been practicing. They've been ready for this. You know, they've spent a month anal analyzing everything that they need to analyze. But, I mean, it just doesn't make sense. It doesn't matter if you would try and use this kind of deck. Yeah. Oh, and then that's a that huge flying, flying machine, machine right yeah. there. Oh, oh, oh. That, that's the problem when you have a, a flying machine well when you're going up against the flying machine and you don't have that big spell it locks on you have to use your arrows you first try to you know tank it with the skellies a little bit off on the placement could be the nerves like i said he has a lot riding on this every single person that's watching this broadcast right now really thinks pompeo is gonna move on but this is a very tough group and it's not gonna be as easy as people think again arrows come out early and spear goblins get more value out of this furnace stacking up sim city coming on down for tico yeah and thankfully pompeo is gonna be running a fireball variation and it looks like yeah. it's probably gonna be a graveyard deck um i would be shocked otherwise but yeah i mean so far even though he has given up a bit of damage he's he's still within 250 hp he's fine he's okay he needs to set up for triple elixir obviously that appears to be what pompeo is trying to work out gets the right timing this time and Beautiful. that would have been a huge mistake yeah that was a very risky play just because we all know how good he is mechanically but it all only takes half a second of a mishap there to make that infernal dragon not be in range you have to then overspend and this time around he does have the mother witch fireball used which means that flying machine is now free to go if he can just defend this pretty well 
also no big spell here for the furnaces and this is where it could get a little tricky for pompeo yeah he has the double furnace up right now the mother witch is available and i mean we're probably not going to see another graveyard until about 20 30 seconds every time he has the graveyard wow. he's wasting nine elixir guaranteed he has to worry about the mother witch not allowed to get value that foul huge misplay because that's 200 damage that he can't be given up at this point in time yeah you just cannot risk it and again this is i really really like this out of tico continue to pressure with that flying machine i don't like the mother witch being placed with the flying machine though he oh no wow you cannot make these mistakes i mean we've been talking about it this is where the nerves kick in 1241 the lowest tower for pompeo 1288 47 hp separating the two players right now and the one advantage that we do see out of uh, Pompeo here is he does have direct damage onto tower in the sense that that graveyard is always going to get at least one hit here uh, just because of the deck composition from Tigo. So it looks like he will be able to hold on even though he had a couple of mistakes here. All he has to do is just over defend at this point. You're going to see the Valk, the Musketeer, Ooh. the Fireball comes down. Oh, <laughs> I, Pompeo doesn't cycle arrows, doesn't cycle fireball. He understands the spell damage. It's it's fun not really recognizing how much spell damage is left because it makes it so exciting at the end of games. But he's all right. He understands what's happening. I I'm glad he's all right because I was not all right. <laughs> I just spent a week's time playing on that level 11 and I was worried for him. I, I was like, all right. Never mind, we're at level nine, he's okay. But we've also seen players lose CRL matches for not knowing damage. On this time around, Pompeo won for knowing all the damage that had to be done, exactly how much room he had to play with. And honestly, it wasn't too much room at all. But even if it's one HP, that's all you really need. And props to him for holding on. I do think he needs to clean it up a little bit because if he got away with that this time around, he he's not really gonna have that room in the future matches. I don't know if you want to point out anything in specific here in the first match. Yeah, I mean, I like the deck choice. I, I, I want to go with deck choice because I like the deck choice from Tico. I'm okay with the deck choice. Obviously, it is a victory for Pompeo. So, like, at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter, like, as long as the end result is a win. You do have to be a little bit nervous about him using Inferno Dragon. But that's, I mean, you have to make plays. You obviously this is top 56 these, these are some of the best players in the world there are time to get a little bit cute a little bit crazy and as long as you don't go overboard that's why he wins game number one absolutely and to your point no infernal dragon left for pompeo which means pompeo deck is out this is duels format and on top of that he used musketeer as well so i'm not sure if tico's gonna maybe try and go something air think about it no musk no inferno dragon no arrows no fireball you can run a Lava Loon deck here, and I don't see any options where you can actually stop it. If you can pre predict something of an Inferno Tower or something like that, where you actually run a weird variation with Lightning or that Miner Zap, try to get a prediction. I think Pompeo is a little, a little susceptible to losing to air right now. Yeah, I mean, you kind of have to assume that with the composition of his decks, he's probably going to be leaning towards a Raider deck in game number two or game number three. Three you're totally right he's using all these spells he's using all these troops that are going around uh for air targeting it's this is gonna be interesting for game number two and three yeah and i'm very curious to see what the plan is because pompeo is not going to come out without a plan you and i both know him and he is one of those people that really especially knowing the matchup for this long these players didn't find out who they're playing yesterday they've known for a while he has a full team behind him which at the end of the day is a big deal when you have Chivas behind you you have a coach an analyst a full org I know he was over at the stadium a couple of days ago not sure if it was for prep for this or not but you definitely have an upper hand on someone that is a free agent that doesn't have that full team so I really want to see that put to use, and I think it was put to use in game number one. Like you said, it was an odd deck choice, but it definitely did end up working. Yeah, right there, first a mo from Pompeo for game number two. It's the little thinking face. I don't, I, I, I don't know if he's listening to us, but he, he has thought about it. It's clear right there, and the snowball. I like that. It already means that he's focused around air targeting units, whether it be a loon deck or a lava deck. He's prepared for both of them, and Tico. Gonna be running E-Giant here. 
Yeah, that is a bold choice, especially knowing that Tesla's still on the board. If he would have pulled out a quick cycle Tesla deck that we know how much E-Giant struggles against, if they can just continuously cycle and cycle and cycle, he would have been in a really bad position. Fortunately for him, it does seem like that will not be the case, but Fisherman is on the board, and that is bad news for an E-Giant player. Yeah, so he's going to be running Fisherman plus Mega Knight. No Graveyard on the table, and he's running Poison as well. I mean... What could this be? It has to be Ram Rider? Yeah, it's an odd choice because as I was looking at the cards, I, I think you were going the same route that I was, right? Poison, Mega Knight, Dark Prince, Mother Witch is always Mega Knight Graveyard, especially again with Ewiz. But with Graveyard being out, there's not really any other choice other than unless he's trying to really go something off meta it would suit this group very well seeing as bag is in the group so it would prep <laughs> us very well for the next match but i'm curious to see what that win condition is if it's not a ram rider if it is a ram rider another good way to stop that e-giant yeah i mean he he has a lot of options so far but the thing about these e-giant decks you kind of just cycle them and you do the exact same play 45 times in a row and the 45th time it just works so like at the end of the day even if he it's depending so far and obviously that's what we're seeing this is what it gets difficult you have i mean you get the overwhelm with each giant of value lightning and everything becomes trouble as this game goes along we need to continue to see great defense from pompeo and maybe tico has to use his spells correctly and he might be able to get around it yeah so far pompeo doing great but it is what you said it only takes one bad placement to lose to e-giant once it gets onto your tower if that fisherman doesn't pull the right way or it pulls the wrong troop they get a lightning down to take it off the board and you have nothing to get it off there because he really doesn't have dps when we look at dps look at this mega knight is going to jump there but that is not the type of lightning we're talking about yeah i mean you're gonna get a lot of value with the nato and i mean all these troops are dead but I mean, you're going to be able to cycle back to the correct response when you're Pompeo, Snowball plus Dark Prince, Snowball plus Ewis. Ooh, Baby Dragon. Ooh. Yeah, Baby Dragon is going to lock, and that is going to be a little bit of value. But I just, that, that value, it's just not enough. I don't think we can see him make that play even just one more time. That That is just too much elixir and not enough value. It is one of those cards, the lightning card, where if you use it correctly, it'll win you the game, but it gives you no room for error. One bad lightning will make sure that you are put so far back in your cycle, so far down on Elixir, that there's really no recovering, especially when you have a deck this heavy. And here we go with another E-Giant push. This is what you mentioned earlier. You're gonna get 45 of these pushes per game and you're gonna have to defend every single one of them. But I think Tico here getting a little bit ahead of himself. You need to be patient with an E-Giant deck. You wanna push as much as possible, but you still have to make them count. Yeah, the Fisherman walking back right there is really valuable. It makes it just a little bit easier to hold on and i mean this is just spell cycle versus spell cycle at this point i like that pompeo recognized early on hey my opponent has goblin cage he has dark prince he has e-giant i mean e-giant is actually a fantastic response to the ram runner what do i need to do i need to poison cycle get as much value as possible from that and right here he gets another poison this is a lot of damage from spells as long as he defends correctly he has yeah, it but this, but is... this is a lot this is a lot and that is one of the downfalls to the ram rider you you love it when you're playing against loon right you love that slow but when you're playing against something like an e-giant all that happens is you give him more time to build the push that he wants out of more elixir and then it gets harder and harder but it actually goes to the other lane that fisherman pull was absolutely perfect mega knight comes down as well and it looks like he'll survive but look at all that damage on the left it only takes one push yeah, he has to be careful, has to play it's the Mother Witch at the bridge, and I think he should be good. Snowball coming down, plus the poison. Lightning NATO shouldn't be enough. Wow. That That is uh, Pompeo <laughs> making it through on spells two times in a row, knowing that spell damage is so important, and he wins both matches, but by a combined score of less than 100 HP through two matches. <laughs> I mean, that is just insane. 
brilliant fisherman pulls it to the left lane doesn't have to worry about the right lane damage anymore yes left lane does get low but that's okay he gets the spell damage from his own poison his own snowball and i mean that's i mean that's just so skilled from bombeo two seconds into the game recognizes hey i'm going against this e-giant deck it's going to be hard for me to get damage I don't like that he used the Ram Rider offensively that one, uh, at, at that one point, but ends up not being too big of a mistake, able to recollect everything and gets the victory. And it definitely, like, you can tell that there was a plan behind this deck. It wasn't just two decks that came out of nowhere. This isn't Pompeo-style decks. This is very different to his playstyle. He came with a plan and he understood exactly what he had to do in both matches. Like you said, that Ram Rider almost cost him, and it's just what happens when we cast, you know? You say he's doing a great job by not playing the Ram Rider, and the next card he plays is the Ram Rider. It's just stuff that I, they always like to, you know, make us look bad a little bit, just to keep us on our toes. But Pompeo doing an amazing job. We see the big 2-0, and for his confidence, that is so, so important. We know how much he thrives on confidence, especially in a group like this. You didn't give up too much about your deck style, your what you're coming out with, two completely new decks, because he still has to prepare for tomorrow. Pompeo, you are on to the next round. Yes, you have that $3,000 in the bag, but for someone like him, he's holding on to the world final spot more than anything. And here we go, deck number one, if you want to break this down. Yeah, so right here, game number one, we use a Fireball Arrow with Valk Graveyard. I really like the deck overall. Obviously, we've talked about his usage of the Inferno Dragon, and you brought up the fact that he struggled against air for game number two and three, which is why he brought that Ram Rider deck. Tico, I love this deck. We've seen it become popular. I know Lucas was tweeting about it, saying, I don't want to do this, but... If I need to, I absolutely will, and, you know, anything for a victory. And, I mean, that's the thought process behind this. Anything for a victory, it just wasn't enough. Fly Machine didn't get enough value sometimes. He wasn't able to stack troops correctly. Pompeo was doing a really good job. I mean, arrows are the one card that are just so difficult for, I mean, just everybody to use correctly. Early on in the game, he started cycling arrows on top of the Goblin Huts, and it was kind of like, oh, is that going to be enough damage? Is that going to be, you know, enough damage to the hut yeah. itself but the tower? And I really liked what he saw right there. Just great gameplay from Pompeo. Yeah, he, he's a master of the game itself, not just a Pompeo deck. And you saw it in game number two as well with this Fisherman play more than anything. I think if I have to give any feedback on this matchup, it was definitely winnable for both sides. I think Tico just had to be a little bit more proactive here with the uh, predictions onto the Fisherman. You have to try something on the left hand side maybe get that fisherman distracted but let's look at the bracket we're gonna update the bracket it's just one match but it's a very important match especially for the mexican fans and everyone around that pompeo fan base which if i may say so myself is pretty big <laughs> it's pretty huge <laughs> so uh, yeah moving on we are gonna go down this left hand side and again this is just half the bracket we have a whole nother side and if anything goes to show from the first match it's these players are top top tier we just saw two matches back to back under 100 hp but josh unfortunately you and i will not be casting all of these matches together this is uh my time to say goodbye to you and it was a pleasure casting the first match together with you yeah this was fun i like this maybe uh maybe we should think about doing it again <laughs> <laughs> i'll definitely have a thought on that if it was in my choice but i think it's time to welcome back andrew so he can take the lead of this and i'll do some of the analyzing as well <laughs> what's up man what a great first match there we're gonna stick in north america for our second match one player from mexico another from the u.s hasiel versus bag and this is gonna be a really exciting one because what we saw in that that first matchup was you know a little bit off meta but then we saw the double spawner which is really popular you know bags plan is going to be just a little bit different i mean you just said off meta for the previous match get ready for this one this is a bag <laughs> i am so excited to cast him it is one of the funnest things to do when you are a caster you you get a look at decks that you never thought anyone would ever play but at the same time he needs to be careful this is not yeah. the time to over-experiment. 
I, I could not agree more. And right now, Bag sticking right in the meta, going with the furnace. You know, we've used the word dexmanship for a long time. OP Sam was the original mad scientist out in CRL, and now Bag with our independent format and coming out with some of the weirdest stuff I think I've ever seen in competitive <laughs> play, and I absolutely love casting it. Bag, bottom your screen, Hasiel at the top, and as you said, saw just a minute ago, one player in Tico already eliminated. And you know, one thing I noticed, Eric, from that last matchup was a little bit of nerves coming out of those guys interaction-wise. Yeah, it's tough, man. It, it, obviously, when you get to that top eight in the monthly finals, you're nervous, but you know at the end of the day, you have another shot. Here, it's one match, and you're out. That's it. Your whole year is done. And no matter how experienced these players are, it affects you. I've lived that moment. I've lived it through four CRL seasons, three CRL seasons, through all these playoffs. It just hits differently. And I think it's going to play a little bit against the rookies mainly. But for the most part, we do have a lot of veterans in this bracket. Yeah, absolutely. You know, it's really, really important that when you get to that game two, if you're down one to stick with the plan, you know, we saw Tico going maybe a little bit too aggressive with his Electro Giants in game number one. Let's see how Hasiel and Bag want to do here in game two. That's a nice lightning. Not going to open up for the Prince charge there, but a very interesting Bandit Prince Furnace Golem deck here. And that is a really nice catch with those Spear Goblins. Yeah, and I'm sure you're happy to see Mortar. We know you love it, but Bag again. This is his deck style. It might look very, very weird to everyone, but when I say I don't want you to over experiment, this is what I mean. Like, this is okay. This is normal for Bag's uh, type of deck. You see that very, very heavy Golem decks. He likes to go for that three crown push. If he does get a tower down, you'll probably not even see him switch lanes. You'll just see him completely go full on aggression through the same lane, try to get that uh, three crown and this isn't really too far out. I don't mind this deck choice. He does have to be careful with the lightnings, though. That first lightning cost him quite a bit of damage. Asiel, the 8.8K player out of Mexico who won the ESL Mobin Mobile Open this year. 2021 Ooh. he also participated in the queso cup and right now doing a pretty good job with this mortar deck. As you said, I'm very excited to see mortar very firmly in the meta right now and doing an okay job here against Bag's very interesting Golem deck, but we are not even into overtime yet. Once we get into Triple Elixir and a little bit deeper into the game, we'll see who starts making mistakes. Yeah, that's. I really want to see what Bag does here because as a Golem player, you're used to seeing them go into one lane, right? Bag just had a Golem go on left side, then do a full push on the other lane, and now that we're heading into the last two minutes, Triple Elixir coming down, I really want to see him focus on one lane because this minor chip damage in Triple Elixir will end up chipping you out. You need to get some damage on the board. Right now, Hatsiel has been defending perfectly. Yeah, he oh, just needs to keep it going, yeah. which is a lot more difficult. And you see Bag just eating that damage on the left-hand side there from the Valkyrie. A high Mortar here to pull that Golem in, keep the Mother Witch in the poison, and now Mortar off the board. Yeah, and I want to see when he's going to decide to use the lightning as well. And that is exactly when he decides to use the <laughs> lightning. I'm not sure if it's uh, a good time or not. He's more calculated than I am. The Spear Goblins do not catch it there. So that is a good overall interaction for Bag. And the damage is really, really good right now. If you can keep those miners off the board, make sure you always have prints at least in the back. There's a prince you can no longer push, but... I don't know if he's noticed or not, that left-hand side tower is slowly going down on chip damage. Yeah, I like the lightning there from Bag also because he's going to find himself in somewhat of a spell cycle race if he does not get on tower here, which is going to be pretty difficult as Hasiel's yeah. been playing some really nice defense. But he does have the damage lead and he does have the spell power. So as long as he can keep these furnaces poking and prodding and he can keep that miner from doing too much damage, he should be able to win out with the lightning, which is something we've already seen today is just playing smart with your spells, getting in that good value when you can, and just winning by a hair. Yeah, and that is a very, very important minor catch there from Bag. If that miner does get onto the uh, onto the tower and that poison, we know he cycles so much quicker. So yes, the lightning does more damage, but he can get two poisons before you get one lightning in. The miner has to be played defensive, and that is basically oh, a GG well played. Just a straight overwhelm here, late yeah. game. Bag just overrunning Hasiel, 990 and 943 on his respective towers. Bag hasn't even broken 1K yet, and a great start here. 
for the American, running a deck that really, honestly, when you look at that, the cards that are played, the only ones are the Furnace and the Mother Witch that are recycled a lot in the current meta. I guess you could probably go with Bandit, but for the rest of the cards there, Lightning, Golem, Prince, not quite as popular. What do you think about game number one here? And what would you do planning against Bag in game two if you are hostile from Mexico? I, I am so thankful that Bag was never in CRL when I was there because you <laughs> cannot plan against Bag. I genuinely think that is the hardest thing anyone can do. When I saw Bag in this group and you see the players in it, they're all players that do like to do their analysis and they're very, I, I guess, meta players, right? You know Pompeo's meta, Haciel's. Bag is just a wild card at all times. I do think you can expect heavy decks more than cycle decks because that's what he's most comfortable with. Maybe an RG now coming up, a Mega Knight type of deck. But overall, after that, you have no idea. He's the type of player that, that will come at you with a Mega Knight Triple Witch deck, right? I, I yeah. think more than anything, you just have to focus on yourself and give yourself the best opportunity with what you feel comfortable with. And I think what's really great when you're watching this replay, you can see that Bag, not only is he completely controlling the map, he's creating a lot of great dual lane pressure. He's cycling cards in the back to make it so that Miner is that much less impactful. Whether it's the Furnace in one lane, the Prince in the other, he's setting up the Golems low, maybe to bait out Mortars, but he knows his opponent has to hold those Mortars for defense, but Hasiel still wants to create offense, so he's getting the high Mortars up, but then Bag always has a Mother Witch or a Baby Dragon there, just completely controlling the game with this very, very Bag deck in game number yeah. one. We'll see how Hasiel wants to bounce back. Really tough there though in game one. Just no way to really break through. The minor chip damage wasn't gonna be enough. Um, I, I, that's Bag's plan, bro. It, it is, it is 100% Bag's plan. And it was also very smart. If you go back and watch the replay for people that are trying to learn the game as well, you saw that early on in the game, Bag would go ahead and bandit the mortar to bait out the spear goblins. And then he's yeah. completely switched it up and he started using the Mother Witch to predict the Spear Goblins that were predicting the Bandit. It is those in-game adjustments that will make the difference because not only are you defending the Mortar, you're adding pressure from those Hoggies, and Bag did a really, really good job at that. So Bag coming out with Lumberjack here in game at number two, going up against Goblin Drill, which has really found its place in this meta, this competitive meta at least, but and the general meta over the last maybe two, three weeks, we've seen the Goblin Drill pop up quite a bit. Yeah, it's definitely available again. I think it had a, a little bit of a o overpowered use and then it, is got, it stopped being used. And now it's a little bit back, but it only works in very specific matchups. I think it is a very matchup dependent card. Maybe he can expect something out of bag that we're not seeing here. But in my opinion, Bag didn't really use that many splash cards in the first deck, so it is a risky choice here out of Haciel. He could have easily came in with uh, Dark Prince, uh, Baby Dragon, Valk, all of these type of cards, right? That counter, honestly, pretty well against that. Even the arrows are still a very good card if you need it against that drill. For sure, Arrow's gonna help with the drill, gonna help with that bomber as you just saw there. And Bag maybe needs to slow his roll just a bit as he gave away a lot of fireball value in the opposite lane, in that Dark Prince. Came down the path, didn't get any damage out of it. And Bag going with some six man, some skelly drags, some zappies looking to create some dual lane pressure, maybe a balloon there on the back end. Yeah, uh, this he has to throw something down here. There are those recruits. Obviously, that Dark Prince was going to get onto the Lumberjack. But Bag now has to do the same thing I just spoke about. It's all about the in game adjustments. You gave up a lot of uh, fireball value, you didn't know if he had fireball or not. We know that drill decks sometimes come with no spells. This time around, you know exactly what he has. He's showed you the full deck, and now it's going to be all about that one push. So it is Balloon out of bag. Not a huge surprise there, is that young man does love to play the Balloon. And a nice Tesla to counter for Hasiel, who looks like he's found himself in a pretty good matchup here in game number two. He definitely has all the tools that he needs, but I want him to try and get a little bit more damage before that triple elixir because the same thing we saw in game number one could happen here in game number two. You can very easily get overwhelmed here. Cannon cart, we've seen those slip by time and time again. It's like a little bit of a flying machine mechanic where you're one second late and it takes down so much damage. The recruits are very heavy and all he really needs to do is buy time for his loon. 
Yeah, like, exactly. Like and when you talk did. about getting <laughs> on top of that balloon, it's going to be really tough. You know, the only thing he really has, Hasil really has to control that balloon is the fireballs and the Teslas. Now, lucky for him, he can cycle very quickly with this deck. And I think kind of looking for that two Tesla cycle every single time a six man comes down is going to be really, really important. Yeah, 100%. I think Bag needs to somehow figure out here how to get that Lumberjack in his offensive cycle. He's having to use it defensively every time, and I really don't see that Loon making it to tower without the Rage. There is just too much on defense, like you said. The Fireball, the Tesla, the Quick Cycle, even the Fire Spear, right? It's not going to push it back, but it sure does a lot of damage. So if Bag wants to really get that onto tower, I think it's going to be all about getting that Lumberjack behind the recruits with the Loon on one side, Cannon Card on the other. And what looked like an opportunity to, to do just what you were talking about, Beautiful. Eric, not going to work out as Bag has to overspend to try to create some presence at the bridge, and then the Lumberjack has to come out to keep up with this drill. The cycle just relentless here from Hasiel, which Bag is really struggling with. When you look at his deck, it's pretty expensive to get all the way around. Yeah, and the problem is he's back to Fireball, right? That was even risky play out of back there because it seems like, yeah, he just used Fireball on my drill, but at the same time, yeah, he just used it, but he also just used Fire Spirit, Skellies, and a Log, and he's back to his Fireball yet again. So you have to be very careful back. He almost gave up way too much Fireball damage there. Instead, he got uh, the Tesla used on him and a beautiful surround here with those Zappies. Yeah, it gives up too much fireball value at the bridge, but really just knew he had to create oh, any geez. sort of offense, period. And Bag struggles there in game number two to do just that. I mean, a really expensive deck, honestly, when you look at what Bag just brought out. Getting all the way back around, really, really tough. Creating those pushes with the six man, with the lumberjack, with the balloon behind, gonna be very, very difficult. And then dealing with the building, no big spell to deal with buildings. You just have the snowball to slow down, the arrows to kind of help, but the arrows kept getting baited out by his opponent because the pressure, the pressure was there. And that's one thing that we were kind of talking about early in the game is, you know, if Hasil does not get enough damage in single and double elixir, he's gonna really struggle. And he did just that. He made sure he created his, his pushes, he he made his presence known early on before we got to that last minute of gameplay where he probably would have struggled, but who knows? He controlled this game so well. Yeah, exactly. He never took his foot off the gas, to be honest. And that's what you have to do because the second you don't have enough damage, Bag can kind of sit there and be like, you know what? I'm not really going to be too worried about this. I'll soak up some damage. I'll put my recruits in the back. Then I got my Lumberjack, my split lane push with the cannon card and the loon. Get everything down. But Hasiel made sure that bag had to over defend every single time. The one time that he was able to just put that Lumberjack, Hasiel said, you, you know, I'm going to fireball this, force out something else out of you, force out the arrows as well. And now you don't have everything you need yet again. It was very, very well played. And it seemed like Hasiel felt a lot more comfortable with this yes. deck than with the Mortar deck. And that's exactly what I was just going to mention. Two very one-sided games as we get into game number three here. Bag completely dominates game number one with that Golem Furnace Prince deck with Bandit in there. I honestly loved what I saw out of him from a bridge span point of view, which honestly, when you play those big beatdown decks, we've seen Ruben do it time and time again. You have to know when you need to just start bridge spamming and bagged it just that towards the end of that game. Then you go to game number two and it was really hostile in the driver's seat for the entirety of that run. And it was just because bags deck, in my opinion, was just a little bit too heavy going up against such a quick cycle deck with great defensive capabilities. But now Tesla out of cycle, fireball out of cycle, log out, dark prince out, bomber out, basically no splash damage available for Hasiel. And we'll see how bag wants to take advantage of that. Starting out game number three with the heal spirit. Okay. Yeah, heal spirit usually means hoggies or RG, but with bag, I'm not going to jump to any <laughs> conclusions just yet. Hasiel with zappies and cage usually also means a Hoggies type of deck here. So I'm curious to see if we're gonna go into sort of a mirror matchup in uh, at least archetypes, maybe not exact matchup in, uh, in decks because we do see some differences already, but it does look like we are gonna be heading into a Hoggies or RG type of match. One thing that's kind of fascinating about this matchup already from a duel's point of view is you look and you see that Bag has snow or excuse me, Fireball and Log available for game yeah. number three, which means if he would have won game number two, he wouldn't have used either of the most popular spells in the game. So that is an interesting thing to note here in game number three. Yeah, and it's kind of a double edged sword, in my opinion, because 
you don't want to use it to allow yourself the ability to really leave any deck open but at the same time you give your opponent a lot of information and that's why i love duels it's a full-on mind game if you're hasiel you had to have expected that fireball and log were going to come out now the, those it's very very difficult to play a full match a full set and not see those cards at least once so bag yes you have them available but he just baited your fireball and now that is very very dangerous for him i mean the fireball on top of the six man there and the goblin brawler was one of the most ineffective fireballs i think we've seen in competitive you know it's just taking shields off and then that overspend on the left hand side means that he doesn't have anything available for the right you can see bag already calling good game kind of readjusting here on camera as he knows that was a huge huge misstep and you can see hasiel already celebrating maybe with his coach maybe with his analyst maybe just talking to himself he cannot believe how the opening started here yeah i think back should have had a little bit more composure there it might have been the pressure again we spoke about it Bag usually would not fireball something like that if he knows he's going up against Hoggies, especially now showing Elite Barbarians. You could have easily Elite Barbarian that whole push. They would have taken those out, and then you allow yourself to keep that fireball in hand. But it's not over yet. I don't know how many times we've seen people celebrate too early, and uh, you have Elite Barbs against you, man. I would not take anything for granted. One mistake, and it could still be over. I like that Bag is not giving up. Yeah, me too. I think it's so important to the competitive integrity and to show everyone out there, look, I'm going to lose best of threes. I'm going to win best of threes, but I'm still always going to show good sportsmanship. And right there, Hasiel cannot believe what has just happened. Bag dealing with it like a champion, recognizing the overspend, recognizing the misplay, calls a good game out early on, calls another one later, and we say goodbye to our second competitor of the day. Bag and Tico both eliminated here as Hasiel and Pompeo will face off down the line. And yeah, just a big time overspend. I mean, I guess maybe Log wasn't back around in cycle yet, so Bag didn't see a good Log that could have came out in the left-hand lane. But like you said, E-Barbs hadn't been played yet. That could have dealt with that on the left-hand side. He could have even split his E-Barbs and taken some damage on the left and assisted with the right hand. But that fireball right here, I believe, this is the fireball, yeah. look at that. Takes the Zappies out, hits the Brawler, but three protected recruits up front. No elixir in the tank to deal with this push on the right hand side. And Hasiel knows it right there. You can see, is this going to work? Yes, young man, it just did. And that is a crazy uppercut early in game number three to give him the win. Yeah, when you have a deck this strong defensively, like Hasiel has with the Goblin Cage, the Zappies, the recruits, you play the Firecracker in the back, and then you have a backup lightning if you need it. Getting that one tower down is such a relief because you know. I can basically stop anything that comes my way. I can buy myself so much time that it was, that's why you saw that smile come out. It wasn't a smile of, you know, oh, that was easy or anything. It was a relief. Like, okay, the hardest thing with this deck is actually getting on tower when I'm playing against log fireball. I did the hardest yeah. part. Now I just have to do what I know how to do. Yeah, crazy. I mean, and you were calling Royal Hogs from the opening moments there and bag just not thinking about it. Let's take a look here at the decks that we saw. Game number one. Going towards the American here, running a pretty heavy deck, but it was really great control all the way across, whether it was cycling furnaces in the back on either side of the board, as you were talking about, Eric, those high mother, which is to get those spear goblins that were catching the bandits, the great dual lane pressure, the bridge spam bag was doing everything right in game number one. Hasiel did a good job here. He did a great job controlling and making his poison effective, but just not enough defensive capabilities. Game number two is when it started going towards red, Eric. It sure did. And when you look at this matchup, it's just rough, man. It, you know that there is no shot you're ever going to get that loon onto tower without him having a Tesla back in cycle. By the time you get to your loon, he's gone through three full cycles easily, right? You're not going to use uh, the bomber and you're not going to use the Dark Prince unless you have to use it defensively. So other than that, it's just Skelly's fire spirit drill log over and over and over again and bag did the overwhelming on the first game but hasiel did it on the second one and here we go into game number 
honestly look like he has all the great responses you need. He's got E-Barbs, he's got an E-Wiz, Fireball, plus Log. Of course, there's a Fisherman there to activate King Tower, but none of it really worked out for him. As you saw, Hasiel goes up early there with the Great Royal Hogs push on the right-hand side, and that's pretty much the game right there. When you make a mistake that big, that early on, it's very difficult to come back with. Hasiel can just turtle up, and that's exactly what he did for the rest of game number three. There we go. We have our first matchup tomorrow between Pompeo and Hasiel, both those players from Mexico, and it'll be a lot of fun to see them face off tomorrow. But we are still moving through our day of competition, going to a number one ladder finish as of late with Expo, going and, and, and rad from Fob Gaming. Yeah. Who we've watched for year after year after year. Yes, ladies and gentlemen, he's still here, and he's looking to move on to our world finals. We're gonna go to Betfuss and Rad, and then Schwatzen and Benzer Rydell, which is our match of the day. I saw the chat get flooded. There's thousands of you watching right now. I saw a ton of hashtag Benzers. I saw a ton of hashtag Schwatz and get those votes in in the chat. We'll be breaking those down for you when we get to that match just in a little bit from now. I think it's two best of threes away. Hashtag Schwatzen, hashtag Benzer. Let us know who you think is going to take that first match of the day. That's a little bit later, but right now we're going to a man that loves Expo and a player from Japan who we've watched for a very, very long time in Betfus versus Rad. And Eric, what are you thinking about this best of three? I think the momentum is in Betfus's side. He has everything he needs to win this match. Rad has the experience and no doubt he's a player that has played on every single stage in Clash Royale whether it's CRL, uh, WCG, anything that you can think of, he's played it. So the experience is in Rad's hands, but the really the momentum and the confidence has to be in Bedfast's side. Also the fact that, you know, Mexico has a good record today. So he's gotta be feeling good. He's gotta be feeling like, you know, everyone's behind him. The chat is probably pumping as well, right? Everyone's going crazy um, in the Spanish side. Obviously I can't check our chat, but when you have a community that big and on top of that you just won ladder and then on top of that you probably have pompeo who's friends with him and hasiel who's friends with him talking to him right now you have so many factors that just play to you uh, i i think it's really tough uh, for rad right now and Clash is a complete momentum yeah. game. I mean, it's something that you might want to, you don't want, maybe want to acknowledge it. Maybe you don't want to give it credit, but it really is all about momentum. That's why we talk about the tilt and how real it is. And when you talk about Rad, you know, from Ponos or from Fav, he was a guy that played a lot of 2v2. He was never really a 1v1 standout. He wasn't kind of the guy that came out. We saw him do some good stuff in King of the Hill, but he was never the guy that you leaned on is that ace hitter. Betfuss on the other side of it being a really successful guy on ladder. He's been all about himself for basically his entire career and you talk about the winners of our prior two sets like you said momentum all in his favor but rad has been around for so long he knows the competitive scene in and out he has an incredible team working with him to maybe put betfus on a deck maybe give him a couple good matchups that's the thing about single elimination and best of threes man is it can really go any way any time and analysis is so much more important in these shorter sets and we've seen it all throughout monthly finals as well. Even with someone that we have here in LCQ, right? Ta, a monthly final winner. When you yeah. looked at that bracket, you would have never expected it. But his analysis was better than any single person, I think, throughout LCQ, other than Mo and, and Julesy, right? Other than that duel, that one month of analysis was incredible. It was matchup after matchup after matchup. And at this point, like you said, all it takes is two bad matchups because none of these players are gonna lose the really, really good matchups. They're the best in the world. Really, that, that Clash has seen for a very long time. Like you said, Rad has been here forever. So, Bedfast, please don't be predictable if you want a shot at this. He does have the whole five gaming side analysis <laughs> and experience. And talking about Rad and what he did this year, we saw him in our third monthly qualifier where he was able to take down Samuel Basoto. I believe it was a 2-1 game there. He still finished in the five, six spots. So, you know, showing that he's great in yeah. single player, showing that he's great in the new format, showing that he's great on his own, which is really, really important. He never got that first place finish, but a lot of players didn't get it in our monthly finals. But the fact that he did make it through to that top eight, he did get through to that five, six spot. He did beat someone like Basoto. He does seem like the favorite on paper, but then when we talk about Betfus, all those high finishes coming in the six top 50 ladder finishes just this season with a number one in there 
feels like he is the guy to beat here in our third set of the day. And we've got 13 more best of threes coming your way for our LCQ. A lot of action all day long. And if you're just joining us, remember, every single match is a best of three. At the end of it, it's single elimination. One player gets to get thousand dollars they get sent home the other player gets the chance to compete again tomorrow and then make it on to world finals if they are in that top eight spot to join the other 24 who you know they, i mean they've got to be watching right now why wouldn't they be and to make sure you don't miss any of the action make your make sure you're following along with esports royale en on twitter or all the other languages out there depending on if you don't speak english and of course on youtube make sure you're subscribed and turn on those notifications so you know when we go live and when we go live for our world finals which are just around the corner here we go game number one rad from japan betfus from mexico let's go i'm excited and uh these first two cards are uh are we gonna see expo here <laughs> I mean, it's in his name, and when I meant, like, don't it's be there. predictable, I didn't, it's I meant, there. I, yeah, I, I kind of was hoping that when I meant don't be predictable, it means don't play the deck that's in your name, but <laughs> it's in his name for a reason. I wish I was on camera because my hands were up in the air. I was celebrating. I'm excited to see it, and I think Rad might be a little excited to see it as well. RG coming out early on, log in there, maybe going to have Fireball, looking like he's going to be most tried and true RG deck currently in the meta, which has a ton of responses, but a fast cycle out of Betfus here as that Expo oh. already connects early on. Wow, and uh, this, is, this is very bad news. This is about as bad as news can get when you're playing against Expo, you're playing against a master of this deck because it means one thing. I'm going to sit back now. I'm going to play a defensive Expo. I'm going to play defensive Teslas. And good luck getting anywhere with that RG. The positive side, he does have Lightning, which forces Bedfast to go a little bit on the offensive end. Yeah, I mean, it feels like Rad should have this paper or match locked down on paper. And right there, you see him. Just he's always behind an Elixir at this moment. He's going to have to find a moment to reset when we do get into double elixir, at least figure out a way to and have that RG available for that expo. But that cycle early on out of Betfus was brutal and beautiful. Yeah, and you see Rad's reaction there. He plays the Mother Witch, and I don't know if he was expecting maybe a knight to come down or something. He sees a Tesla, gives a little bit of a disappointed look up because now you really get no value out of that Mother Witch. He had to cycle a Tesla anyway, and I don't, I mean, what can I say? This is part of Expo. You're going to see a lot of spell cycle. He did the damage he had to do. Like you said, yep. the first cycle was brilliant. If it was you or me playing, we would have probably waited two more seconds to, to actually make the decision to get that Expo down. Oh, oh, oh. Wait, this is... Now oh, this wow. is scary the other way. Yep, Betfus misses that Expo pickup, or excuse me, the Tesla pickup on that RG. RG shots come through 1256 to 1282. Wow. Log comes in to give Rad the lead. And now when you talk about who's got the matchup, it's all in Rad's favor. Lightning deal with defensive Expos or offensive Expos. All these ground units that are tanky in the Fisherman, in the Dark Prince, of course, that Royal Giant. And the fact that he does have other ways to get around. The, East, the oh, Electro Spirit no. can catch that Expo. He missed the fire, the Ice Spirit onto the right-hand side. He tried to, I don't know what was the point there, but you might see a little bit of nerves because this guy is someone that has won ladder seasons, right? He has been at the top with the Expo. You don't expect to see these mistakes, but there is a lot of pressure. And I think, like you said earlier on, that is something that plays in Rad's favor. He just has so much experience. On the other hand, Bedfast, a couple of mistakes early on here that let Rad back into a game that I think he had no business uh, really having a chance after that first cycle. Uh, agreed, you know, and, and when you talk about Betfus having an advantage in a really, really tough matchup, he had one handedly early on by beating that cycle. Fisherman is there to catch that skelly, but really looking for something else in a Tesla. RG on DJ. the tower. Good game, and you can see there Betfus not happy with how that went. Lightning comes in. Rad with the turnaround victory. Didn't want to get out of bed for it, but did not need to <laughs> as he dominates game number one there. And Eric, talk me through this from a coaching point of view, kind of what went right and what went wrong all the way across the board. It's all about the defense when you're playing Expo. I was fortunate enough to coach someone like Igor. You've casted Igor's matches when he's played Expo, Lapo's matches when he's played Expo as well, as well as other very uh, mechanically sound players. 
and it's all about them not getting through on this side bedfast had already done the damage he needed to but the defenses had to be perfect and they just weren't a myth tesla there uh, got himself out of cycle defended the rg here with skellies allowing him to uh, spawn in some hoggies as well which added more pressure on top of that a missed ice spirit just needs to be cleaned up a little and it's not that he's of a, of a lower skill level than igor than lapo than all of these players that have played it but it's the experience it's the nerves you have one yep. best of three and maybe it just wasn't the right deck choice for this type of format yeah it's it's tough right because you know we could be looking at this and rad maybe comes out with a horrible matchup in game number one and we go wow betfist is a genius for playing expo it's in his name who'd have ever thought he'd come out game one in an lcq with the deck that he got to the top of ladder with with the deck that's in his name with the deck that you expect him to play 99 percent of the time and then you end up matching up poorly against it. Rad doesn't blink. He goes right into it. Lightning plus RG. Log is in there as well to deal with all those smaller troops. The other thing was that Betfist wasn't able to keep up with the cycle at the end there. We saw that high Tesla come out, and then there was just nothing to deal with that RG. I mean, at least the defensive expo, and then a high Tesla or cycle two Teslas on the board. Not sure exactly what happened there. I really think a lot of it was nerves, but now I wonder, does that kind of exponentially grow yeah. in Betfus's mind. He plays the best deck that he's ever been with and he loses in game one with a horrible matchup. Now what? Yeah, I think mentally you have to, tr this is where you see, right? This is where you see the, the mental fortitude of a player. And to be out world finals, you're gonna need it because you're gonna go down in sets. I mean, we saw yep. those top 24 players and they are no joke. You're going to have to match up against Lucas, Mo, uh, Elsiop, all these players, Mugi, Ruben. So you're going to go down in sets. You're going to lose matchups that you shouldn't lose, especially when you're winning them. And it's all about bringing it back. We already saw Bag go up 1-0 and then Hasiel be able to bring it back. Bedfast should try to get that in his mind. They're both rookies. If he did it, I can do it as well. Just try to reset. And you know the nerves are gonna be there on World Finals Day, but the experience is gonna temper those nerves just a bit. And every single one of those players whose name you just mentioned have competed at the highest level in Clash Royale. It's where guys like Betfus, guys like Tico, you know, even guys like Pompeo, who who haven't been super great this year in our monthly finals when, in, in that regard, you know, they're gonna need to lock down those interactions and some of those nerves when they get to that stage. It's all about who can control them better because I, in a sense, from my opinion, the way I would talk to my players when I was a coach, I would tell them if you're feeling nervous, that's good. You just have to use the nerves to your advantage. You have to use them mm -hmm. as excitement. Don't think of it as I'm so nervous, I might lose. Think of it, I'm just nervous because I'm hyped because this is what I've been waiting for for so long and use that as positive mental uh, attitude rather than negative. Whatever players can transform that into the positive, I think have a huge advantage because there's not one player that's going to go up on that stage. Well, up on that virtual stage, I guess. Uh, but <laughs> that, that doesn't feel the nerves. There is a lot to play for. There is legacy. You only get one shot of, at this every year. <laughs> and feeling the nerves right now is rad. A guy that I've loved watching on camera for years. You can see him smiling, kind of shifting around as they have a stop and stare here for the first little bit of competitive play as we wait to go into double elixir time. We'll see what these two want to do and maybe Rad trying to cut the tension there with a little E-drag and an angry princess. <laughs> yeah, this is the worst part. If you if Rad has a coach or if Bedfast has a coach, this is the worst part as a coach. You're sitting there until double and you're just praying that you pick the right deck because one bad push and it could be all over. You could be eliminated. But it does seem like Lava first play here was not going to work. Oh, he has Electro Dragon. It wow. wasn't that he was trying to break the ice, Andrew. He was letting him know. That is a very, that very fortunate pull there on the Electro Dragon. Going to stop that Inferno right in its tracks. Flying Machine comes down, and already Betfus looking like he's in trouble. Great defense played on the opposite side of the board to deal with that balloon. And now Betfus going to go down early here by just a bit. But nice freeze, actually. A very, very nice defensive freeze. Beautiful defensive freeze, but look at the Elixir difference. He is down a bat on Elixir because this Electro Dragon is going to do everything it needs to here. Beautiful Lava off high, knowing that the pressure cannot build up because there is no uh, freeze in hand for him. He does have everything he needs, and on top of that, Inferno Dragon was out of cycle. Another really nice Kaito out of Bedfest.
Yeah, nice kite there. And interesting to see Bethis send in that bar barrel, kind of just poke and prod. Not going to get a lot out of it in the surprising of a couple of elixir that he might have needed defensively or maybe to deal with the guards that are now on the GG. board. Brad wreaking havoc on both sides here. Eric has already called GG, and that is going to do it. Brad moves <laughs> on. The pro stays alive. <laughs> he can see him celebrating. He'll get out of bed to celebrate, maybe not to play, but Rad from Japan moves on, and that was a very interesting game number three. I mean, we were talking so much about nerves. You can see Rad sitting there shifting, smiling, throwing out the emotes, wiping the sweat off of his palms. And he's the experienced player. Yeah. Who knows what was going through Bethes' mind in those moments. Yeah, and I mean, Rad had it all figured out. Look, he said, I'm going to show up. I'm going to go up against Expo first. I'm going to run an RG Lightning. Then he waited until uh, the double elixir. Realized as soon as that Inferno Dragon was in, I don't really have to worry about this lava. I'm just going to drop an Electro Dragon. Top of that. And on top of all of that, gives up a little bit of energy at the end. I love the emotion. And he's already ready for bed. What more can you ask? This is the <laughs> perfect night for him. Just so well played in all sense. And I and I just, I'm someone that loves to see the player's emotions as well. And, and Rad is someone that, there's something special about, you know, having played so many tournaments, having won so many times and still getting that excited, you can tell he loves the game. That's why you love Clash Royale, man. Honestly, I think you said it perfectly there. You see how hyped someone like Rad will get. He's been around since day one. He's been around since the beginning of my career. I've watched him for so long and to see him succeed today, it does bring a smile to my face. Betfus, very clearly an incredibly talented young player out there, a ladder god, if you will, but maybe just a little bit too predictable out today. He comes out with Expo in game number one. I don't think we really need to harp on it too much more. You look at the yeah. cards in the response of his opponent. It's just a horrible matchup. And then he misplayed this as well because he did cycle really great at the beginning but then struggled as he probably should have as we got into double elixir later on. Let's go to game number two here. It starts with a stop and stare, but Rad had all the answers that you would need. The skeleton dragons to deal with the balloon, the E-drag deal with the Inferno, the guards were make, the guards were so strong late game because the bar barrel was out of cycle. And honestly, one of the most popular decks in the game, the minor guards lava, but he subs in that E-drag and Wow, did that work out well. If he didn't have that E-drag, it was game and an easy game for Bedfast, especially off that uh, Lava first play on the board. It would have been game over right at the beginning. He would have no way of actually breaking through, but a beautiful adjustment. Maybe he expected this out of Bedfast. Whether it was expected or not, I'm giving props to Rad there. And on the other hand, I don't think I, I'm going to be too tough on Bedfast just because it's rookie season, right? It's rookie season yep. and... To even be here and competing like that on your rookie season is a very, very big achievement. So there we go. Two sweeps already and one that went the distance. Pompeo and Haciel will be facing off a battle in Mexico tomorrow. Rad moves on to find out who he will face off in our match of the day between Schwatzen and Benzer Rydell. Remember, hashtag Schwatzen, hashtag Benzer in the chat. We're going to tabulate those results here in just a moment to let you guys know who you think is going to walk away. And Eric, I'm going to do it to you just because I can, just because we're about to get out of here for just a minute. Who do you have taking this next set, Benzer or Schwarzen? I'm going with my heart on this one, and it's Benzer. I met Benzer in WCG and just one of yep. my favorite people I've ever met through Clash Royale. He is one of those that on Twitter, you see him, you know, a little bit uh, quiet but mm -hmm. he will dm everyone and make sure they're okay and just hey you did a great job hey you you he doesn't even speak english all that well and he messaged me hey great job casting right so i just have a yeah. soft spot for him i think he's a great person great player and i'm gonna go with him all right, Eric going with Benzer. I'm going to hop on that train as well. He made a big impact on me at WCG. Just like you said, he went out of his way to speak to me and it, it left a lasting impact. So that's going to be it for now from Eric and myself. We will definitely be back. But for Eric and I, we're going to throw it over to Josh and Rich for our match of the day. We can you know, maybe go get some water or something, brother. Yeah.
Thanks a lot, Andrew. Of course, always hydrate. You are mostly made up of water. Here I am with Joshua Acraft. Sharon, Josh, already some great matches so far today. We kicked things off with an 8 HP win for Pompeo. And now here we are with our match, our first match of the day between Benzer and Schwarzen. And these are two very interesting competitors, Josh. You know, Benzer, a guy who two teams in both Kicks and Chaos Theory built their roster around this guy, where Schwarzen made his way up in 2019 through a series of great performances performances in semi-pro competitions, not to mention Dreamhack and Dreamhack and Red Bull MEO. Thoughts on this matchup for our first match of the day for you and I? Well, I mean, let's let's start with Schwatzen because he's an easy one. Obviously, uh, so talented, but it really comes down to discipline. I mean, with him, discipline takes over, and it, it is the reason why he's the player he is. I mean, you, you see him grinding on GCs. I mean, he had his account max for six months, nine months, whatever it was, and I was streaming every single time I would play a GC. I, he was one of my matches. That, that's just who he is. He just wants to practice. He wants to be better than everybody else. He doesn't care how much work it takes. For Benzer, he's had a, a weird career. Yes, he's had teams built around him, but he's also not had a lot of success this year. Even though everybody knows him as this incredible player, which he is, it just hasn't shown the way that many people have expected. So I'm ecstatic to see him in this top 56. I, I gotta say, I, I feel really good about Schwarzen because he has proven that he's, you know, able to do it this year. Benzer, I, I just, I'm not sure yet. What do you think about the meta specifically for Schwarz? And we know that uh, leading up to his CRL debut in the fall of 2020, we had a Barb Hut heavy meta, which yep. was really good for him. Uh, and as, when you look at the current meta, and of course we are playing in the previous build, that's why you see level nine, that's why you don't see heroes. Um, but what do you think about him in the current meta? And right now the community uh, thinks pretty even, 50-50 <laughs> results from our community poll. So uh, I'm gonna continue that question to you though. Where do you think the game right now stands for Schwarzen and his chances? Any meta where you're using four to six elixir cards, like that's his meta. You know, he loves the furnace, he loves the fireball, he loves Mother Witch and Royal Hogs and those kind of troops. Those with this meta being shaped the way it is, like this is really good for him. He loves the double building. That's almost certainly gonna be a deck that he uses at least once this weekend. And when you already have a set deck that your opponent because yes, your opponent is going to know that you're going to be running a deck like that, but that means you can just build off that, try and, you know, do the anti-meta snipe, anti-snipe kind of decks. He, he has a lot to work with, and to be able to start with all this power, like, he, he's the one in power in this situation, and so it's, it's really good for Schwarzen right now. Well, we'll see if he can turn that into success here up against Benzer, who, as you mentioned before, multiple teams built around him. Benzer, at one time, known as one of the top mortar bait players in the world and uh, certainly more of a cycle player. What do you think has been the barrier so far for him and achieving the level of uh, success that people expect from him? Uh, I, I mean, mortar bait definitely fell off the map. Uh, I think it probably has a lot to do with meta. Um, there were, you know, he was really amazing with Cycle, but when everybody is using Hog Cycle or countering it, you know, it doesn't become, like, it's not as powerful when he's not the only one who uses it. Um, and yeah, I think it mostly has to do with meta. Um, I, I really, someone as skilled as him, it's just hard to believe that it could possibly be due to skill. That That's the thing with him. And you see, Lo and behold, game number one, Benzer is going Mortar Miner. So we'll see if the, the archetype that made him as a player early on can pay off. And so far, he is in the lead as we reach the midway point of regulation time. That mark on the bottom right-hand tower going to be down to 17.05. And he should be able to hold on pretty nicely here as Schwarzen goes with the minor play of his own. Yeah, I mean, he's using Mortar every time he gets it in hand. And, I mean, it's pretty clear to see why. He's getting so much value every single time he gets played. And he's, like, the troops that Schwarz is playing really putting in that much work. He's, you know, he caught the Musketeer with a can card. That was impressive. But, I mean, Schwarz doesn't have a log. So every time he does these minor Spear Goblins, 
he's getting a lot of damage, forcing out, you know, five, six, seven elixir if he just wants to defend it, and then the bat up any kind of uh, counterattack. I mean, this is exactly how you should be playing this matchup. This is brilliant from Benzer so far. 45 seconds left, double elixir on its way. Miner goes to the inside, not worried about Tornado, as he, you can see the eight cards at this stage. Good variance. 857 is the mark. And we are very close to sudden death. We should be making it there unless either player makes a pretty big mistake here in the next few seconds. Yeah, with 25 seconds left, Benzer obviously controlling how everything is going so far, but still a while to go. He needs to make sure that he doesn't overextend. I mean, at this point, the only way for him to lose is basically to overextend. And it's down to 421 with that splash. Just needs to use the bats. I mean, every time he plays anything, these bats are getting two, three, four, five elixir worth of value. This is just so brutal to watch if you're a fan of Schwarzen. Mortar does not connect there, so a little extended life for the, the young German who made his big splash in 2019. Of course, wants to make a bigger one here with 33 HP. That's going to be a GG well played. Cannon Cart gets the finish, and Benzer now one game away from moving on to tomorrow and one step closer to a world finals berth. Yeah, he played that so well. I mean, just the entire time he was controlling the tempo, using the mortar, using the cannon card. I mean, I mean, it's easy. It's a two elixir card, but the bats were played perfectly. Every single time they were played, they got so much value. He was pressuring correctly. Spear goblins at the bridge was getting a ton of value. I mean, right here we see it, you know, one, two, three chip planner as well. I mean, he just couldn't do anything. He had no good responses. And it was just minor after minor after minor. You see just what you're talking about right there, the minor and the spears in. And, you know, with how frequently we're seeing log and bar barrel and snowball to two elixir spells, no two elixir spells here for the German in this matchup. And so you see the bats getting abused. You see the spears getting abused. And this is just a rough one all the way around. And, of course, we were talking about Benzer making his name as a mortar minor player. And what does he do? Game number one comes out and gets it done perfectly. So now, as we move on to game number two, this is interesting on Schwarzen's side because you take a look at the at what was played uh, on Benzer's side. And again, since Mortar Miner isn't super popular right now, since bats aren't crazy popular, spears are maybe mid-tier popular, it feels like it makes it very difficult from an analysis standpoint for Schwarzen's side of the game. Yeah, there are so many decks open to... Uh... To Benzer, it's really hard to figure something out with that. I mean, you definitely are going to be expecting another kind of cycle and or control deck um, because, you know, with someone who's as talented as he is, that's the decks that you want to be using. Um, and because of that, I mean, this is really just a bad mass uh, for Schwarzen overall. He wants to be using these Furnace, Goblin Hut, Barb Hut kind of decks. And that's exactly what Benzer would like to be playing against. He can pressure correctly. He knows how to, uh, you know, force out this amount of elixir so he can clean up with this amount of elixir. I really don't know how he wants to respond right now. This is an interesting question, right? You see the log out on Benzer's side. So that does take away some of the more popular variations of Hog EQ. You know, if you're talking about more faster cycle decks, outside of that from what we have remaining, I mean, what do you actually imagine Benzer is putting together at this point? I mean, without, I mean, we could definitely see a Royal Hogs Earthquake kind of deck. Uh, they can get away with using, um, you know, even just a Royal Hogs Fireball Arrows. Like, there are a lot of different variations with that, so I wouldn't be shocked to see that. Uh, other than that, you know, he can always go Quick Cycle Loon. Those have a lot of potential when it comes to controlling the tempo. And I mean, again, that's just what he wants to do. He knows that every time he goes into a game, he has, you know, he he believes he is the better player. Well, Schwarzen has been uh, one of those guys who's had a strong belief for a long time. His big debut, the big number one, of course, as I mentioned before, got second at DreamHack in 2019, got fourth at the Red Bull MEL, but the big one was part of the Clash Contender series when Existence came out and got a number one finish there, and a big part of that, of course, was the play of Schwarzen alongside many of his German counterparts. So here we go. Let's see if that same confidence can carry over here into this final moment, potentially for him. Snowball cycled on one side, skeletons on the other as we open up game two. 
both players waiting right now, just kind of feeling it out. And that's kind of shocking to see because, you know, we see the skeletons from Benzer. So you have to assume he's going to be going quick cycle. Doesn't surprise me that he plays the troop right now. But yeah, I mean, you see skeletons, you kind of expect him to be just spamming already. Um, but both players playing slow. And there we go, Benzer likely going to be using um, RG Schwanson. Pressuring heavy, and I really like that. Hunter is going to struggle to clean up these skeletons for the graveyard. Yeah, interesting placement on the Hunter there. You can go inside on the tile, and the Hunter does a whole lot better against those graveyards. So, uh, interesting placement there. And then also cycling Mother Witch to open. You know, that's one of those questions that's always tar hard to deal with. You're looking at your hand, you cycle skeletons, and you want to get something on the board, but you look at three options, Mother Witch, I mean four options, right? Mother Witch, Hunter, Mega Knight, and Fisherman. Those are four options you really don't want to cycle without knowing what the heck's going on on the other side of the board. Yeah, a, that's the problem with these Mega Knight control decks is that you get in a lot of cycles where you don't want to play any kind of troop. You know, you have the Mother Witch in the back, and you have ten leader and you're kind of forced to play the hunter as well so you either give a lot of fireball value or you place it too low so that it doesn't get any value on the uh on the troops that are going across the bridge it gets really weird for him and i like this deck he does go with the loon which i really like um and it's just a weird variation snow should be able to clean it up without it getting a shot but even though he is down this amount of damage already and his opponent does have fireball with the graveyard He's still in an okay spot. He can stack, he can do a lot of things to give himself a chance. Double ball, Mega Minion, Cage, and even Mother Witch on the defensive side for Schwarzen against these Loon pushes. So we'll see what Benzer puts together to try to get past those. As we have 40 seconds remaining, Schwarzen's still in the lead, but this is a pretty significant push to the right-hand side. Wow, Ooh. okay, so I like the... I like the fact that he has that spell. I don't really like how he used that, though. He could have won the game if he goes on top of the uh, of just the troops instead of the tower. You're not getting enough value when you go for the tower right there. And yes, you do force out fireball, so this counter push is going to be nice. But I mean, he really could have won that game if he just chooses to lighten the troops instead of the tower as well. Tons of pigs going the opposite direction. Fireball value there for Benzer. 504 is the mark on the top right-hand side, but how will Schwarzen hold on here with the Mega Knight? And he sets the line easily, and nothing getting through. Looking like Schwarzen is in a pretty good spot to finish this thing off. Yeah, he just needs to defend a little bit longer, go in with the Fireball, Graveyard Snowball. As soon as we see it, game should be over. And there we go, Schwarzen taking game number two. So a very nice adjustment here in game number two. And I, it really does feel like a lot of it came down to the hole that was dug for Benzer in that opening moment. Cycles Mother Witch to the right-hand side, or to that left-hand lane, and Schwarzen goes, oh, so your graveyard counter is in the opposite lane at the beginning? Let's go all in. Yeah, I mean, it's as simple as that. He goes in, and I mean, he has the perfect deck to be able to utilize an opponent getting rid of their mother when she goes in with a valk graveyard it's a cheap push with a fan tap that's very like has so much hp and right there hunter i don't know i really don't know if he could have placed the hunter correctly i mean i was kind of shocked that it only got that 1300 hp and then the second thing right here if he goes in with a lightning on the troops it kills me that he doesn't make that decision i mean it he could have brought back this game i mean not easily not easily, but he definitely could have brought that game back if he just makes that one different play. And that's the game of Clash Royale. A couple of small choices that define an entire game and really swing momentum one way or the other. And we saw two of them here from Benzo that worked out very well for Schwarzen. So here we are, game number three. We've gone through two. We're pretty even. And, uh, you know, we're, we're looking at a, one very important part. On one side of the board, you have that Mega Knight now out for Benzer. On the side of the board, you have the Fireball now gone. How much are you expecting piggies here from somebody in Game 3? Yeah, I mean, look, it's, it's hard because it's so easy to snipe a Hog's deck. You know, you go in with a Goblin Cage, you go in, you know, if one person still has Fireball left, you can do that. There are workarounds for the Royal Hogs, even if every supposed hard counter is out. I do like the idea of using it, though. So I'm hoping that we see it. 
Um, I wouldn't mind seeing a Pekka Ram Rider from somebody if they think they control the tempo of the game and that's how they want to win it. I don't know. I like that there are so many options available right now. Mega Knight, Loon, and um, the one from Benza Rydell. What was it? It was um, uh, from it was Mortar Minor for Benzer in game one. Yeah, I mean he has so many things available to him, so it's exciting to see that. And then Schwarzen on the other hand, I mean he still has a lot of the things that he's good with. Uh, he has Goblin Hut available. I really want to see. I mean I really want to see him use that deck. Well, it's an interesting question, right? You, you just that's what, you get the matchup. You're playing as uh, as Benzer. You get the graveyard matchup. You play Mother Witch and have it go that way. Certainly, uh, one of the cards people lean on a whole lot. That's out. Uh, even if he doesn't go Royal Hogs, now that Fireball is gone, if you were a betting man, uh, what are the the chances you think that Benzer puts a flying machine somewhere in here right now? Uh, I, I would say good. I would say very good. I mean, he, I think. I think it's either going to be built around Flying Machine for this deck, um, or it's going to be completely different. Uh, okay, it was uh, the the framing of everything was messing with me. Um, but yeah, I, I really need to see Flying Machine from him. But goes in with a knight. Usually, you don't see those two paired together, so it's going to be interesting. Most likely, Bowler Loon freeze here from Schwarzen, but we'll see if he goes some different direction. Pretty much two decks for the big purple menace at the moment. And of course, we already used the graveyard, so that variation is out as Benzer cycles a baby dragon to accompany his knight. Yeah, there's not very many decks that work with baby dragon and knight and bomber. I'm thinking of one deck, and then it's going to be the cage variation, which I really like. This knight, if it gets enough value, the NATO right here, although I don't know if he's going to be able to NATO that without a... Oh, wow. Brilliantly placed. Barbarrel coming down in time as well. Going to be able to get just outside of the range, so that way the Inferno Dragon follows through with that. And yes, he's down three Elixir, but King Tower activated. Crown Tower is not touched at all. Great spot for Benson. How impactful is that King Tower activation against this specific deck, right? I mean, there are some decks where a King Tower activation is absolutely massive, but against Bowler Loon Freeze, it feels like the main impact here is just this demands that the freeze goes inside against King Tower as well. Yeah, I mean, there's so many different interactions that happen with just a King Tower activation. You feel a lot more, um, like, it, it feels a lot safer when you just use your Goblin Cage for the Loon. It feels a lot safer when you just use the Baby Dragon and the NATO back. I mean, you're, you're not giving up any damage if you play it correctly. Like, there are so many different ways that you can defend now and before it was just like just one option available now that he has the nato right here if he doesn't have that king tower activated we're looking at damage graveyard in now for benzer in response baby dragon tanking for the gy bowler slowly working and preventing most of this damage but the barbarian from the barrel sneaks on through and just like that the lead slides on back to indonesia benzer riddell up 1857 to 1814. yeah that was kind of actually a hilarious interaction uh right there the electro jack halts the progress of the bar barrel barbarian to go forward and the bowler actually misses the shot because of that right here though Gets the tower damage, 385 left on the tower for Benza Rydell, but he only has Freeze and NATO, so it's definitely not game over just yet. That's one of the things about this deck. Uh, I know a lot of you probably are facing this, especially in challenges, and it's one of those ones where, you know, there are some decks where you go, okay, it's Spell Cycle, I'm done, this is one to stay in the game, and you see Benzer right now happy to switch lanes, and again, put up some pretty significant damage, but look at that damage on the left-hand tower now, down to 226. Oh, oh boy, God. wow, what a play from Schwarzen. Nato's the baby dragon in the princess tower range so that the electro dragon can chain the damage on tower, puts the finish on, and that is high IQ play from one of the best young players out of Germany. That is an insane play to be able to pull that off. I mean, just the... I mean, the reason why that play even became a thing was because it was a perfect interaction. You know, you realize your opponent is going in. Okay, let me bar barrel at the bridge. That barb gets that one shot. And because of that, he's able to get one of the most impressive chains. I mean, such a weird play. I don't know if I've ever seen that 
be pulled off in that situation. That is so intelligent from Schwatzen right there. Yeah, no, I'm that. That's so nice. I just went and clipped that one over on <laughs> Twitch. So, uh, yeah, I gotta go ahead and take a look and, uh, at that one back. And this was an, such an interesting matchup, right? This was you, you, we talked about that Kane Tower activation early. Lots of defensive options, but one thing that Benzer didn't have here was a great aerial single target DPS card to put on that balloon. Yeah, the difference between having Bomber and Ice Wizard was so apparent in this match right here. Bomber just not able to get that much value. And, you know, in the previous replay, there might have been potential to bring the Loon to the King Tower. And you're you're given so many different scenarios when you only have Baby Dragon and NATO. It's so difficult to make the correct one every single time, especially when your opponent is making plays like at the very end. It's so interesting because Schwarzen had already played Fireball, and that's the main reason why you wouldn't want Ice Wizard in this matchup, right? Because with Ice Wizard being rebalanced a while back, Fireball now one-shots Ice Wizard. I'm really curious as to why he went with the Bomber variation and not the Ice Wizard variation, but we'll talk about that in a minute. First, we go to game number one, and this was all Benzer. This was Benzer doing classic Benzer. Mortar, Miner, great cycle play. And from this game, it felt like Benzer completely had Schwarzen's number. Yeah, I mean, he wasn't even using the fireball on offense. He was just playing troops because every single every single time he knew the exact interaction that was happening, what exactly was going to happen next. And that way he could set himself up for the future. Every single time he was doing anything, it was the exact correct play. I was blown away from game number one. Cannon cards to protect Musketeers, not allowing his opponent to set up defensive mortars. And that's one of the things that I was thinking about with Schwatzen. Maybe there could have been potential for him to try and defensive mortar. He was just on his back legs the entire time in game number one. On the entire way, but then game number two, things switched around. And, you know, you play a game where you have Mother Witch up against Graveyard. We look at the rest of these pieces, and that really is the only phenomenal defense. You have Hunter as an okay defense from Benzer, but Schwarzen had every single answer for this balloon. You talk about it, Snowball and Fireball, two knockbacks. You have the Cage, and then, of course, the Mega Minion. And we talk about comparing this game to game number three, where we're talking about how you play against the balloon. Schwarzen had multiple ways to control the balloon, and, of course, that aerial single target damage. Yeah, and then game number three, Obviously, you know, play of the day so far, was able to pull off that chain, um, but just solid, solid interactions throughout. Didn't panic ever. Even at the end, his opponent went in with, I think it was a big dragon grip, and he catches everything, only gives up 500 damage, and then also has, um, you know, a counter attack as well in the right lane. I mean, it was just solid gameplay overall, and you're... He just was able to utilize the fact that his opponent didn't have the correct responses brilliantly. Still, just what you were pointing out, I don't know why he didn't try and use the Ice Wizard variation. That might haunt him when he thinks about, you know, if he did anything wrong. Well, that's a question of how much are you really playing and thinking about dual mode, right? People are so used to playing Bomber in that graveyard deck for the moment because on ladder, you know, you're going to run into Fireball and you'd rather give up a two for four trade rather than a three for four trade. But I, I don't know how much Benzer, you know, I, I'm casting a lot of tournaments outside of CRL, alongside CRL, Queso Cup, uh, be it the most recent version of it. I haven't seen a ton of Benzer there. And so I'm wondering how much time he's spending inside of dual mode competition. Yeah, I mean, that definitely... I, it, it, I mean, we saw right there, you know, definitely not enough time when you're making, you know, I mean, and yes, at the end of the day, he could be worried about, you know, Royal Hogs. And so maybe that's the reason why he was going in with the Bomber. You know, we talked about Royal Hogs being able to get a lot of value. Um, there are, you know, that's the thing about deck or dual deck format. You know, there are a thousand options to you and you have to work with so many different ways. Uh, it's just... It's, it's tough for him. It really is. Well, going on to our next matchup here, you just saw Dark Angel up against Sato. Dark Angel came up through Arena Casito, through Team Queso's development program, did spend some time in CRL, had to step back for a bit and maybe re redevelop as a player, but it does seem like he is playing some of his best Clash Royale in 2021. 
Yeah, and I mean, you can tell he's he's one of those players, you know, alongside Bag. You can tell he enjoys what he's doing. He runs all these kind of weird decks. He runs Witch. He runs Witch Healer Giant. And one of the first uh, months, it was the most impressive thing I've ever seen. And it's it's just very entertaining to watch him play right here. Miner just in time. Inferno Dragon on the left, a half health lava gives up a little bit of damage, but I think he likes what he's seeing so far. Good pressure on both lanes, and the Inferno Dragon has to force out a response. So that lava going to get a bit more time over on the right hand side. Zap to clean up, but that's not going to have to clean up all that damage. But both players got land, and wow, Sato just running all over that left hand tower down to 437. Yeah. Dark Angel believing that it's the better play to go in with the lava instead of overextending using the incorrect troops in that manner. And I kind of like that. When you're going against these giant decks that have a lot of pressure, it's hard to get a lot of damage when you need it. So if you think that you have that elixir advantage and then this is the time to strike, like I really like what's happening, especially if he's able to get just a little bit of damage with these pubs. Loon coming down, and that's going to be towered down. I really like that play. This matchup is so difficult. Your opponent has e Wiz, Mega Minion, Fireball, and the other thing is pressure. When you go in, your opponent can go Prince at the Bridge, and you don't really have a lot of responses besides Skellies and Miner, and your opponent goes in with a Zap. I like what he's done so far. So what's the key for Sato here? Definitely down, but not out at all. 437, that left-hand tower, certainly that's going to be in danger. Yeah, it's important for him to not worry about the left tower. He's not going to win unless he is able to work around that. Um, he, he can kind of focus on that late game because he does have minor fireball. So as long as he's practically right here, we see it tower down to 169. That's what he needs to be focused on. He needs to be focusing on trying to get a bunch of damage in both lanes. And now it's just, can he defend this push? Loon into that left-hand side. Fireball does knock it back a little bit. Miner gets onto the E-Wiz, and this Lava Hound's going to pop, put a lot of pressure down. The Inferno Dragon is a real danger here, but can it get on tower into enough burn? E-Wiz comes in, and wow, Sato does hold on. Both players in a whole lot of trouble. Balloon now trying to put pressure on everything that Dark Angel can do to keep that Fireball from being ready, but it's going to get down anyway. Sato! takes game number one, and good job staying focused, knowing the spell damage, which isn't always easy these days, <laughs> and making sure that tower falls. Yeah, I really like what he did there. He didn't panic. Yes, the left tower's down to 450, and what do 99% of the CR population, like, what, what are they going to do in that scenario? They're going to continue to work on the left. What does that allow your opponent to do? It allows your opponent to stack. He can get, you know, the bomber in the back. He can do Inferno Dragon. And at that point, he has 17 Elixir, all of the troops fully healthy, and then he can, you know, stack Lava Hounds, go in with a Loon Push. So what does Sato do? He goes on the right lane. He pressures, uses the e was correctly on defense. That is just brilliant. I mean, the... These players so far today have shown incredible levels to their gameplay. And I mean, a lot of it comes down to recognizing matchups and recognizing what they need to do in order to win in any kind of scenario. But well, one of the interesting things about this competition specifically, Josh, is that they're coming in today knowing they have one best of three against one person. So you talk about the preparation. You know, you, you know how you don't have to tell. I don't have to tell you how much preparation went into your matches in CRL. How much you guys practiced. Hey, not just here's the deck, the deck plan that we're coming in for. Let's practice different variations of the matchup. Let's talk about how we're going to actually build it out. Uh, you know, you're, I think what we're seeing today is when you only have three games at most to think about, you can really not just plan, plan out your matchup, but plan out how you're going to play each matchup that you think you might be up against. Yeah, I mean, it is so entertaining to watch players when they are playing these guys. And yes, I mean, the, the amount of white bar, whiteboards that we have drawn up, you know, this deck against this matchup, this matchup, this matchup. Oh, it loses against this. Boom, let's erase everything and start all over. Like, it is horrible sometimes trying to work through everything. And right here, I mean, we're seeing it. Players are, you know, setting up their own whiteboards, setting up their own kind of thing and finding those decks that work against every single deck. So here we go. Game number one. Sato does have the advantage. 
So we'll see if uh, Dark Angel can get things back on track. Dark went lava yeah. game number one. Looks like he's going fireball bait here in game two. Yeah, and then Sato going to be running what looks to be uh, quick cycle bait. I haven't seen this deck in a while. So I really like this deck choice from Sato. And then Dark just going to be running probably... Oh, I'm trying to think because I was thinking that was going to be... Okay, yeah. It definitely appears to be like the double uh, hut deck. I'm not sure if it has Zappies, but I mean, Dark Angel obviously is one to, uh, to you know, mess around, fudge a little bit with the decks. So I, I, I still can't confirm anything with it. Canicard does break down just outside of the range of that right hand tower, first minute away. And it has been Sato drawing the first significant blows as he splits a wall breakers up high, Zappies in reply. Dark Angel could be running a Mega Knight variation, and if he is, I'm going to be a little bit upset about that. I'm not a huge fan of the Mega Knight variation. I don't think it's as strong as other ones, uh, because you just don't cycle well enough. And uh, right here, Dark Angel recognizing, yes, he can give up a little bit of damage. His opponent should only have Log as his spell. And so as long as he makes it to double, triple lick and allow himself to be able to stack correctly and try and take princesses off the board, he should be okay unless something crazy happens. He just needs to defend, which is obviously a brutal task against these kind of bait decks. Wallbreakers to the left-hand side. Heal Spirit to help slow them down, although one does connect and the Goblin Barrel in. And it looks like Sato has recognized that he is not against any small spells here. So just abusing that Goblin Barrel and the Wall Breakers early on. Yeah, so he is giving up a lot of damage on the left lane, but obviously Dark Angel recognizing, you know, I can give up a ton of damage as long as I'm not giving up the tower. And his opponent is still going to have to like switch lanes. Like he just, he probably won't be able, unless he just gives up that damage. It is. It is so interesting watching Dark Angel play this game. Does get the tower down here. 25 seconds left. One more Goblin Barrel in. Let's see if Dark's holding on to anything. Nope, tower does go down. So, and I guess he didn't have the Elixir. I feel like he had the Elixir for that Mega Knight. So I guess he did thought that, hey, the log would finish it off anyway. Why not? King Tower down to 1688. And as we go into Sudden Death Overtime, Dark does have the advantage on damage. But still keep an eye on that lack of a response for those two small bait cards. Yeah, so I was trying to understand, you know, what is his spell? Because he's obviously not going to be running a Royal Hogs deck that just has no spell. I mean, he's not that crazy, you would have to assume. And right there, Poison coming out, it totally makes sense. That's why he's struggling against the Goblin Barrel so much. But he's at this position where that's okay. He doesn't really need to worry about it. King Tower is activated, so as long as he plays the troops on top of the other troops, you know, the towers are going to be able to clean those up nicely. And Fly oh. Machine locking onto the tower. e -barb as well. This group for Sato. It's a game that it really felt like Sato had control of, but, you know, we talk about that single target DPS and uh, when you want it, and the cannon cart just wasn't sufficient here against the Mega Knight and the e -barbs. We're going to go ahead and see the finish come in here in just a moment. Sato making a valiant effort. Not going to happen. And now we are going to game number three. Yeah, I mean, Dark Angel I just... I, he's one of the most entertaining players in the game easily, in my opinion. It is so exciting to see what he's going to be running. The fact that he's letting these Goblin Barrels go through and, you know, it feels like he could unite on top and then he just doesn't it feels like he could do this and it's just not happening i mean it, it's kind of hard to explain his plays and so it's just entertaining to just sit back and watch see what he wants to do yeah you look at this moment and you think hey here you are sato has almost no damage on his towers he's got the left hand side down to 823 you feel like this is getting really really bad for dark angel and then this push comes in and I, it, I think it's the Mega Knight E-Barb combination pressure there where Sato didn't feel comfortable controlling the Mega Knight with the Cannon Cart, so played the Cannon Cart very low. Yeah, and the other thing I have to add with Archangel is that, 
you know, with his obsession of using these kind of crazy decks, you know, it's very important to recognize, you know, does he need to try and make this a 2-1 game? Does he try and need, or does he need to try and make it a 3-2 game? Right there, he needs to try and make it a two-tower game. Can't allow that kind of damage and not try and get a counter push. And so he allows a lot of damage, but then gets a lot of damage himself. I mean, just, it's so exciting. It's, I just, I can't wait for game number three. This is gonna gonna be a great game three now, Josh. Here's a, a really important question for you: uh, Who is more insane to game plan against, Bag or Dark Angel? You know, I think. Uh, uh, wow! Wow! Great question, Rich. Um, let me see. So, Bag, I've always felt like I've kind of had his number when it comes to like game planning and stuff because you know i've known him for so long it's it's more fun when i play him you know there's not a level of stress when it comes to dark angel it really is just kind of you know i think he's going to use like a real deck and then he makes one or two variations that kind of flip it it's it's a lot more stressful to go against dark angel and then bags decks are just more entertaining overall that's certainly a great way to put it entertaining <laughs> Uh, but so far here, lots of entertainment between Sato and uh, and Dark Angel. You know, we talked a lot about Dark Angel on his side. On Sato's side, Sato's been around the league for a very, very long time. Started in CRL way back with uh, with Sandbox, and then moved on to Team Timing later in his career. But he's been through the CRL ringer for quite a long time and has had a fairly decent amount of success. This is the first time, though, it feels like we're getting to see him shine totally on his own. Dark Angel could be going in with Hog Earthquake, uh, and then Sato still really don't have an idea what he's using. He could be going with Hog Earthquake himself, actually, now that I think about it. And the uh, classic goblins in defense of the graveyard. So it's GY on one side here for Dark Angel, and pretty well defended on the part of Sato, and the Hog does go left-hand lane. Yeah, so the goblins are going to be really nice against these graveyards. It is just going to get so much value. The snowball is going to be able to take it out mostly, but the goblins are always going to force a push of 11 plus elixir. You know, he has to have, you know, the Mega Minion or Valkyrie plus the graveyard, and then it also forces out the snowball or fireball. So when you're running these hog decks with goblins, it, is allow it allows you to use goblins, you know, block set the bridge pressure with hog so if Sato plays this correctly he's in a very prime position to be able to win this game but it is very difficult just needs the pressure really really hard keep an eye here on the goblin can to the left hand side doesn't use it this time you saw dark use it last time not everyone knows this one, but you can fully counter a hog rider with a goblin cage played in the lane where you see the mega minion right now and that cage will do the nice even trade you have to put it in that spot, though, and make sure your Princess Tower has plenty of time to get that counter down. And speaking of counters, Sato taking care of business here at the bridge, getting the cannon cart off its wheels. As we go into double elixir, the difference right now, 21-10 to 1832. Yeah, Sato right now is just kind of cycling Firecracker. Every time Sato has the Firecracker in his hand, he should basically be playing, placing it down. And then also trying to utilize the Knight in a way where it just... Like, it just puts in work. Every, every single time he plays the Firecracker, it should get a lot of value. Every time he plays the Knight, it should get a lot of value. And when you have two separate troops that are getting that kind of value, you can, you, you're can you allowed to cycle Earthquakes on nothing. It, it doesn't really matter. As long as you don't overextend, you're fine. Cannon Cart played high to protect the Princess Tower on the left-hand side. 1484 is the mark as the Hog Rider tries to sneak on through, but gets pulled to the Cannon Cart at the bridge. That is a completely wasted Hog Rider in that moment as Cannon Cart does go down to its off its wheels. And just like that, Dark Angel has the lead and Sato forced to fall further behind on Elixir to prevent that Valkyrie. 
Yeah, brutal mistake right there. Trying to use, I mean, I was talking about it earlier. You know, he can block the bridge. He can use the hogs at the bridge in order to draw the or draw the troops back. But right there, cannon cart dying. So that way the hog goes to the cannon cart instead of bringing the troops back. That is a really rough spot for him. And it totally changes the tide of the entire game. Does Sato need to switch lanes here? I mean, he does have that left hand tower way down, but it feels like he's also feeding these graveyard pushes. I think, I mean, actually, I really like the idea of switching lanes and then trying to uh, spell cycle if the switching lanes doesn't work out. Uh, and yeah, I, I think it, he absolutely cannot go same lane at this point and try and win just based off of, you know, placing troops and, you know, cycling spells that way. He has to outplay at this point. 791 remaining on Sato's left hand tower there. Does have two lanes down, just as we were talking about it. Sato does start playing the right-hand side, so we'll see what Dark Angel's defensive response is. Pre-EQ in plus Snowball. Hog Rider trying to sneak on through, but the Snowball in response keeps it off the tower. Yeah, no damage right there, and there we go. We do see the Graveyard plus Fireball. Snowball used on defense. Hog gonna get two shots and get the tower down to 914. Almost 700 after the spell cycle and already back to another hog. This is getting incredibly close in a game that I thought was almost over. EQ in on one side, fireball on the other, 246 remaining. Does Dark Angel go graveyard one more time on the left hand side or does he play defense? Hog trying to sneak on through, Snowball puts some more damage. 470 is the mark, EQ not going to be enough here. Dark Angel takes the win in game number three and is going on through to tomorrow. Wow, what a game from Dark Angel. I mean, using, I, that is a very difficult matchup. And yes, it comes down to Sato making one huge mistake. But I mean, that's patience. That's, you know, using the snowball correctly. There was a lot of times where, you know, someone else might have used the snowball on offense when he needed to use it on defense. There was a lot of interactions. His life pretty difficult, and he was able to get away from him. We've seen Fireball Snowball a few times today, right? It's not as common as Fireball with other small spells, but we've seen it a couple of times, and it really felt like that gave Dark Angel a lot of flexibility on both sides of the board. Yeah, it really did. I mean, it, there was just so many opportunities that were taken away from Sato because of the way he used his spells. And Sato did a great job of using, you know, the Knight at the Bridge to block everything. But the offensive snowballs from Dark Angel that allowed the skeletons to overwhelm this. And then right there, you know, another great snowball forced out. Another, I mean, it was just really solid how everything was done from Dark Angel. And it was and also saw... really good from Sato as well. Yeah, you saw a few moments ago that cannon cart going down at the bridge and pulling the hog rider back. And then here's where we get into the into the system, right? Where Dark Angel has it locked down. Snowballs on defense, fireballs on offense. Happy to get the damage in and clear out room for those graveyards. And that was the GG well played. Just making it so hard for Sato to get the damage he wanted. And uh, there you go, Dark Angel with a bit of a celebration and very, very excited to be moving on to tomorrow. He has a chance to win 2,000 more dollars and, of course, a spot at Clash Royale League World Finals. Yeah, absolutely, and I can't wait to see what he's going to pull out tomorrow. Uh, you know, we are going to be looking at some more brilliant decks, I'm assuming. Got to assume that. And, uh, yeah, I mean, overall, that game, I really like how everything went. I think Sato played a great game. It was just that one mistake that happened, but overall, it's just fantastic. So here we go, game number one. It was the giant double prince up against Dark Angel's Lava Loon Miner. And this one felt for a minute like it was going Dark Angel's direction, but Sato did a great job of locking things down. Yeah, I mean, it all comes down to the fact that he was willing to four go side, you know, 450 HP on the left. Does he want to go into that lane? No, he goes all the way on the right side. Giant, Prince, Mega Minion. Ooh, Tower is down, and the E was on defense. It was able to stop everything. Just difficult work. And Dark Angel maybe not making the correct plays. You know, maybe instead of in the, uh, like the second Lava in the pocket, maybe he goes Loon in the pocket and the Miner on top of the E was. There was a lot of just weird plays, and that's what happens when you run Lava Loon with only arrows weird situations occur you don't know the correct play and sometimes there is no correct play and then game number two 
It, it was struggle the entire time Sato had control. The Goblin Barrels were getting insane value every single time, but Dark Angel was able to overwhelm eventually gets everything going down the bridge you know the mega knight the e-barbs the mother witch everything going down the field and then eventually the poison and royal hog cycle to take the second tower and here we go on to game number three the one that we just watched and the graveyard play of dark angel and maybe he had a good read on this one recognizing that he was very likely up against hog rider and with the goblin cage snowball and fireball not to mention the very very excellent blocks able to stop that hog rider from getting in the rhythm and it felt like every single time the Hog Rider came down, it was just a minus four for Sato. Yeah, I mean, every single time he was flipping what should be happening, he was placing the Goblin Cages correctly. Um, so that was really nice to be seeing. And then, yeah, I mean, it was just brilliant gameplay in game number three. And that's just such a difficult matchup to know when you're supposed to pressure. I mean, for both players, really, you know, you have to know when to pressure, you have to know when to control. Um, it was just a great balance of the two and just overall really pleased with what happened right there. And here we go into our next game. <laughs> they already jumped onto it. It's Mark versus Chief Keef. So here we go. Mark gonna be, actually it's gonna be both players running a Goblin Hut type deck. Uh, Mark not going to be running, well, possibly not going to be running the Mother Witch variation. Keith with a Mother Witch variation would make you assume that you have this huge, huge advantage, but Tower already down to 1018. Maybe that's not the case. So we uh, obviously can't go back in time and see what the, the first minute was, but we'll be here for the remainder of it as uh, Keith out of Italy with an 8.7K personal best takes on one of the 7,328 players signed by Chasmat Gaming this year. Mark with an 83-33 on ladder. Right here, 682 already with one minute and seven seconds left to go. You don't often see a minor poison deck getting a tower below 2,000, it feels like, before double, or before, yeah, before we hit double. Uh, but right here, somehow, some way, he was able to get it through. Mother Witch, Mega Knight, plus Fly Machine. It's a lot of troops on the board, but at this point, Mark has such a defensive deck. Mega Minion for Fly Machine, Zappies for, you know, any troop, really. I, I just don't see Keith, especially now that he's given up, I don't see Keith coming back from this. Yeah, you know, I think at this point, we could probably call the game for Keith, more likely than not. Uh, and this is just a, a rough turn of events for him, and I'm sure. <laughs> CMG is celebrating all over. I, I do see some CMG emotes in the Twitch chat. So uh, I, it looks like uh, a nice number one win here, and we'll see if Mark can replicate that success in game number two. Yeah, he, we don't even see a single smile from Mark. He is zoned, like, he wants this. And, uh, you know, I really like that. I every Every single time I see a player with that kind of face after a win, you know, the stoic face, they just want more like that's what I want to be seeing because the job's not finished. You know, you even if you win this, yes, you can celebrate. Yes, you can be happy, but you want that one more. You want to be able to win tomorrow as well. He's got a long way to go and he knows that game number one, though, really well played. Gets the three crown. That might be the first three day. Yeah, I think we, we might have had one where it got down to two King Tower games. I'm trying to remember if that was earlier today. <laughs> Uh, but yeah, not not super common at this level to see a whole lot of three crown games, especially in the current state of the meta. But Keith recognizing that that was a GG a well played and time to reset and move on to the next one. Now, interesting to note here that uh, on Keith's side, we've talked about this already, the idea of uh, how many counters there are to those Royal Hogs. But Keith did just burn through a lot of them. Yep. And uh, yeah, I mean, it. It's gonna be interesting. I, I, it was such a weird deck, Mark, to be running Miner and Poison and Mega Knight and Goblin Hut. It's gonna be interesting to see what he wants to use for game number two. Um, I would love to see Royal Hogs from him, uh, but you know we've talked about it. There's a lot of different decks that you can use in this meta, um, so you definitely can't zone in on. Him. And then for Keith, he used. A, I mean, he used Goblin Hunt, he used Royal Hogs. He's kind of in this weird spot where he's taken a lot of 
the good troops and one of the best win conditions and and he lost so this is a rough spot for him to be able to try and come back from this it certainly is a rough spot we talk about the nerves here josh we haven't seen a lot of players wave the white flag today uh, you know, it's been a long time, obviously. It's been since 2016, since your first uh, competitive moment. And, you know, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but your first time playing on camera, your first time playing in front of people, I mean, what do you tell a, a young guy starting about uh, how to central, how, how to kind of get control of those nerves and focus in a moment like this? <laughs> well, the only thing you can really tell them is to try and limit the mistakes, try and limit the nerves, try and limit, you know, <laughs> the things that are going wrong. Wrong. At the end of the day, when the lights are on, this has never happened before, your hands are going to shake, your hands are going to sway, you are going to make mistakes. What can you do about it? Sometimes nothing. But if you're able to limit the mistakes and put yourself in a position to win, like that's part of it. That's, that's part of the struggles of being a pro player in front of the camera, in front of this. So it's difficult, but you have to try and assess the situation and try and fix it. But yeah, it's tough. Don't, don't get me wrong, it's very tough. Chief Keef trying to hold on here against the giant from Mark. And Chief Keef, one of the players who didn't make it deep into the tournament very often, did make it to the round robin stage in his final month, in month eight, but made most of his points this season out of numerous top 100 ladder finishes. Finished top 100 on ladder, seven out of the eight seasons this year for CRL. Yeah, that is a, uh, uh, it's a pretty good ratio when it comes to ladder finishes. Top 100, nothing to scoff at because, uh, yeah, I mean, to be able to finish that so consistently, there, there is not very many people who can pull that off. And then Keith going to be running P.E.K.K.A. against Giant. I know what you guys are thinking, P.E.K.K.A. versus Giant. That can put you in a really good spot, but Giant Graveyard, it's not a real Giant deck. It's this weird deck that kind of sometimes, it, it, it's just hard to understand, hard to know when you actually even have a good matchup or not. I can't wait to see what happens in Double Elixir. He is setting himself up to be able to go in and he poison. So Giants, uh, Giant plus Graveyard will be able to get damage. These are two players who have made their way to this stage in very different methods. You mentioned before a moment ago that Chief Keef did a lot of his based on high ladder finishes. Uh, Mark gained a lot of his points, not by ladder, but by performance in the Swiss brackets, even making it to the championship weekend at one point in our second month, but right now has to hold on, and the arrow's gonna do a nice job of cleaning up that scar. Yeah, gonna give a lot of damage up to the uh, to the baby dragon, but tower at 329, he has the earthquake, he has the arrows, that's gonna take multiple sides, and so the giant plus graveyard will be able to pull off something special if he can defend this, but it's not gonna happen. Ram Rider gonna take it, and that's game over, just like that. Snowball there very late, the Skarmy taken care of by the Baby Dragon, and that felt, Josh, a bit like a cycle issue for Mark on that defense. Yeah, I mean, really good awareness from Keith to be able to go in with a Ram Rider. I mean, the Baby Dragon in front of the Ram Rider push, plus the Earthquake, just a weird situation overall. Um, but, you know, he recognizes his opponent doesn't have anything for it. He can't snowball in time. So he just needs to attack, attack, hurry, hurry. And right there, we saw it just in time. Snowball coming just a second too late. And game two going over to Keith. So a great recovery there by Chief Keith. And a good adjustment here by a player who has not had the same kind of success competitively that Mark has had. So now here we go. It was Giant Graveyard. Or I'm assuming that last card was Graveyard here from Mark in game number two. And... You know, it's it's interesting. You, you, we talk a lot about how much we move towards cycle, but you've mentioned a lot, and we see a, an example right here in this matchup, how much the game right now is based around four elixir cards, give or take one. Yeah, I mean, every single deck is basically built around the support troops. I mean, you know, the, the win conditions often aren't being played more than one or two times, so you need those support troops that are gonna be able to control the game, control the tempo, control how everything is set up. So that way you can overwhelm with your win condition. It's it's totally different than how it used to be. People would use the win condition, then they would use the support troops. So Chief Keef does have Fireball left after using Snowball, Poison, Earthquake, and Arrows. 
If you're on Mark's side, what are some decks you're avoiding at this stage? Or is there anything you are avoiding? Uh, so you don't have to worry about Royal Hogs from Keith, and you don't have to worry about Pekka or Ram Rider. Um, that leaves a lot of things available to you. I don't think... I think, I mean, if, if I'm, and you've only used Minor Poison and Giant Graveyard, I've used weird decks, you've gone against some of the staples of the meta, you have everything available to you, I would like to see him use a meta deck, I don't really like Giant Graveyard, a lot of the times it struggles unless, you know, you're the best Giant Graveyard player in the world, um, so I would like to see him maybe lean into like a Hog Cycle or a Royal Hog Cycle or something like that where it's control but it allows him to be placing troops often bandit for mark to open up and royal ghost with electro spirit in response from chief keith and mark looking like he might be going with a bridge spam variation does have fireball left obviously we just saw the giant out from him and there it is ram rider bridge spam from mark yeah, so Mark going to be running Ram Rider Ridge Spam. Keith going to be running RG. And Mark saw him say what? I think he's quite frustrated. And this is much damage to be giving up so already. 1426 under a minute of game time happening. So you see Mark making the call here, knowing that Keith already played Pekka. That's not available. And. Decides to go Ram Rider Bridge Spam, but Chief Keef just holding off right now. This much damage, having not played what we assume is a Royal Giant quite yet. Yeah, Royal Giant going to come out. And again, another weird interaction with the uh, Ghost. The first Ghost uh, for Keef was able to make it to the tower, even though it's this kind of weird thing where the Ram Rider hopped over. And then right there, the Ghost post to hit the other Ghost before it became invisible. Not happening. And Mark going to take a lead after this is just interactions that are kind of weird and not, a, you know, interactions that we often see happening pretty often in this game number three. Passing halfway through and Mark cycles Pekka knowing he's up against Royal Giant. Can, can you talk me through that play from Mark here? Yeah, so usually you can get away with that, but the problem is when your opponent is so smart and you've played the RG deck as often as Keith has, you know your opponent is going to follow this up with a part that able to defend against the RG. What do you do when RG is at the bridge? Ram Rider. That's a brilliant response. That's why he follows it up with a Hunter. I really like that, but Mark, not, you know, not worrying about that kind of pressure, is able to get the left tower down to 632 and still holds the lead right now. RG in now, you is in response with the Bandit on the right hand side. Fisherman trying to make enough room there for the Royal Giant to get two more shots and put this within spell damage range. And now down to 248. And the Ram Rider does barely connect on the left hand side. So here we go, 238 to 248, 10 HP separating these two as we go into our final 12 seconds. Wow, really like how he placed that. Zap should be enough to get the Fisherman, but no, doesn't place the Zap on top of the Fisherman. And he's not going to be able to defend the RG. Keith is going to win this. Oh my word. You see the attempted play there, trying to get on both sides by Mark. Holds the RG back, doesn't have the defense, and the Fisherman just shuts down the Ram Rider. Chief Keith moving on to the next stage of our last chance qualifier. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, it doesn't make sense to me why he goes in with a Ram Rider in that fashion if he's not going to try and zap the fisherman giving i mean it's it's giving up your entire offensive push and the e was plus bandit the e was plus ghost the pekka alone is not going to be enough for rg just a miscalculation at the end of the game and just a brutal way to lose it keith playing well playing good enough to win with rg versus pekka <laughs> This was such an interesting overall scenario. This was that Pekka cycled in the back and just not enough DPS to prevent a huge amount of damage on the right-hand side. And it felt like maybe, just maybe, you'd see Mark get away with one, but, you know, didn't use a zap there to reset the tower and make a little bit more room for that Pekka to get in. And here we go. This is getting close to the end. And this is the RG that got a ton of extra damage with the Fisherman's support. Ram Rider does just barely connect. 
10 HP advantage. But as we go into the final few seconds, talk us through this last interaction here, Josh. Yeah, I mean, it, it just, it happened where he goes in with a Rammer over the and it does get a s shot on top of the RG, so that way it slows it down. But then he just wasn't able to get the zap out on time for the Fisherman. And the previous push, he had also messed up another zap interaction where he actually zapped nothing instead of the Hunter because his troops were able to kill it off before he thought it would. So just two huge mistakes from Mark, and that's how you go from having almost complete control to just losing the game. Game number one, pretty similar looks in a lot of ways, but key differences here, the Royal Hogs versus the Miner. And uh, that was just well played here by Mark, pretty much shut things down and had what looked like complete control in game number one. But of course, game number two is when things began to shift over towards the Italian in our matchups. And as we do go on to our deck number two here, and just one moment, we'll take a look at that one and get on to deck number three. And here we go. This was the Pekka Ram Rider against uh, Giant GY. And Josh, this was one of the more interesting matchups of the day. Yeah, Giant Graveyard, it's just such a weird deck to be using. I like it, and, you know, it wasn't a terrible matchup. He gave up a lot of early damage, but he was able to make a comeback. Giant plus Graveyard was able to get the tower down to sub-1,000. But we saw it at the end of the game. The reason we don't use the deck is because there are a lot of instances where if your opponent is playing well, is a thinking player, you can't defend certain pushes. He goes in with a Baby Dragon in front of the Ram Rider, plus Earthquake, knowing his opponent couldn't get to the Snowball in time, and that's how you're going to lose it. That just doesn't happen. Really smartly, great awareness from Keefe to win the game in the fashion that he did in game number two. And here we go. Pekka Ram Rider Bridge Spam in game number three. And Mark really making a call here, seeing that the Pekka was already out, seeing that the Mega Knight was already out, uh, a Snowball was already out, a lot of options to help slow down or deal with the Ram Rider, but still unable to hold up against the Royal Giant play of Keith. Yeah, I mean, it, it was just kind of a weird game overall. There was a lot of interactions that went poorly for both players at the beginning of the game. But it doesn't matter how you start, it matters how you finish. And the RG was able to get the final shots. Mark wasn't able to zap the Fisherman correctly more than, or, you know, once right there, and then wasn't able to zap correctly on the push before that. And Keith able to make the comeback 2-1 flip after losing game number one. So Chief Keefe and Dark Angel will both be in the lab for the next 24 hours, getting ready for their matchup tomorrow. Winner will move on to our Clash Royale League World Finals. Loser will leave town with 3,000. But coming up next, look at these two matches we have coming up next here, Josh. <laughs> Yuya versus your former teammate, Lapakati, a.k.a. Lopkins. And then Hajime and one of the all-time great ladder and bridge span players in Wero. So we have a, a really great couple of matchups coming up next. Yeah, the most ridiculous group of death I have seen in any competition in the history of ever. I mean, insane players, all four of them are arguably top 24 players in the world. Lopkins, uh, Yuya, I mean, just brilliant players everywhere. And I mean, I cannot wait to sit back and watch this. Lopkins, I mean, obviously I, you know, he, he's one of my great friends, so I'm gonna be rooting hard for him. But I mean, all the players are gonna be exciting to watch, but definitely rooting for Lopkins right now. Well, you'll be rooting, of course, uh, from the comfort of your chair, because we're gonna go ahead and say goodbye to you, Josh, for a little while and bring on my counterpart and longtime Clash Royale League co-caster Andrew Guy here in just a moment. Uh, let's see if we do have him. There we go. Hey, yeah. Andrew, we get some we get some meat on the bone here for these next couple of ones. Yuya and Lapakati coming up next. And uh, you and I have had a lot of chance to watch Lapo uh, throughout his career. And of course, you know, one thing we're playing on camera today, I don't know if he's going to play seated or standing, but uh, the, the Lapo dance, the hip sway, maybe that moment <laughs> when uh, we first knew that Lapo was a special character. Yeah, a true momentum player from Belarus there, Lapakati on the right side of your screen, going up against Yuya from Japan. I'm a huge fan of Lapakati. I love his interactions. He's got some of the best micro in the game out there. He's one of the most devastating cyclers to ever play and one of the best mortar players that have ever touched Clash Royale. But on the other side of it, Yuya, a guy that did some work in our first monthly competition. Uh, he just beat Muhammad Light and Ruben, by the way, and he 2-0'd Ruben. So not a big deal getting fourth place in our first month. You know, Yuya, 
is definitely here to stay. And before we hop into this matchup, we do have another match of the day coming your way. It's a couple matches down the road between Faust and our number two seed, Cody Go. So hashtag Cody Go or hashtag Faust in the chat. Let us know who you think is going to walk away with that best of three. We saw the last one there. It was split right down the middle. Would love to see that here once again. But now back to the action at hand, Yuya and Lapo. Rich, how are you feeling about this matchup, man? These guys are exceptional. They're both very evenly matched. When you talk about what they've done on ladder, um, obviously Lapo having a little bit more experience in CRL. This is one of those ones where uh, a few, you take me a year back or maybe a year and a half back, and I would have no question that I'd pick Lapo 10 times out of 10. Right, especially after his run in 2019, where he was a clear rookie of the year, especially in that spring season. Uh, you know, Lapo just doesn't has not seemed at his at his 100% all firing on all cylinders self as of late. I think that this is obviously going to not answer all the questions here in two best of threes. But if Lapo's at his best, obviously a great pick. The question is, which version of Lapo do we get here? So Lapo activating King there, and you see a wow coming out from him. That's not great already when you look at what he has to offer. A very, very quick cycle control deck here. So maybe Nerves already getting to the Belarusian. Yuya on the other side of it, our number five seed. Let's see if he can replicate the greatness that he found in month number one with, uh, it looks like a support whale, Rich. Or shark. Yeah, right? Uh, yeah, that, that, I think I think that's supposed to be a shark. So we'll go ahead and give that its, it's shark props. And interesting, uh, both different directions. Lapo, no surprises here, going super, super fast cycle. And Yuya going drill wall breakers, but a more bridge spammy variation. Yeah, drill wall breakers, really, really strong. You know, it was obviously incredibly popular when drill felt broken out in the meta. But now that drill has kind of taken a backseat to the current meta, it's starting to come back a little bit. And wall breakers is always a great way to kind of uh, magnify the effect of the goblin drill. It's so much harder to defend that six elixir push when you have to deal with it on the front and back end. Wall breaker in behind the bandit. Bandit still tanking, so the Electro Spirit has to come out. Nice cleanup there by Lapo, and you do see the big breath taken as he realizes just how close that one was. So drill in on that right hand side. The good thing for Lapo is he does have such a great fast cycle. He's got the E-barbs to come down and deal with that drill to give him a good counter push. And he's got a lot of really good responses to take those goblins off the board. So just going to be happy continuing to earthquake cycle. And he is truly, Lapakati is truly one of the best spell cyclers in the game. Bandit in the middle there to help clean up on that Tesla. So great work. Let's see if... Lapo does decide, no, does not turn this towards the King Tower. That's going to be a lot of damage in, though, Ooh. on that right-hand side. And he, and you can see there, he, he flinches because he misses the log on that Royal Giant. Royal Giant gets a ton of value, and then the Tesla comes down late. Lapakati, Lapakati dips his head there. As you can see, he has made a big mistake in a couple of interactions, and his tower is both around 1,600 HP. You know, there are some players, Andrew, that we note for how stoic they are. Lapakati's not one of them, has always worn his heart on his sleeve in every moment of his Clash Royale career. And we're seeing it right here as the Magic Archer does line things wow. up. 1247 to 1940 as we head into sudden death. Yeah, all balls bouncing in the direction of Yuya right now. All the interactions kind of going his way. Missed logs from Lapo, late Teslas, lineups that are completely unintentional. All things going the way of the Japanese player at the bottom of your screen. 1031, the lowest tower on the board. E-Barbs to the left-hand lane, Magic Archer and Royal Ghost hold in here and EQ does finally start coming and cycling again. Look, this is still an EQ log deck. If Lapo can sew up his defenses here, he can still do a whole ton of spell cycle on that left hand tower, but he does have to start making some real important defenses. Yeah, and you can see there again, just hand to the face as that Royal Ghost connects on the left hand lane. Pressure relentless here. Magic Archer gets piercing shots through and will take that Firecracker off the board. Again, Yuya's Magic Archer work has been so clean this game. And Lapo in trouble. Tesla does hold on with the log 692, the mark as we go into Triple Elixir. About 1,000 HP, 1,002 precisely, and the Royal Giant does finally come out to that left-hand lane. So not super worried about a King Tower activation here in this matchup, but so far it's been the defensive side of the board that has been the issue for Lapo. And a nice NATO Archer lineup. That's going to be a GG well played here, I believe, although this Royal Giant does hold up top for a moment. 
Beautifully played there. I mean, you talk about that lineup, just a perfect NATO back to pull that. Everything in range of that Magic Archer. There's another NATO there, 11 HP remains. You just need to get it back around one more time. And you kind of said it at the beginning of this set, saying that Lapo didn't seem to be himself lately. And I was also mentioning how he's so much of a uh, momentum player. And both of those things seeming like they're ringing true, but maybe both as a negative for Lapacati. You talk about him being a little bit rusty in interactions, looked like it there. And you talk about momentum kind of going all in the favor of his opponent. Yeah, it's really, it's really interesting. There are some players who I think really benefited from being on stage and being surrounded by a team, and some players who do that was more of a challenge for. Lapo, I think, was really at his best when he had a team he was playing with, and actually was someone who rose to the occasion playing in front of a big crowd. I, I think this is one of those ones where being on his own has been more of a challenge than, uh, than being with a team was for him. And you see right there, the Elixir was in hand to get that Tesla down, but Lapicati was just slow on the draw. He was at five Elixir when those wall breakers were placed. Could have got the Tesla down. He offsets it to the right-hand side a second late, and it's just all bad all day. And you see the Royal Giant coming out very, very late in the game, but this Magic Archer lineup was the nail in the coffin. It felt for a second like maybe you see some some life coming from Lapa with some RG spam, but as that Magic Archer put it all the way down, and you see just one more drill finishing off that 11 HP, and that's a, a nice win there for you. So does go into game number two with the advantage, having played the uh, the drill, which, you know, you, we talk about Andrew in dual mode playing cards that don't interfere with many other decks. Drill, uh, drill and Bomb Tower, both not super popular right now. So that's a really nice win here for Yuya. Yeah, you set him up, I'll knock him away because that's exactly what I was just going to say, man. These decks, I think the one thing that you'd want to hold on to as Lapicati is you go, okay, great. I lose game one. There's so many great cards that he can no longer use that Yuya no longer has available. But when you look at what he just played with Magic Archer, Drill, NATO, there are so many decks that are so strong in the meta that are available right now that Lapicati, I think, is going to have a very difficult time pinning Yuya down on a deck. There's so much available out there. And then we also talk about what's unavailable for Lapo. Really, it's just the Earthquake and the Log. So for Yuya, I think he probably goes back to comfort here. He probably goes back to what he's been loving in the meta, whether that's Royal Giant, whether that's Lava Hound. I think the world is his oyster at this moment as Lapo is struggling in game one and did not get a bunch of cards out of play for game two. Minor for Yuya, cannon card to pick up to open things off. So we'll see, is Lapo going with a minor mortar variation like we saw earlier today with cannon card or is he going more traditional right now either for graveyard or royal hogs? And it is mortar to the left hand side. So that's the big question is, did Yuya recognize that in this situation with everything on the line, Lapo might go comfort? Yeah, we'll see here as Yuya has a Mortar of his own, a Valkyrie here to catch the logs. This is another deck that lapicati has been playing very, very regularly on ladder. And you can see Lapo does get a connection on both sides, one with the Mortar and a little bit of those piggy hits coming through. But Yuya in a very good spot when you talk about his responses. That was almost a perfect pre-log there from Yuya, but a tile, two tiles off instead of getting the Spears, just uh, kind of did nothing and let that Valkyrie walk right into the trouble. So delivery comes down here for Yuya, and Lapo is going to have a lot of good answers to catch the Miner, which is going to be really, really nice for him. And obviously, these Mortars are going to face off a lot during this matchup. First 90 seconds away, and so far it is Lapakati with a slight lead as he sets up Cannon Cart to that left-hand side. You know, you, you kind of look at it, it feels like Yuya does cycle a bit faster just with the couple of five Elixir cards in Lapo's hand, but not that much faster as you look at the averages with those Spear Goblins. Yeah, not a whole lot faster. And, and Yuya, though, I think one of the best things on top of having a, a fast cycle is he has so many responses to those Royal Hogs, the Log, the Valk, the Delivery, the Mortar to pull him to the center, every single thing there. And of course, the Ewas even to reset the Mortar and to slow down those Hogs. Yuya in a very good spot matchup wise. We have not seen spells yet from Lapo at this point. EQ not going to be part of this deck, so we're kind of expecting that maybe a Fireball is in here. Could be going Poison as well, but Earthquake was burned in game number one. 
So Yuya looking to beat one of the best mortar players in the game, who's rocking mortar royal hogs, and Yuya is going to do it on the shoulders of spell cycle and minor chip. That's a lot to ask. Well, this is one of the. This is an interesting move here for Yuya because you know you look at Lapakati and you look at his crew, right? Lapo, Igor. Uh, Dreaming Legolas. Fly, Legolas. You look at that crew, and one thing they're known for is beating people with their with their own decks, right? In fact, at CRL last year, great moment where Lapo ran Igor's Royal Giant Triple Spirit Troll deck against Igor for a win. Yuya taking a page from that book and going, okay, what am I going to do here on the stream? I'm going to try to beat Lapo running Mortar Miner. Yeah, I mean, that's and, and right now he's kind of feeling the hurt of Rock and Mortar Miner against one of the best to do it. Like I said, he has a lot of great responses to deal with the Royal Hogs, but when you talk about the offensive presence that Yuya can create, it is very, very limited. It's just Miner Chip, Spell Chip, and Earthquake Cycle. That's it. And right now he's down by about a mile when in regards to the way he can make up for that 800 missing damage. We haven't seen a lot of EQ being played on these Mortars. He's using, he's been using the Mortar primarily, Yuya, to defend the mortar as opposed to to pick up the piggies. You think that's a change he needs to make? I mean, I think what's going on right now with Yuya is that he's just kind of sl too slow at the beginning of this game, and he gave Lapo too much damage early on, and the amount of control that he had, he never really used. He was always taking damage every single time to get units on the board, which I think is actually not a bad idea. But those units making it across the bridge with a knight, a muskie, and a cannon cart with a royal delivery up high makes it really, really difficult for you to get anything over that bridge across that river. Miners coming in, earthquakes coming in, but Lapo's still ahead. Damage in both lanes right now on Yuya's side, 812 and 872. This time a mortar with a Valk will pick up this Royal Hogs push, so that does work out well for the Japanese player. Miner goes to the inside front. Lapo with a great pickup with the Knight. Yeah, great pickup there from Lapo, and like we said, one of the best to do it with Mortar Miner, so he's probably keeping very close track of where those miners are going and where they have not gone yet. And Valkyrie here doing double duty for Yuya, but it's just not going to be enough. He needed to create more offense. And, you know, it, it, he did a good job, right? Earthquakes coming in, logs coming in, miners coming in, but just tough to keep up with this type of wind condition. A lot of those deliveries late, uh, as you saw a couple times there in the end. So Yuya falls behind early and Lapo gets the win, but no celebrating yet. You can see the stress on the face of the Belarusian. We're going to go to game number three here in what has been a pitched battle thus far. Yeah, I mean, it has been a, a lot of fun seeing these guys go back and forth. Lapakati completely in the driver's seat for the entirety of game number two. Yuya's damage felt re like prevalent, but not relevant. It was always there. Miners were coming in, earthquakes were coming down, but they were never anything that drew a lot of attention out of Lapakati, which we saw the exact opposite in game number one. We saw game number one, Lapa was running around with, like a chicken with his head cut off, which was very uncharacteristic. So maybe feeling a little bit of those jitters, feeling a little bit of that, you know, shaking off that ring rust. And then in game number two, looking a lot more like himself, aggressive when he needed to be, catching a lot of those miners, and again, taking damage to create a lot of offense. Prevalent but not relevant might be the most accurate way you've described anything with the most possible syllables in two words. That was awesome, <laughs> but totally, totally on point here. Tons of offense, but not not doing much and not applying much. And Lapa was able to stay ahead of the minor pretty significantly and got a nice win here in game number two. So game number one for Yuya was the RG or was the was the drill deck with wall yep. breakers. Game number two went mortar minor. On Lapo's side, we went with the Royal Giant Cycle deck and now Mortar Royal Hog. So as we go into game number three, we just saw Lapo go a little bit heavier. We've seen a lot of the cycle cards be used already. It becomes really difficult to try to make some calls on what Lapo might come out with here in game number three. Yeah, you know, one of the things that I think would have been appetizing for Lapo in game number three would be going to Hog Cycle, knowing that Tornado's out, knowing that Bomb Tower isn't in play, but he used Earthquake in game number one, so not going to be able to be used here. So in game number three, honestly, what I think I'd like to see, again, because Bomb Tower's out, because NATO is out, because Delivery is out, I'd like to see someone maybe go to the skies. We've seen how strong Lava can be. Do we go Lava Loon? Do we go Lava Miner? What exactly is it? Do we go Loon Freeze? I think those would all be somewhat interesting 
interesting just because of the fact that Tornado is not available for his opponent. Then on Lapo's side of it, no Earthquake, no Log, no Poison, no Mortar. So you don't have to worry about Mortar Chip or Mortar Miner, which is something that Lapo is really great at. I'd love to see maybe Graveyard, and Lapo decides to go bait. Okay. Princess at the bridge, and he does know his opponent doesn't have Log anymore, so you understand a reason why, and looking like it might be Royal Giant here for Yuya. Yeah, it does look like Yuya's gonna go RG, so what building does Lapo have? That is the question, and also what spell is Yuya rocking? Is he going Fireball because he hasn't used it yet? Or is he looking for a bigger building and he has Lightning, maybe, if Lapo did want to bust out an Inferno? Fireball available in both directions. Bomb Tower, the only building used by Yuya so far. Tesla, the only one used so far on Lapo's side. So Barrel plus RG, you, you're going to feel a little bit better about his situation against Bait, having that Bar Barrel in hand, and of course, also having that Mother Witch to turn some of these softer cards into piggies. And that that last exchange didn't result in much offense for Yuya, but you're seeing what it did result in, which is enough of an Elixir advantage to play Royal Giant in the back during single Elixir, right? Typically, if you play RG in single, you're playing it when you get a big advantage at the bridge, but instead, Yuya playing it way in the back, and you see that results not just an Elixir advantage, but also a nice 400 HP damage lead. Yeah, and right now Yuya just doing a great job deck-wise. You talk about what he's going up against. He has the barrel for the Goblin Barrel. He's got the Mother Witches and the Fisherman is kind of cheap responses to those baby cards in the Dark Goblin and the Princess. Hunter here to help with barrels as well, but you talk about that lightning, man. That lightning is going to be the X factor as you saw how much damage came in from that one RG push as you highlighted from a great, great recognition of being up in Elixir. Well, I mean, you called it here as well, Andrew. You're talking about with the lightning being in the mix, and just in case there was an Inferno, and that exact thing happened out here. Inferno Tower, nice call here from Lapo. Yuya may be a step ahead with his spell pick. Fireball up high, good fireball value for Lapo as he is trying to get this RG across the bridge. Valkyrie get pulled away, but the second one comes down. Lapo doing a great job with the fast cycle. Final 30 seconds of regulation play, 16-12 to 11-50. And Lapo does have the Fireball for the Mother Witch when needed, doesn't need to use it here. But having some trouble getting real offense down as we get deeper into this game. Yeah, that Mother Witch up high was maybe not the best decision. You worried about, you know, not getting a tank in front of the Princess Tower in time, drops the Mother Witch up high, kind of a waste of his Mother Witch's cycle and that four elixir, but obviously just trying to be very careful. Didn't want that Dark Goblin to get on tower. The fisherman from Yuya continue to be smart there, played in the middle to control that princess, and that's a nice, that's a get a game winning yeah. lightning right there. Very, very nicely done. 168 remains. There's no way Lapa can put enough damage down fast in, in, in the time remaining, and that's going to be a GG. This lightning, you see the Inferno, a nice call from Lapo. You see the lightning, an even better call from Yuya. Yeah, and I'm surprised we didn't see maybe even a high Inferno out of Lapo just to try to move it around, make those Lightnings a little bit less value. And Lapo does go for a great Lightning block with 1267 remaining on the tower. Uh, a miracle will need to come down for him to still win this game, even with that fancy footwork. Man, but come on, that's, that, is pretty, that is very pretty. He's got some real damage here if he can predict a second Lightning, which would be absolute insanity. He's gonna try to figure it out. He gets the first, he might have to barrel. He has to, he should, oh, he might have wanted to barrel defensively there. The lightning comes in, damage on tower, and Lapo furious. Man, that was a crazy game of cat and mouse. Lapo nearly pulled off the upset moment of the weekend. Man, and you saw, he knew how close he was there at the end. That cycle was fast and furious, but just a little bit behind. I would have loved to see a little bit of movement on that Inferno Tower from Lapo, maybe getting it up high just so there isn't tower damage available on that, you know, the lightning hitting the three units, one of them being the Princess Tower, but Lapo just not able to do that. He ends up making a dash for it at the end, so close. And I think that's why you see such an emotional response out of Lapakati, who has just been eliminated. Lightning was a huge factor here, and you're gonna see the first version of that. They got a ton of damage 
for the Royal Giant, and that meant Fireball had to come out and look at this Elixir Advantage. Elixir Advantage became more Elixir Advantages, and this was that second big time push. Fisherman did his duty against the Princess, and no, this was the this is before the that final big time push. Here we go. The Lightning comes in. Fisherman gets in for the reset. RG nearly finishes things here, but then these last few moments from Lapo, so impressive. Yeah, only 168 remaining on the tower. It looks like Lapo's maybe even thrown in the white flag. He goes, you know what? No, there's a reason why I'm here. I'm one of the best in the world. He gets a great lightning block in here. I mean, doesn't get better than that timing and placement wise. And I mean, we're at 1267 to 80. Now we're at 584 to 80. The barrel comes down. Barrel could have been so devastating, but there it is. Misses the lightning block by just a hair. And you can see Lapo is beside himself. And of course, the comfort shark doing his work there for you as he goes in for a hug after a very, very stressful best of three. That's such a hard call there. And you can't you can't blame Lapo at all for that moment. You, you got to keep an eye on that first set of goblins and see if you do, in fact, get the lo get the block. And if not, you got to try to time that goblin barrel for the second block on that side. Really, really hard to do. You know, no shame in that one. Yuya just with some really great calls and excellent analysis in game number three. Yeah, and going back to game number one here, even though Lapo, Lapo's deck was really quick on the cycle, he was not really able to get those Royal Giants down till way, way too late. The game had kind of already spiraled out of his control based off of some missed interactions, some late Teslas, some great Magic Archer lineups. Not to take away from Yuya here, who created a lot of really awesome opportunities for that Magic Archer. Such a strong deck when you consider there's like four win conditions in this deck with the Bandit in there, the Drill, <laughs> the wall breakers and of course that beautiful magic archer lineup let's take a look at game number two when lapo and this was a really nice pick from lapo going with the royal hogs mortar deck and yuya made the call trying to beat lapo at his own game but as you were talking about before during that 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 matchup andrew yuya really just had no relevant offense nothing that was going to create enough significant offense to keep up with what lapo could do and lots of good options on lapo's side to pick up the miners and really stall this one out so nice easy win here for lapo setting up what was a pretty crazy game number three between these two yeah just a real tough kind of outing there for Lapo in game three. That lightning coming down from Yuya. Yuya creating a really awesome moment there, as you were calling out on broadcast, just recognizing where he was at elixir-wise in single elixir. Gets that great push to come in and the lightning, right? And RG in the back with a lightning once it crosses the river is so much to commit in single elixir, but he kind of had Lapo's number. Then Lapo ends up doing some great stuff with the lightning block late game. It's always fun to see. It's always fun to watch, but we will be saying goodbye to him as we are almost through the first side of our bracket. Yeah, we are reaching the halfway point of our broadcast today. We have nine more matches coming up next, though. We'll find out who Yuya's opponent will be as we go through the second half of our group of death. Hajime, one of the most talented young players out of Japan, up against one of the all-time bridge spam greats and a top-tier ladder player in Wero. This one is going to be fascinating, Andrew. We've, of course, seen a lot of Hajime, and Wero's been playing competitive a bit more as of late. So we'll see if that recent tune-up experience has gotten him ready for what might be the two most important best of threes of his career. Yeah, Hajime was our uh, seventh and eighth place finisher in round one of our monthly finals. Wero, we have not seen yet at a monthly final, but we have been seeing him, as you were just talking about, man, doing a lot of work out there in other community events, whether it be Masters, whether it be Game Stars. He is truly one of the greatest ladder players to ever play the game. When you look at his profile, there's not a lot of people that have that many number ones there, and he is arguably the best bridge span player out there, and it's in a good meta for bridge spam right now and talk about that ram rider deck whether it's with mk or with pekka super super strong and i'm excited to see what he could bring to the table against hajime who is a guy that you and me and all the other casters and people in the space were really excited about at the beginning of the year but he's been kind of quiet over the last several months well it looked like 2020 was going to be a breakout year potentially for hajime and he just had some fits and starts 
throughout that year. Didn't quite make 2020 what he what he wanted. Here he is in 2021 and has, a, again, a really good shot. But he was a guy a lot of people picked to make top 24 in an auto qual for World Finals. Didn't quite do it. So the question is, is Hajime's stock staying still or is it on the rise or is it sinking a little bit here? Whereas Wero, who's always been an amazing ladder player and one of the guys every coach seemingly has tried to sign for a CRL team back in the team space of Clash Royale League, yeah. no one could. Is this finally the moment where we see Wero become not just one of the ladder greats, but also a great competitive player as well? Yeah, it's really curious, you know, and I know that Eric and Josh could probably give us a little bit more insight as to exactly why he's been so difficult to obtain. And I, I, honestly, from what I've gathered, it seems like he just kind of loves doing his own thing and how great for the individual format in 2021 for a guy like this to shine as he's going to come up against Hog Cycle with this Mortar Cannon Cart deck. EQ making it a little bit more difficult for Wero to control this game, and we'll see how exactly he wants to do that. 1908 to 2026 here early on. Valk will get supported here by the Hog, and Valk tanking a bit. That's going to be at least one Hog shot, probably two come in, and there we go. That's a nice lead, and you see Wero shaking his head a bit. Not happy about that one. Well, this is really tough, right? When you talk about this matchup, anytime you have EQ going up against Mortar, it can be really, really difficult. This deck cycles so quickly at the bottom of your screen. Those Mortars are very, very uh, hard to place in a place that will not just get EQ'd off the board. It's only when you go up against lesser competitors that they'll EQ preemptively. But when you're playing at this level, those Mortars can't really hide from getting that Princess Tower damage in and getting Earthquakes. So we'll see how Hajime just kind of wants to abuse that specific part of this matchup. Wero on the other side of it, he's going to have to create some offense with those miners. And happy to switch lanes right here as Hajime already has a nice lead. Might as well put pressure on both sides and force out a response. Smart play here from Wero, though, just to underspend a bit and tank that damage on the left-hand side. Give himself a bit of an opportunity going the opposite direction. So Earthquake going to come down on that mortar and really difficult, right? You see all the things that kind of Wero had to do and he still gets so little out of it. Whereas you look at Hajime and he's like, all right, cool. Now I got that left hand tower down low enough in case this does go to a two tower game or I need to change things up in the last little bit in this game or in overtime. Poison does take care of the Firecracker. Miner does not get picked up by the Skeletons and Mortar should be in cycle here. He waits a bit to not get caught by the Prediction Earthquake. This Hog should still get, no, just barely doesn't. Wero not happy about it, but that could have been a whole lot worse. Yeah, yeah, I think that's probably the best way to put it for Wero there. And we see a High Musketeer here looking for anything to catch that cannon cart. Skeletons do a good job as this Valkyrie comes down to catch this Miner, but the pressure relentless now from Wero as he sees a bit of an offensive opening and kind of its last-ditch effort. Well, you see a moment to spam at the bridge, and you're this guy. You're going to go ahead and take it. Does hold off this Hog Cannon Cart on its wheels. Log will take care of business, though. The Cannon Cart just barely doesn't connect, and that might be it for Wero. Nice Fire Spirit here to clear the path. Wero, I think, just going to sit back, let this tower go back down, and think about game number two, as that's a really tough matchup in game number one. I mean, you talk about the ability to kind of control the game, that Fire Spirit to take Spear Goblins off the board. The Miner not really needing to get caught because what you can see and what we saw Hajime do a lot was he could just drop Skeletons just down afterwards, right? Higher DPS, they stay on longer instead of distracting the Miner because honestly, damage was not the issue for Hajime. It was just about when he was going to take those towers down and which one it was going to be. So, you know, Wero doing the best that he could. He found a moment to get some bridge spam going on, which, you know, as you pointed out, if you're this guy, you might as well take that opening. But Hajime doing a great job just completely controlling this game. Well, the big the big factor here that could have changed the game were those cannon carts, right? The cannon cart nearly connected so many times. Hajime did a great job of many things, but that was a huge one where one of these cannon carts, and this is the one that broke down maybe a, a half tile early. If that one connects, this could have been an entirely different game. Instead, it goes off its wheels, and that's a GG well played. And now Hajime, one win away from moving on to Sunday. For sure. If that cannon cart stays on its wheels for just a half step longer, then the miner comes in late. And I, I honestly do think we just see Wero take game number one. But a really tough matchup here finds himself down one game.
to the Japanese player. And now going to have to reset here as we take a look, you know, at the decks that were just played and kind of what's available. There's still a lot out there for both of these players. You know, I just because Poison was played doesn't mean that Graveyard is going to come out, but it's always appetizing when you see that. Still so many other options out there. And uh, one thing that I think we've seen a little bit less of than I thought today would be the Royal Hawks. We've seen them a few times, but they were so popular over the last couple of weeks. Um, I like the I like the changeup. Well, as Josh was talking about earlier, it just seems like there are so many ways people have adapted to how much Royal Hogs are in the meta. And they've found ways to make sure that they're pretty much ready to counter it, no matter what matchup they're in, that they have something that replies. Uh, and that's been a, a big part of preparation for these dual mode matches, right? Knowing, hey, it's likely I'm going to face these. Let me get ahead of the game. So it's, it's, it's kind of been a, you know, we talk about the shift as the meta, as a same meta shifts in response to what's popular. I think that's a big one is people making that specific change. Now, the question I'm curious about in this moment, Andrew, is we just saw game number two, Lapo go with a comfort, taking the mortar out. How much, how likely do you think here with everything on the line that Wero goes, this might be my last game on camera, my last game in CRL. Let's go ahead and go bridge span. I, I actually like the call. I think that the Ram Rider deck is so strong currently right now that it's not really just going straight to comfort in spite of what works and what does not work. The fact that his comfort deck can really work right now. We saw him maybe overwhelming Hajime for just a quick moment there with the deck that he just ran. Why not try it out in game number two? But then again, you are going up against one of the best in the world. They might be looking for it. It just really is about this guessing game. But honestly, with the way that game one went, since it was such a bad matchup, I don't think that Wero is kind of, it's it's not a necessity for him to go match uh, to his comfort deck for a good matchup. But I do think it's a good idea. So we'll see if he does go that direction or not. Hajime, you know, it's interesting. We, we've we seen him for a, for a while in the league. We've seen him, uh, we saw him during the special edition where, you know, he was sort of in and out, but it does seem like he's more dialed in at this moment than we've seen him before. And just a quick note there to everyone watching. And so far we see him MK out from Wero with him. Mega Knight is, or uh, uh, Mega Minion, and it will be Graveyard, MK Graveyard. This is always a fun deck. Uh, I saw a handful of people talking in the chat wondering why the champions are not in play and why the towers are not level 11. And just to kind of remind you guys throughout the broadcast, if you weren't here at the very beginning, this is a previous build. All the uh, cards will be at level 9, all the King Towers will be at level 9, and there will be no champions for the entirety of the LCQ. Yeah, the, with the update coming out so recently, putting those players in a position to adapt to a new meta, definitely not something we wanted to do in a couple of days for a competition like this one. Uh, but in this case, for Wero, wasn't that critical. This is fascinating, Andrew. We, we Wero goes MK Graveyard, and for the second time in a row, we see a Japanese pro go with what their opponent's known for, their opponent's comfort, and come out and uh, try to make a statement. I mean, a lot of these players out there in the world kind of hate playing in mirror matchups or they hate playing against their comfort deck. There's just something weird about it. It just kind of feels icky. And you can see right here, Hajime just really rocking it, rocking this bridge spam deck because Wero got hyper aggressive, right? Look at his first three cards out. That's 15 Elixir in single Elixir being spent on three cards. And you're expecting a graveyard to, what, take the tower that early on? I mean, you gotta give a little bit more respect to your opponent. And now Mother Witch does come out for the graveyard with the bar barrel, so that's gonna get shut down here. Fireball in a bit late with 55 seconds left. You can see Wero maybe, he might play this one out, but I'm not sure. He might just check out and say, GG, well played. And uh, yeah, that's a bit late there with the Hunter. And maybe this is why Wero is not a huge fan of, you know, what CRL used to be and why finally in 2021 with the individual format, he's kind of testing it out. But, you know, it's a lot easier to kind of reset on ladder and come back after a little bit. When you're at the competitive scene, it is a back to back to back against the same person. And if you don't win, you're out. And that's not quite as fun as ladder where you just lose a few hand a handful of trophies and you can come right back to it. Yeah, I mean, that's the, that's the really big difference, right? There's a huge mental change in that one, and 
Guero has to go ahead and say, good game. You also have the analysis factor, right? Which on ladder, you just press play and you see who you match up against and you just go, hey, I'm going to play what I'm good at and I'm going to play over and over again. Whereas you have to vary your decks, you have to vary your matchups. And it's been some people make that transition well. But, you know, one thing we've seen, Andrew, people making that transition well from ladder to competitive is most of them did it during the team phase of CRL in our first few seasons. Yeah. They did it with a coach, with teammates around them, with support. It seems like it might be a bit harder to do when you aren't in that environment. Yeah, and Wero definitely struggled here today. It was a really bad matchup in game number one, or one that he at least could not play through. And then in game number two, just really, really too aggressive out the gates. And this is that counter push that came through after defending that graveyard. And, um, you know, there was, I mean, he's one elixir ticking to two right now and a lot to deal with as that bandit dashes through, getting tanked for by that Ram Rider on your tower. And there's no way to come back from that. Yeah, I mean, you're playing Grave... Look, MK Graveyard is one of the decks that can win for Graveyard in a two-tower game. It's possible, but you're coming in so far behind. Your opponent's playing Pekka for your Mega Knight, uh, the, <laughs> the Mother Witch for your Graveyard. It was already going to be a tough battle in the first place, but then battling from behind like this, just too big of a mountain to climb. Yeah, and you talk about trying to get on top of that mother, which just doesn't even try there as these piggies pile up on the King Tower. Dark Prince cycled in the back, and... You know, I think there was one more little offensive effort that came out from Wero, but just wasn't going to do it. He calls the good game. It's a quick 2-0 here, and Hajime finding some of that greatness he found early on in this season, going to try to carry it on through to our World Finals. And he'll be facing Yuya tomorrow, and of course, we have reached the halfway point of our day. We have eight more matches to come today, and then, of course, all of these finals tomorrow to see who actually goes through. Game number one, it was Hajime running Hog EQ up against this Mortar Miner control deck, and Wero just not able to keep up with the cycle and not able to stop that Hog EQ combination. Yeah, I mean, Hajime just completely controlled this game. He was always happy to change lanes, which always is going to bait out just a little bit of elixir from your opponent. Anytime a mortar came down, he could distract with spear goblins. He could earthquake out. Uh, just all great there for Hajime. Going into game number two, like you said, man, just, just, oh, what does he like to play? Bridge spam? Okay, cool. Let me try that out. And Wero just has no responses. Yeah, this was just a, an absolute shutdown match. And, you know, it's also one of those things, too, where if you're used to playing a certain deck, if you are someone who grinds a certain deck or archetype, you start making switches. It takes time. It takes time and grind to make sure you understand the pacing that matchup should be played in, to understand how you how to manage your elixir in that deck. And sometimes it's not easy to do, even for some of the, someone as great as Wero. So here we go. It will be Hajime moving on. And we do have our first eight for tomorrow. Pompeo, Hasi. CL, Rad, Schwarzen, Dark Angel, Chief Keith, Yuya, and Hajime. Four of those players will be going on to CRL World Finals. Four of them will go home with $3,000 and a nice story, but that's about it. Yeah, we've already said goodbye to half of our players. Crazy, crazy, crazy stuff here of half the players we're going to see today. And of course, we do have our match of the day coming your way in just a few moments. It's going to be Codigo or Faust, our number two seed in Codigo going up against Faust. So hashtag Codigo, hashtag Faust in the chat. Let us know who you think is going to take that victory. And we are going to get those results to you in just one moment. But like Rich said, we're halfway through our day. Still a lot more Clash action coming your way. This is an interesting matchup, Andrew, with Cody Go and Faust, because, you know, you, you talk about Cody Go on one side, just an experienced veteran, the captain of Columbia for a long time, has helped carry them very deep in international competition, played through CRL LATAM, CRL West, CRL Now, and uh, Faust, of course, maybe one of the top 10 players to never be on a CRL team the young yeah. player out of Germany. So go ahead, get your votes in now, and we'll be back in a few minutes with your next matchup. But for now, enjoy this. What's up, guys? It's me, Eric, and today I'm going to break down our top five CRL matchups of the season. At number five, we have Bruzani and Coco in the July monthly final. These two were seated seventh and eighth and gave us one of the best matchups of the lower bracket we've had all year. 
not able to hit. Bruzzani had a big opening, and that was most likely his last chance to make anything happen. Looks like we're going to go to game two, one game in hand for the South Koreans. Applied pressure at the bridge, has to bait out a border there, or drop a border there for Bruzzani to make sure he doesn't lose the tower. And here we go to game number three. One of these guys is going to walk away with $6,000. He recognized early on, this RG is not my win condition. My win condition is the Lightning. I would have loved to see Bruzzani switch lanes, even though it was a late in the game. At number four, we have Line versus Morden, two CRL veterans and titans of the game, where Line caused another upset for Morden, taking the bracket reset in the grand final. And the Hunter with the delivery. Again, nice cleanup here, and as you talked about before, not having to play Mortar on defense. Valkyrie a little bit high here, oh but my the Ice Spirit will help stop those pigs. And the Mortar gets a shot on Tower, and that gets the, the wow out of line. I, I don't think anyone thought that Mortar was in the right position. And that could be enough on its own. Miner yeah. goes to the front, EQ comes in. And this is going to be the miner. Does it get his last shot? No. That is a great example of it. Somehow, some way. What? Oh, I was like, where's the earthquake, <laughs> man? Where is it? <laughs> Zap trying to control here at the bridge. Miner goes to the back, right under the spears. Oh. The fly machine gets on tower, and there you go. Morton takes game number one. Fireball in on the archers. Snowball in behind. King Tower does get activated, but skeletons, can they do it? Can one skeleton hit? No, cannot. Bomb Tower is in. Hog is still alive. 101. Log is in. Nothing is there. Nothing is there to catch the miner. There's the NATO. Morton loses by 29 HP. At number three, we have Molite versus Mini Minter, dating all the way back to our first monthly final where Molite fought his way all the way through the lower bracket to beat Mini Minter in a bracket reset yet again. But oh. has to be happy. Oh, and a missed fireball on a flying machine. That could be absolutely devastating here. Uh, a bit of a fireball issue, and now it feels like momentum shifting heavily towards mini -Mentor. Tan side, fireball to try to knock it back a little bit. These Snowball hits, in, creates yeah. some big, huge room here, and that hog rider going hog wild wow. on the left-hand side. And that's going to be a 2-0 sweep for Muhammad Light, and just like that, Mini Minter back in the lead, down on Elixir at the moment, and a nice protection oh, miner. And wow. the cannon cart connects for Muhammad Light, and you give the wow. Probably everyone watching <laughs> gives the wow. Fireball will finish things off, and Muhammad Light is now one game away from winning our February tournament. At number two, we have Lucas, the only back-to-back -back winner in this year's CRL. He not only showed amazing gameplay and analysis, but he showed us that he is a true force to watch out for in the world final. Late the fish boy slides on through, and that is a ton of damage. It's getting Slapping tanked the heck for. out of that tower. I cannot believe it was getting tanked for every single hit. Nice fireball in, minor hit on the right-hand side. Snowball gets oh! it done, he and does there it. you go. 144 HP, KK can't believe it. Lucas just became your June champion and takes home 20 grand. The Fisherman pulls a cannon cart in and that should do it, Rich. That was crazy. Trying to get his way in on the right-hand side. Fireball gets down. Not gonna happen. GG, well played. Back to back, Lucas Gamer, your June and July Clash Royale League champion. And finally, at number one, we have Ta. He came out of nowhere. No one knew who he was, what his gameplay was all about, but he was able to edge out all the CRL Titans in this monthly final, which was arguably one of the hardest to take the crown and win it all. So here we go. The Super Grand Final, best of three. Loser takes home $10,000, winner doubles that amount and gets a huge step forward towards our world championship. I think the smart choice for Ta is to go for matchup. Try to go for 80-20s, 90-10s, 100 zeros if he, can, if he can put it that way. With Mother Witch and E-Barbs both out there, but Mother Witch in particular, Graveyard in game number one, you're rolling the dice and every once in a while you come up Snake Eyes. Tesla is there, but this is basically all Ta for the rest of this game. We are going most likely to a game number three in our Super Grand Finals. Now here we go, Sandbox trying to hold on, Miner comes in, Tesla working. Can he stop this Miner? No, King Tower wow. goes down and we are going to a best of one for $20,000. Ta is in the lead yeah. as we approach triple. 80 seconds left. $20,000 on the line for first. The table's turned here in Sandbox oh, and a lot man. of trouble. This is a lot of trouble. That mother witch staying alive out of the poison. This is an ocean of elixir coming across. This oh, is going to do my. it. Ta has just won $20,000. And we didn't know who he was two days ago. 
with more exciting matches on the way let's go witness some crl gameplay that is definitely top five worthy Well, top five, not a worry right now for these players. Right now, it's just top out of four. Can I beat two other people and get a shot at Clash Royale League World Finals? Welcome back. I'm Rich Slayton. That's Andrew Guy. And we're about ready for our next featured match of the day. Andrew, it's going to be Cody Go against Faust. Let's start with you since I'm the one talking at the moment. Who you got? The longtime veteran or Faust, one of the greatest players to never step into the CRL arena? You know, I, I feel bad already thinking what I'm thinking because I don't want Kodigo to be mad at me, so I think that kind of shows my hand. Faust coming off a number one finish in uh, July on ladder. Feels like he's riding high. I've been seeing Kodigo a lot out there. He's been practicing a ton, playing a ton. But right now, I want to see an upset. I always love the underdog. This is one of our lowest seeded competitors going up against number two, right? That's the way that seeding works. Number two is going to go up against the second to last person. I want to see an upset. Even though I love Cody Go, I know he's got way more experience on his side. Let's go to Faust for me. That's, you know, we'll see if everyone agrees with you on the votes here in a moment. I'm going to go opposite direction and pick Cody Go here. Uh, really experienced veteran. He puts in the time, puts in the effort. Faust is one of those guys who could be one of the best players in the world, but, you know, has never put in the same level of grind. You don't see him in competitive as much. So my call here is going to be Cody Go. Faust might be the more talented player. Cody Go is the more dedicated player. I'm going to say dedication beats talent today. Yeah, and you know, we've seen already a lot today. That experience being in these high stakes scenarios on camera has all leaned in favor of those vets. And right now, I am clearly the underdog on the desk with 12% for Faust from Germany. The rest of it goes all to Cody Go. And you know, with all the things that you're talking about there with his resume, it does make a lot of sense why the community is behind that man. He's been around for a long time, and he's a likable guy, too. He's not just a good yeah. competitor who's been a, a cornerstone for the Colombian Clash Royale scene, but a longtime top-tier player out of Latin America. He's a guy you like to root for, so no big surprises here for the for the ton of votes behind Cody Go. And he's a guy who has done very, very well throughout his career. He's missed that big moment a couple of times. He's a guy who's come close, but not quite, over and over again. So the big question is, is this that moment where he finally does get that big opportunity to be on stage at World Finals, or does Faust, to again, I mean, we talked about it before, one of the most talented players in Clash Royale, the question has never been skill, it's always been dedication, but you mentioned that ladder finish, maybe this is the time when we actually see Faust fully committed to being as great as he can be. Yeah, and what better time to do it? Two guys with so much to prove here in our ninth matchup of the day, our second match of the day between Faust and Cody Go. Whew, man, I really don't know here. It's crazy, you know, after just giving my prediction, seeing that 12%, I'm gonna start to second guess myself, but let's see how this goes. Cody Go, bottom of your screen with Bomber, Royal Hogs, Faust at the top, maybe going Royal Giant E-Barbs. Well, another note here, this is the second player we're seeing today from that Clash Contender Series team, Existence, who won the World Championship for that semi-pro competition back in 2019. Faust, teammates alongside Svartzen, and we are seeing more of that here. So the, the genesis of what was a phenomenal team back then, we're seeing come out. We're seeing the investment in semi-pro Clash Royale pay off here today. And then when you look at Faust and what he's done, he has five top 10 ladder finishes over the last year and a half. Uh, so really impressive stuff there out of him. So after a bit of a furious opening, things slow down a little bit here. As both players take a moment, get their elixir back to 10 and reset. Royal Giant in the back here for Faust. Not worried about the Hogs counter push the opposite lane right now. Yeah, he has a lot of great responses to those hogs, even with Fireball out of cycle. He's got the King Tower activation option in there. Well, now no longer. And then, of course, the E-Barbs to help create dual lane pressure. And that's exactly what he decides to do. Hunter in response to the Royal Giant with those skeletons. You know, Andrew, skeletons to a Royal Giant might be like a bee sting to a bull. But, you know, even a bull will fall if there's enough bees. So there you see it go down. And, oh, an E-Barb connect wow. on the left-hand side for a ton of damage here. That is a massive miss in interaction there on that left-hand side. Just a little bit late on the draw was Cody Go. Log has to come down to kind of save 
uh, try to save the tower, but still, 844 remains. Mega Minion will not get a swing, but damage already dealt. Faust in a massive lead here in a nice, even trade for cleanup. Double Elixir on its way. Cody Go setting up with the Hunter into that left-hand lane, weak side at this moment, and the Mother Witch proving to be a real trouble as well, as Cody Go has no great way to get to her on that side of the board. Yeah, and this is one of those troubles of like, you, you look at the two radical differences of what we're seeing here, right? One side of it, we have a log, we have a royal delivery and an earthquake. Cards that are, I mean, log obviously very popular, but the other ones are changed out a lot in the current meta. And then you have Faust, who just goes right down the line. Mother Witch, Fireball, Royal Giant, E-Barbs, it's all there, leaving a lot open down the line. But picking up that first game is huge. Absolutely massive, and you know, keep an eye on this as well. No building played by Cody Go in game number one, which of course gives him tons of options for game number two, but you're trying to control a Royal Giant with no building going to be very difficult. No building, no fisherman, no real traditional way of stopping an RG, and we're seeing the results of that here. Yeah, I mean, all what what he's going to just play a fisherman on top of the RG and log it back, but then, you know, his opponent's going to start looking for that hunter, excuse me, I meant to say hunter, uh, and then just log it back. But Cody Go just not having any responses that he needed there. Uh, pretty tough matchup, all things considered, but also not really one that would catch you too much by surprise, right? This is one of the most popular decks in the game, using a lot of the strongest cards currently. Yeah, and Faust played a very, very clean game. And, you know, you can't evaluate one game as an overall picture, and you certainly can't say uh, one game tells you where someone is or not. But it seems like Faust is very dialed in. And I'm going to say right now, if Faust is truly dialed in for this competition, everybody in Clash Royale League better be ready because he is a scary opponent when he's on his game. And talking about dialed in, he goes for the RG cycle in the back here in one lane. He supports it with the fish boy, which means the skeletons have to come down. But this is the counter push coming in the opposite lane later on. Originally, though, that first counter push that we were just kind of seeing a moment ago was those E barbs that were missed by the delivery. The delivery came down too late. The log comes in too late, doesn't reset that first E barb to get on top of the delivery as well. So it goes on top of tower. The other E barb that did go on top of the delivery takes it out of play. And it was just all rough from there on out from Cody Go based off of just a big Royal Delivery miss, which is, it happens to all of us, right? One of the most difficult cards in the game to time. Well, you know, I really like the E-Barb selection from Faust in this one as well for a couple reasons. One, obviously, Elite Barbarians, very, very nice against Royal Hogs, and we saw that to effect. But also, this deck often runs other variations, pull things like the Royal Ghost mixed in, right. and that takes an E-Barbs, which are a card that don't fit in a ton of decks, and allows that Royal Ghost out to give a lot of flexibility to Faust moving forward, especially if he wants to go in a bridge spam direction. So I do like that call from Faust here for a number of reasons in Game 1. I want to see Cody go just copy deck, really. I want to just see him run it back, what his opponent just ran. I want to see him use the fireball and the log. I want to see him use the mother witch and the fisherman. I want to see him use what's super popular in the meta right now. He could also, you know, go to something that is more fireball baity. We could see someone trying to take advantage of that flying machine. That's another good option for Cody go out there as you and I and all of other casters and everyone out there in the world has seen how impactful those flying machines really can be when you can't get on top of them. So that's definitely an option there, but still so much available for both of these guys. Cody go down one game. And one more thing that you highlighted that I saw was, you know, I was just talking about the missed interactions from Cody go, but yeah, Faust looked really, really dialed in. Yeah, hundred percent. There was no decision making. You know, it's not just about micro. You talk about macro, right? The decision making ability of what to do when, not just making sure you do it precisely. And Faust's macro in that game was directly on point. Of course, great matchup, but you have to make the right decisions. And here we go in game number two with Faust cycling the cannon cart to open things up behind that knight. Yeah, cannon cart knight here. We could be seeing... I just want it to be mortar, but it's not going to be. RG out and immediately. Yeah, asking you shall receive. Not a copy deck, but does go Royal Giant, but that's going to be rough news here. The Lightning, although a big X Factor, we have seen a return to RG Lightning. And while we don't see champions in this meta because we are playing on the previous build, I wonder if the prevalence of Archer Queen uh, in the game right now has made people remember how good Lightning is. 
So Lightning not going to do very well against these Royal Hogs that come down the lane and not having the Goblin Cage in cycle means this Lumberjack's going to have to hack, hack, hack away after taking a ton of damage. And yeah, Lightning coming back in. I think the Archer Queen's a big part of that. I also think towards the end of that last little uh, bit of what the meta was, we were starting to see more and more Electro Dragon out in the world mm. and having better responses to those units up in the skies that you just cannot get on top of. Inferno Dragons were wreaking havoc all over the place. So I like the fact that we we're seeing more and more lightning back in the meta. Lead right now for Faust is 1762 to 1190 as Cody Go sets up in the back. It's interesting, you know, RG Furnace obviously in 2019 was one of the most dominant decks, whether you're talking about the Lumberjack variation or the Guards variation. And while this isn't Furnace, this is most of the same pieces, right? You have the Bar Barrel, the Mega Minion, the Baby Dragon, the Lumberjack, the Lightning. This combination of cards seems to be making a bit of a resurgence lately. Yeah, absolutely, man. I mean, it's, it's just one of those things. People kind of forget about them for a long time or they just really fall out of favor. Then there's certain things that shift in the meta that maybe aren't directly related to the deck, but really in the responses to the deck or what else is out there. And right now we are seeing that kind of payoff. Faust in the lead still, though. Just setting up defensively and Faust certainly playing things without any major overcommitments, does put some pressure on the left-hand lane, knowing that the Baby Dragon's to the right-hand side. It will get pulled over, but still a nice bit of damage, and the Cannon Cart just stops things right here at the bridge. I gotta admit, though, even though the Lightning is great against these buildings, I still am surprised to just not see Fireball here out of Kodigo in game number two, an elimination game. Uh, which could really help with the defense that he's been struggling with a bit, but Lumberjack plus Mega Minion push going to come in here and should get some good damage. Didn't get as much damage, but forcing out that delivery is really nice for Cody Go. He's going to have a bit of an elixir advantage here, but missing one pig with that cage pickup to control the recruit, and that's going to be some damage he can't afford to give up on the right-hand side. Yeah, brings it down to 638 to 1521. Now a really nice RG push coming across the bridge here, and we'll see where this... No, no Mortar going to come down at all as he's just going to eat this damage and try to respond with the Hunter. Wow. That's a lot of damage on that right-hand side. 531, just like that. Cody go back in the lead, and as that Rage pops, two Baby Dragons Bar Barrel just trying to get that Baby Dragon on tower, and the extra splash damage gets in. Oh, my word. What an insane turn of events. Cody go getting this one back. It looks like we're to go to game number three. <laughs> yeah, and I love what he's doing here. Just going to send an RGN at the bridge, try to get the lightning in when he can. Not going to get too aggressive. One HP remains. There's the shot. And Cody go, like you said, man, what a turnaround game number two based off of a very oddly played defense. I, mean, I don't know if Faust didn't have his mortar in cycle. I don't know if he was just worried about it getting lightning off the board, so he thought he could deal with it with the hunter up high. But he ended up eating so much damage there, and then Cody go just kept his foot pedal to the metal let's take game two let's push this to game number three that's a competitor right there that's Cody he's been in the game for a long time you know started off in CRL Latin America with cream esports where they came oh so close to a world finals that time around and of course they were stopped by a young man named Javi Catorze who uh, made his <laughs> big splash in that season and just never was able to get back to that same level with cream you know he's fired up and Cody go might feel like this is his last best chance at world finals and he's bringing everything he can. This was one that really felt like Faust had it nailed down, but in the end, it was just, you know, we'll get to that interaction in a moment. In the end, you know, you see the lane switch here, you see the pressure on the opposite side. It didn't turn into what I think Faust expected. I would really like to see Cody go, I think, go to the skies here in game number three. His opponent doesn't have Mother Witch, Mega Minion, Hunter, Delivery, Fireball. He obviously still does have arrows, which can be pretty helpful there. But a lot of the most opportune responses there are the most regularly used ones not going to be available. And Cody go has not really used a lot of those cards that kind of... Uh, you know, uh, go over both those decks. You know, Arrows hasn't been used yet. He hasn't used Miner yet. Uh, he can swap out something for the cage that we saw in this game. And this was great, though. The double Baby Dragons with the Rage, just too much to deal with. And then this one last second Belch comes in to put it within, almost within, Lightning striking distance. Then the Lightning comes down, one HP remains, RG Shot comes in, and we're going to game number three. 
you know, you see the sequencing there in, in that last chunk, and you saw the hunter just get sniped at the bridge by the Mega Minion. And, you know, I don't know what was exactly in Cody and in, in Faust's hand at that moment, but that hunter kind of left out to dry there, could have shut down that push a bit more, but instead gets taken off the board. And you can see how just one tile or one half tile can change the tenor of a best of three. Yeah, it was it was kind of a surprising defense there. And that's why I'd love to maybe watch this on replay and go back and just kind of see what happened. It was just, you know, I, I thought the mortar was in cycle, but the RG crosses the bridge, one of the most uh, supported RG pushes that we saw the entire game from Kodigo. Yeah. And then that's when we're, you're talking about, right? That's when the hunter just played right up high and kind of left out to dry instead of just a little bit lower, get a unit in front of it, get something to, you know, the RG obviously to focus on the mortar, at least to mitigate some of that damage on the front end, but kind of all things going wrong for Foul there and like you know maybe trying to turn it into a counter push but it was just kind of an odd defense at least from the desk well you know you're kind of 50 50 in that matchup about the lightning right when you're on faust side on one hand you're unhappy about that lightning because it's going to do so much against the hunter against the mortar and that's really rough other side as we talked about it makes it very difficult defensively for uh, uh for cody yeah. go lightning not great against royal hogs obviously but the way that cody go adjusted to use of the cage the bar barrel and the baby dragon to get just enough defense down when he needed and turn into big counter pushes we saw the payoff there at the end and it was massive so that's some veteran play to adjust mid game and take advantage of what you have so cody go going to log bait here in game number three at least so far it looks that way and in Electro Wizard to catch early on, usually not the best sign. Maybe Faust just had a bad starting hand. And Royal Ghost will create a little bit of pressure here, force a response out from Cody going, going with Rascal's variant of bait is Cody Go. Yeah, I haven't seen that in a hot minute, which is also gonna be really, really nice when you talk about trying to get on top of those Rascal girls. When you don't have a log, it's a lot more difficult to do with a barb barrel. Mega Knight though, that'll do just fine. And with the Inferno Dragon behind, we'll see what Cody Go does to control here. So let's it burn and help with that Prince Snowball to reset. But nice pressure here. Faust just really trying to pour it on right now. And that pressure is going to work, Rich. You see that Goblin Barrel coming out defensively does mitigate some good damage there from the Bandit. But now that offensive presence not available as Faust just stays on the aggro. Goblins get a couple hits on that right-hand side as the Royal Ghost connects on the left to give Faust the lead. That's a really great read of understanding Cycle and Elixir there from Faust to go with the Royal Ghost left-hand lane when none of the major responses, Prince, Bandit, or the the Rascals were going to be available to get it done. So Cody Go has to eat that damage and now has a Prince going the opposite direction. Yeah, that was a nice little exchange there. The Ram Rider first uh, to help deal with that Dark Goblin, but then the Prince gets down just in time for Cody Go to make sure that Ram Rider doesn't get on tower, creates a nice counter push, and he finds himself up a little bit of Elixir here. Cody Go's primary success, of course, has been in team format, finishing number two in Sierra Latin America in 2018, but also the what he's done for Colombia in No Tilt Worlds in 2020, leading them to a fourth place finish, way overperforming what was predicted. This is a guy who, no matter what format you're in, you love to have him as a part of your organization. Dark Goblin turns around and goes back on top of that Inferno. Nice little interaction there for Cody Go as the Prince gets on that left-hand tower. Faust getting overwhelmed here as that MK is easily dealt with. A lot of damage in on that left-hand side. Bandit connects as well. 1702 to 1739, and now it's Cody Go's turn to pressure at the bridge. Never mind, that's the left-hand tower way further down as Princess wow. and Goblin Barrel wreak havoc on that left-hand side down to 596. Just such a great call deck-wise here from Cody Go. No responses to the barrel. He goes high princess, deeper barrel, and Faust just has to eat a ton of that damage, has to overspend up high, taking damage down low. And when you look at the stuff that was available, you know, there's always the potential that bait comes out in game three because it can match up so well. This one even more appetizing because there is no log available. Bar barrel is going to be effective. And then for Faust, maybe we should have seen a bar barrel in this deck. Yeah, maybe, although we are seeing some good poison value there on that right-hand side, or down in the middle with the Princess and the Dark Goblin, both getting on, getting taken care of by that poison. The question is, is it too little too late? From Faust's body language, certainly feels like he thinks so. Yeah, and that was just great fireball value that came in for Cody. Go 324 remains for our number two seed here, who is just a few moments away from extending his CRL career in 2021, but Faust could maybe pull off a miracle win. Nice snowball there to mitigate, but snowball actually comes oh. in a step early. 
Yeah, just a little bit there. You saw that and went, okay, maybe Faust is going to get the full counter here. It's The timing is not easy on that one. Doesn't get it, so 225 remains. Dark Prince just kind of caught looking there. Really, really nice kite, but then the snowball pushes it right into that lance of the Prince, and this feels like it could be game wrapped up here. Yep, Goblin on the back yep, end, there it and is. that'll do it. Columbia, stand up. Your captain, Cody Go, will be back tomorrow with a shot at Clash Royale League World Finals for the veteran. GG, well played. You know, Andrew, we talked about it. Whether is it the, the time, experience, and dedication of Cody Go versus the pure talent of Faust, and today it was dedication and time that paid off. And what a great deck here in game number three, right? You talk about putting yourself in a really, really opportune matchup. He decides to go with a little bit less traditional bait deck, the Rascals plus, plus Prince version, a lot beefier, which was really, really great in regards to dealing with the Ram Riders, dealing with the MKs, and then the amount of pressure that came out from Cody Go. So much fun to watch him play this deck. It's one of those games where you watch it and you're like, man, I want to go play that deck because look at how great this was for him. Just always painting his opponent in a corner, always having a great response to those infernos by kiting and of course these relentless barrels coming in that are always demanding a double drop and then great spell value yeah cody go managed his cycle really really well the entire way through here made sure he didn't get caught by an errant mega knight which i know a lot of people watching at home find themselves in that situation quite often and here is the finishing blow you get one goblin still on tower that's enough for a fireball didn't even need to get in the fireball to finish that's a gg well played and cody go moves on faust heads back home with a thousand dollars in his pocket but no ticket to world finals so it looks like 12 percent of us out there were wrong which i guess made me make sense why the other 88 <laughs> percent went towards the colombian in cody go there great place from him but starting with game number one here it was faust but you know, Cody Go may be playing the long game here, Rich. You talk about what he came out with in game number one. Yes, he does have really strong uh, win condition in the Royal Hogs, but the rest of this deck, it feels like, was constructed around the idea of the dual format. Faust goes right down the barrel, right down the lane here from something that's incredibly popular, although I do have to give credit where it's due, which was to you saying he, you like the E-Barbs pull, which ended up working out great, and then he had that Royal Ghost available for game number three, which we'll get to in just a second here after game number two. Yeah, I mean, the E-Bars Fireball, both nice here, of course, as we go into game number two. This was just fascinating, right? It's Faust's turn to play Royal Hogs. You feel like he's going to have some good opportunities. He was way ahead for a lot of the time, but once we got into the heavier Elixir flow, Cody Go went with the overspend on defense, preparing for a counter push. You can't do that in single the same way you can in double. Well, he did it in double and got a big time win. There was nothing Faust could really do to hold on there at the end. And then you go into game number three here, Poison Snowball against this log bait deck. Really, really tough. Yes, Poison can get some great value on the Dark Goblin, the Princess, and on those Rascal Girls. But you talk about just not having any form of log or barrel. Going to be really, really difficult to stay strong throughout the rest of this game. Cody Go in charge of his cycle, always creating pressure. And any time that he saw an opening, he smelled blood in the water and he went for it. This is the first matchup on our opposite side of the bracket. And our number two seed stays alive for at least one more day. Cody Go taking a spot in our final 16. So he'll be waiting to see who the victor is of Over and Jupiter King. And of course, lots of big time action remaining for the rest of this day. But of course, Andrew, uh, I'm going to have to be taking in some of this, at least as a spectator, as I'm about to head out and let you and Eric take over for a little bit. But man, we've got a few great matches coming in so far. And what we've got next is pretty fire. Yeah, we'll see you back here in just a moment, Rich. And as we say goodbye to Rich, we welcome Eric Benamu back to the broadcast. EB7, we started the day off. Now we here we are towards, I guess, more the middle than the end. Uh, what have you been thinking as you've been sitting back, or do you just want to talk over versus Jupiter King, which is our next matchup? I'm going to leave it up to you, brother. I mean, I... If it's up to me, I like to talk about everything. You know me, man. I can <laughs> talk for days. So, I mean, on this specific match really quickly, I, it really all depends on what Jupiter King we get. We've seen the yeah. Jupiter King that can beat everyone, and we've seen the Jupiter King that has had his lows. So, uh, I think starting the year, we all expected him to absolutely be clinched into World Finals. And I'm really, really curious to see which version of Jupiter King we get. But on the other end, on what I've seen today, Seems like experience, experience, experience. When it comes down to elimination matches, so much pressure. 
it just it, it seems to overwhelm the rookies a little bit too much and we've seen that even in the past match faust is not a full-on rookie he's been here for a while but coligo's experience was what got him to this point he took a risk on the deck and uh it, it really really paid off he didn't play it safe yeah, I really like that you kind of point that out because looking back at what the pros have done as opposed to the newer players coming to the competition, dropping game number one, you kind of saw Cody go there. He didn't really let it get to him. He didn't let it affect him. He was like, okay, I tried this deck out. It doesn't overlap with a lot of my other decks that I want to play. I can paint him in a corner now. Fireball and Log are already out in game number one. And I think that's really what it's about. You've got to play the long game here in the dual format. Winning game one feels great. But winning yeah. a set is what it's really all about. We've said goodbye to a lot of competitors today. And a lot of the ones that have remained and stayed strong are those people that are truly using this dual format to their advantage. Absolutely. And you have to take risks when you when you really see the opportunity. Most people on an elimination game with world finals on the line, $2,000 extra on the line as well, would not pull out a log bay rascals. But that's the experience and not letting the nerves and the moment get to you. Because if you put that same match in any other circumstance, maybe Faust picks a different deck, but he let the occasion get to him and he didn't want to take too big of a risk. You have to treat this like any other match because at the end of the day, it's Clash Royale. So it, nothing's changing. Obviously the stakes are higher, but you still need to analyze and play the same game you always do. So this battle going down in Asia, one player from Japan, the other from South Korea, Jupiter King top of your screen over at the bottom as Jupiter is coming out with RG, one of his favorite win conditions and over going right into the meta with Lava Guards bottom of your screen and that Hunter trying to put in some work. Over the 8.7K player out of Japan, looking to uh, maybe make a bigger name for himself this season as he's got a uh, nice win at the Star Championship in 2021. And of course, winning the global tournament back in 2020 in May. Yeah, this is a great start for over here. Uh, I guess he wanted more damage, but if <laughs> yeah. I'm looking at, you know, I love the emotion, but you gotta be happy with that. You just not only defended the RG with minimal damage, less than 400 damage, you were able to go on the counter. You took off two hunters from rotation. He was out of rotation as well. That was about as good of a start as you can get, especially without Lava first play in your hand. So I like the idea there, Jupiter recognizing the cycle and decides to go aggressive at the bridge. Doesn't get a goblin cage out of it, but he does get a response. Yeah, and I want to see, I think he could get a lot of value out of the ghost in this matchup, just because you're always going to either force out guards or take a ton of damage like he just did. He has to save the cage for the RG. He cannot use it on the ghost. And there we go. I love what Jupiter is doing. you got to use that to your advantage. It is such a strong card against Lava. And it forces so many things out. And I mean, as I'm saying it, you're, you're yeah. seeing it. It, it is re like, that is a three elixir card that just forced out more than seven elixir out of his hands. Nice arrows, though, there coming out from over. Maybe that was what he was wanting to achieve yeah. every time he pulled out that three elixir card, but this time pays off handedly, gets great damage in on the left-hand side, cleans up the e -Wiz plus the Hunter, takes the tower, and now we see that Goblin Cage coming out defensively. Only 11 seconds remain here as the Lightning comes down for Jupiter. I don't think that's gonna be enough, Eric. It's not, and that was a very well-played match by Over. This is not an easy matchup. He does have the advantage that he played the Skelly Dragons instead of the Baby Dragon. I think that gives less value over to the Lightning in a sense that you, you don't really want to spend it on that, but it will tank for it as well if you have a bunch of troops there. The Ghost, I think he realized just a little bit too late that you always want to play that in front of the RG, in my opinion. Obviously, Jupiter is a 10 times better player than I am, but watching it from here, the most amount of damage he got was pressure with the Ghost and then the RG behind it. Uh, it just got away from him a little and really, really well played by Over. And there's that reaction out yeah. of Over when those first set of arrows come down. Still not exactly sure what he was so upset about there. Ends up getting a ton of damage on the the left-hand lane here, and there's that Royal Ghost getting a ton of value on the right-hand side. But then, like you were talking about, Eric, this is how defenses need to be played every single time. You love the pressure here from Jupiter King, and Ofer 
happy to overspend here on the right hand side as well to not take more damage from that royal ghost that finally comes back around into cycle but now we see this flying machine working towards the left hand side the skeleton dragons come down there's no big spell there so what has to come down an electro wizard right into it great heads up arrows and that's the game that ghost I, i'm not sure what the plan was with that ghost there was no ground units for the ghost to target Maybe it was just a little bit of a panic move from Jupiter, and then that yep. doesn't allow his full push on the right-hand side because you'd love to think uh, that match had, what, a 500 HP on his tower. If that ghost would have been accompanied by the RG on the right-hand side at the end, he could have got that tower down, and two-tower game, that's 100% his game, no doubt, playing those RGs in the pocket. Yeah. Maybe just a little bit of a panic move there from Jupiter, not expecting the Hunter to go down to those arrows. Yeah, the Hunter uh, placement from Jupiter, you saw it struggle early on with that Mega Minion taking it off. The very first Hunter on the board got kind of caught on the bridge. So he was able to cycle two Hunters for that first Lava Hound defense, but still takes a lot from over. And then on the other side of the board, you talk about that Royal Ghost getting in front of the Royal Giant. It was always the guards plus that cage that Jupiter had yeah. to deal with. Were that Royal Ghost there? I agree. I think that tower would have fallen and then it would have been a Jupiter King game in a two tower matchup. But that's not the case as we see over going to quick cycle here, maybe going log, uh, excuse me, going hog cycle as we see log and earthquake coming out early. Yeah, the good news here for Jupiter, no fireball and you have Mother Witch. That is definitely something that you always like to see at the start of a game. This fisherman apparently is allergic to the Mother Witch because the <laughs> skellies seemed further away, to, at least to me, than the Mother Witch, but decided to go there first. Just took a little bit of damage, not too much of a... Uh, big deal i guess to say and let's see how this plays out it, this is a, a little bit of an odd deck from jupiter should be hoggies and there they are but the hunter and the delivery should be able to clean up pretty nicely here yeah hunter delivery come out on the right hand side fish boy on the left as that skeleton dragon gets a little bit of damage in with those hogs 2030 to 22 16 as over sends in a royal hogs push of his own cannon cart plus skellies you see over tilt his head once again just maybe a more emotive player in general i mean everyone's yeah, a little bit more emotive than jupiter king he could win the lottery yeah. and you wouldn't even know oh, yeah he has a, I, I mean i would love to watch a match where you can't see the screen but you only get to see morden and jupiter king's camera because no one would know who won they are just straight <laughs> focused on the game objective number one and that is it uh, over definitely uh, a lot more into it and uh I think the tilt of the head there was just the fact that he was one elixir away from that EQ and having that EQ getting the skellies off would have caused a lot of hurt there to Jupiter King. So just a little bit unfortunate, but Jupiter brought it back. Yeah, and brought it back handedly on that left hand side. 266 remains on the bottom left side tower. Jupiter King still not showing his eighth card and uh, hasn't really needed it so far. The Royal Hog has been putting in work and the defense has been pretty clean. Talk about the Skeleton Dragon Splash, the Skellies single target DPS, and of course that Cannon Cart being able to create a counter push makes it so that Jupiter King isn't really that um, occupied with getting that Goblin Cage out. Yeah, and right now what he's doing is really smart. Jupiter King at this point is just adding so much pressure just to avoid any counter push or any ability to from over to take control of the game he doesn't really care if anything actually makes it to the tower or not he's just saying take on all these troops take on all this you're gonna have to play defensive i'm not gonna let you take anything into your own hands and at this point it is gg very smart play from jupiter there a lot of people tend to sit back once they have the lead he did the exact opposite and i think that's what saved them the game here for sure, just making it so his opponent and over could never get back on offense. He holds that poison to the very, very end to take that tower. A, a very Jupiter King move, right? You talk about how yeah. calculated he is, how patient he is, how he really is a true macro player, and all those things kind of put in exercise right now, put into practice. Saw the aggressive, the relentless hogs coming down, the offensive pressure from Jupiter making it so over could never, ever play comfortably. He could never get his Royal Hogs out in a good moment. And and it was just all Jupiter King for this game. Yeah, and it seems like this has been the story for Jupiter, right? We saw Jupiter in game one didn't seem like himself. You put Jupiter in this game too, and it was the same Jupiter we've always been used to. Just complete control of the match, great defenses, 
great macro and micro of the whole game it was just perfectly played so it, it to me it's like once jupiter finds that consistency again that he once had he's a very very scary player yeah i mean completely you talk about the work that he did as tribe he was kind of that horrifying player that every single team would be looking out for how do you beat jupiter king he could take anyone down at any moment and we see right here in game number two just kind of the jupiter king of old yes the tower on the right hand side was you know getting lower with those earthquake cycles coming in a little bit of damage that overhead created but it never felt like for a second that jupiter was behind in game number two yeah, and just for future reference, when we talk about Jupiter's uh, reign on uh, CRL, the season he played, can you do it with when you're with Rich? I don't really like the memories that I have out of that. I, I was on the losing end of, I think, every single match I played against Jupiter for a whole year. So, uh, yeah, bad memories. But Jupiter, if you find that form again, especially if he qualifies to World Finals and he reaches Worlds with that, I am very, very excited. But he still has to win another match. Yeah, Jupiter King with South Korea, the number three and number two finishers out of the No Tilt Worlds in 2021 and 2020, respectively. And of course, back in CRL West Fall of 2020, Tribe Gaming finished in that third place spot. Big part of that because of Jupiter King. And Eric, I promise I won't say too much more about it, but I got to <laughs> do my job here. Over on the other side of it, definitely the younger of the two players here, but playing very, very well. Now, he is a little bit more emotive than Jupiter King. He's a little yeah. bit more, uh, he's got that, that kind of rookie energy but playing very calculated playing smart even in that game where he was not really ever able to create a lot of offense he still found his opportunities to get earthquake cycles in and try to just create some but game number three is where we found the vets kind of coming through yeah it's always been the experience that comes through in game three and i think it's all about taking a little bit of a risk don't go to what's expected the vets and the experience they have the edge on you when it comes to analysis, deck choice, and just overall macro of the game. So you're gonna have to surprise them, in my opinion, to actually get the advantage matchup wise, or get a, a little bit of an edge back in your favor because they already have the experience. So you need something on your side to kind of even it out. So Jupiter King, our 18 seed, the lower of the two seeds over our 15 seed. And Jupiter King going right to bait here in game number three, a bit of a tradition throughout this weekend. Yeah, it's been like, if you've had CRL experience and you go to game three, let's all use bait. It feels like a pact because it, it happened every single time. I'm not sure if it's gonna work out for him. This, oh, this is a lot better matchup yeah. for over than what Goligo just uh, had over Faust. Obviously, Barbarella is a great thing to have. The only good thing here for Jupiter is obviously no log, which means the princess could get some great value onto all those barbs if played in the back. Yeah, and that Barb Hut will be a great way to kind of control the middle of the map. You'll see Princess has dropped a lot deeper on the side of Jupiter King since he doesn't have that opportunity to go aggressive at the bridge. Not something he's going to do a lot anyway when he's playing bait because he is a bit of a slower player, but still that opportunity to be there to always keep your opponent hovering and waiting is kind of taken away by this Barb Hut. Yeah, a hundred percent. And I, I'm very curious to see if he's going to go with a rocket here, or fireball, what the choice is, because this type of deck you can use either or it is a very quick cycle after all. So some players rather use that rocket to finish off the game. If it is rocket, it's going to get a little bit trickier in my opinion. But if he does have a fireball, which I'm not sure if it's still available to him or not, that would make it a lot easier. Uh, the Rocket, I think, in long term in the game, he loses. Yeah, actually, both of these players have yet to use Fireball. It was Jupiter King who played Bar Barrel and Lightning in Game 1, Poison and Snowball in Game 2. And then from his opponent, we saw Log and Earthquake most recently, and then it was Arrows in Game Number 1, the only spell there with that Lava Guards deck. That is very, it's very odd to see and very smart play there from Jupiter. Understanding last card NATO, I cannot play this in the usual placement because it's going to activate King Tower. And if that King Tower does get activated, it makes this match so much harder than it already is. Yeah, this is really a tough matchup when you talk about how do you get value and defend a graveyard. And I think wow. the answer, honestly, Eric, is you don't. How on earth do you defend those graveyards and get value out of them? 
I was trying to just think in my head while you spoke, like, how can I spin this in a positive way? But then I'm looking at the matchup, and then I realized that he has his cycle set up in a way where he always has either NATO or uh, Bard Barrel in cycle for that Goblin Barrel. And it's just such a bad matchup and a yeah. bad place to be in. If you were able to force something out of him with the NATO or something of that sort, it would be okay. But the fact that you really don't have any bait towards that NATO other than that, he's always going to have it in cycle. And not only does Over have a really great optimal matchup here, is he's also playing it very well. You saw that tricky barrel or somewhat tricky barrel, more of a barb barrel, goblin barrel come out, which is usually offset to any of the sides because it's harder to hit all three goblins. That time it was offset to the left by one tile. He doesn't even bite. He doesn't send in the barb barrel. He just drops the knight, picks up all three, mitigates the damage, still has the barb barrel in cycle. And there you see Jupiter King loosening up his placement a bit. Then the King Tower activation comes in from Over. Yeah, the King Tower activation comes in, but this is a lot of damage. He is going to get the poison down, obviously, here, but that Princess is not enough, in my opinion. He needs to go in with something else. There's a lot to help out, but even then, look how much damage he just took off of a naked Graveyard. Yeah, 630 remaining with only a minute left to play, going into Triple Elixir, where Graveyard should get even stronger and a pile up here at the bridge. Barb Barrel should be back in cycle. Note goes to the NATO instead. Fireball Beautiful. up high. And it doesn't get much better than that in terms of the damage that you have to take. It was basically just that fireball. Yeah, if that was me playing the game, I would have nadoed everything into a position where the Valk and all the goblins were going to be on my tower at some point. So <laughs> that was a very, very nice placement out of him. He knew the fireball was coming into the ice was anyway, so he didn't really care about protecting it. And now it's just cycling graveyards. He knows the poison will get him enough damage and just needs to not really... Well, that ended quicker than I thought. Yeah, there you go. And so while on paper, Jupiter King is actually the underdog here. When you're talking about experience, you're talking about CRL history, it did feel like Jupiter King was maybe the the uh, the, the favored player here. But over three spots ahead of him on the leaderboard ends up taking this set over that bet. And uh, what a great, great showing there from the Japanese player. It was a very well played matchup. Obviously, the, like I said, he took. you need to take a risk. This is not a deck you see very often. A, a Barb Hut Graveyard deck is something that will catch your opponent off guard. No one really preps for that. I think it was a very smart deck choice out of him. And on top of that, he played it very well. Was never not caught out of cycle. Not one time in the whole match could you say, wow, he maybe used NATO when he shouldn't have, or the Barb Barrel. He knew exactly when to take damage to not go out of his own cycle, not get in his own way, really. And props to him, because playing against Jupiter in a game three, the nerves have to be running, and it does intimidate a, a bit. Yeah, and I think really to kind of point out what I thought was most impressive out of Over was, you know, regardless of what players might think or what people might think about where Jupiter King stands in 2021 as an individual, he's still one of the best in the game, period. That, I mean, that is, that is true, whether you like it or not. Over, though, if you look at his side of the screen, he was just as dialed as Jupiter needed to be, and he was not playing like a uh, an, an underdog. I mean, again, he was favored, but Jupiter King is the favorite in general, and Over played this like a pro. I loved what he did. I loved the, the pressure at the end of the game. I loved the way he was on top of his defensive cycle, as we were talking about with the NATOs, with the Bar Barrels, and then we always love to see that celebration there. Who doesn't love a little baby dragon yeah. <laughs> love there from Over at the bottom your screen and yeah playing like a true pro here over one of the best in the game that was just very impressive to be honest i thought with jupiter's performance in game number two this was going to swing his way and like you said no matter the form he's in right now he can show up on any day and beat anyone it doesn't matter if you're talking about lcq or if you're talking about the already qualified people into world finals we know what he's capable of but unfortunately, I think the matchup was his weakness here. Yeah, and you know, one more thing to point out of over, he was the number one player in the CRL 2020 League Best Players by Win Condition for Goblin Drill, and he did not bust Drill out at all in this set, and I definitely respect that decision here. We saw this game number one matchup. Let's go on to game number two, and it's important that over does that, right? You want to keep your opponents guessing at all times, and... Uh, here we go, game number two. This is where Jupiter King was able to bounce back just completely in control. He had the spell power. He had the building there to deal with all of the hog pushes coming in. He had the snowball to help.
help. And he did a really great job of kind of min-maxing, taking damage when he needed to create better offense than Over could put up for that entirety of that game. Absolutely. And on top of that, I love what Over did here. Moving forward, look at look at the three decks. He went Lava, then he went Quick Cycle Hoggies, and now a Barb Hut Graveyard. His opponent tomorrow will have absolutely no idea what to expect. He went completely different from Quick Cycle to Very Heavy in Lava to a Graveyard deck that's really not meta anymore. It was a really, really smart choice out of him. And on top of it, doesn't really show too much of what he's about. He could still run anything. And I think he's very well set up for tomorrow. And honestly, when you talk about game threes, what a great game three deck yeah. in dual format. King Tower activation available with the NATO. You have a version of the log. You have a barb hut up high to always keep those princesses being cycled on a different part of the map. They're never really an offensive threat. So many great options. And of course, the poison. So now what looked like bait being a great idea in game three could be you know, over maybe making people rethink coming out with that deck as he just put Jupiter King on it and just rocked him with it. And speaking of rocks, Bob the Rock and Yusuf coming up next in our 11th matchup of the day. We're working through our 16 matches. Remember, every single time you guys see a best of three, the person that moves on, they're guaranteed at least $3,000 and they're going to be here tomorrow. The person that loses gets a $1,000 check. They will not be at CRO World Finals and they have been eliminated from competition in in 2021 and two guys fighting for their lives right now are Bob the Rock and Yusuf neither which had great performances in CRL this year Bob the Rock did show up in a monthly final I believe it was our third monthly yeah. final uh, not having a ton of success there maybe trying to uh, find some today over Yusuf yeah he's gonna this is basically I think there's more riding on it for Bob because he's had different chances to qualify for that Worlds, right? He was so close to j just winning one match in this qualifier or one match in the other one and being there that he's had that taste of, I could be there. And that's pressure added onto himself. He is one of the best ladder RG players this game has ever seen, but we've also seen him struggle a little when it comes to CRL. When he played on that Misfits roster, you saw some great moments and some really bad moments. So. I think we go back to a little bit of the Jupiter uh, talk, obviously not to the same extreme, but it depends which Bob the Rock shows up today. Bob the Rock in round number three finished in that 7-8 spot, and then in round number eight of our monthly finals finished in the 5-6 spot. He was able to take down Furkan, our, one of our world finalists, 2-1. to one. We'll see how good he is here today. Fireball and Mega Minion out early on, maybe going right to RG. It could nope, be going to go to the with skies. the guards. Yeah, the guards give us a no RG, and I'm kind of glad it's no RG. I don't want to see him just use that win condition straight up. It is his best deck, or at least it was his best deck. I'm not too sure what he's going with in this current meta. Obviously, we saw a lot of RG, and if someone should be playing it at some point in the set, it's him. But I, I don't mind this Lava play on the first deck. We've seen a lot of success from the Lava players today. And his opponent, Yusuf, a player out of Italy, an 8.6K player whose best finish on ladder was at number 25. His best tournament finish was number 13. And he also is one of the best Goblin Drill players out there. It's the... the I'm curious to see because I think it's one of the fewest... Uh, one of the cards that can still be impactful and people that were really good with it just stopped using it all together in competitors. So I'm curious to see if someone does bust it out or if they're going to wait for day number two. What's the plan around that card? Because obviously you still need a really good matchup to win with it. But if you're really good with the cycle, you could make it work. And Bob is uh, making it work right now with the lava. Yeah, Bob feeling himself there. Damage done in both lanes here by Yusuf, but maybe just a little bit less than he would have liked. Obviously, going to a two-tower game against Lava when you have a lot of ways to get damage on tower right away can be really good. It can be a really good position to be in. But right now, having to figure out how to get 1,400 or 1,600 damage done first before that's even the conversation. Exactly. And at this point, the game completely shifts. Before you had Bob saying, okay, I need to take some damage. I need to make sure that I can just get my full lava push. 
now the game is i need to make sure i can just defend because i really really don't want this into a two tower game at any point so he's gonna go full defensive mode or at least he should it's just 30 seconds he decides to go on offense with another lava and this could get a little tricky for him if he isn't able to get any damage here Barrel comes in kind of as a last ditch effort there from Yusuf to help clean up those guards. But Bob the Rocks, Lava Hound keeping all those utility units at bay. Ram Rider coming in as that is the only tower seeking unit that Yusuf has. That and well, his poison to get some damage in. But Bob the Rock going up early here in this set. Game number one going his way. And, you know, when you see Lava Loon, you think maybe Bob's going to go with Miner at some point in this best of three. I'd hope so. I think I want to see something that we're not used to. You have to think that today is important. Of course it is. A lot of money riding on it. You need to win today. But you also can't give up too much of your strategy for tomorrow because yeah. you're going to be playing the better opponent tomorrow, the person that already won. And the world final spot is what everyone wants. Yes, $1,000, $3,000, $5,000 is a lot of money. But you want that world's chance. It is a really interesting conversation that you're having there, Eric, when you talk about not showing your hand too much. You obviously don't really have to worry about your world finals competitors knowing too much about you when you consider how far out the LCQ is from worlds and, you know, kind of the format being up in the air still. We haven't announced just exactly what's going to be happening in a world finals. And of course, we'll be giving you guys more information about the world finals tomorrow. But when you talk about not letting your opponents knowing too much about you, that's still really, really relevant when you talk about just this weekend, right? You want to make sure that you're not showing too much for tomorrow, which is the most important day. And I like what Bob the Rock did here in game number one. I really, really like this deck choice. I like how he played it on that first lava push on the right hand side. He tanked the full bandit on the left and gave me basically was just like it didn't exist and that's exactly what you have to do when you play lava we've seen a lot of players in whether it's qualifiers monthly finals pull out a lava deck but not really understand how to use it to its full potential and then they try to defend here try to attack there and it never really works out bob looks like he's been practicing this type of deck this type of matchup and played it perfectly yeah, so Bob the Rock here in the lead, and we do have another match of the day coming your way in just a little bit between Vitor and Ta. That's right, Vitor and Ta. Vitor has been making a run for his World Finals berth, and then Ta, of course, our no-name that climbed to the top earlier this year in our monthly finals. We haven't seen a lot of him since then, so while we are here with Bob the Rock, at the moment and use if there is that match of the day coming your way so remember hashtag vtor in the chat or hashtag ta to let us know who you think is going to come out on top of that next match of the day as we are getting very very close to the end of our day bob the rock finding success with lava loon in game number one what do you want to see here in game number two eric I don't mind RG. I really think he has room to play with, right? Everyone already expects that out of you. So you're not really showing too much because you know what? You're going to play against Bob. You're going to prep for RG no matter what he shows you. Right. So why not play that deck that you're so, so good with? You have a game in your hand already. Maybe play a variant of it. So it's not the usual one that anyone expects. You can even go furnace. You can go lightning. Just something a little bit of a change up but there's no pressure on you right now you can use your best deck you're up in the set and he has to adapt to it so i would like to see an rg bob the rock using fireball and snowball in game number one poison and bar barrel coming out from yusuf on the other side of it so again a graveyard game three is something that we might see if we are even able to get there but first, game two coming your way with Yusuf down one to Bob the Rock. Bob the Rock representing the Netherlands and then Yusuf coming out of Italy here. Bob the Rock's personal best on ladder at 8.63, or 8.6K as well, which is very, very close to Yusuf's. And so pretty evenly matched here when you talk about it on paper. Let's find out what happens yeah, yeah. in game number two. Yeah, but this is a whole different monster, right? You're playing ladder and you're sitting at home, relax with your music, not, not really, you know, I'll play one match and then if I want to take a break, I can go ahead and take a break. This is a whole different beast. You have the pressure, you have the streams, you have everyone watching, you have the casters, people on Twitter, all of this, right? Like, there is a lot more to this than there and is to ladder in my sound opinion. issues here for a second, my apologies. And now the baby dragon here is going to get taken out by that. 
and the cannon cart cannon cart and cannon cart should go down here with that snowball yeah there it is so the cannon cart goes down to that snowball and pretty much stalemate right now not much going yeah. on Looking like uh, maybe Graveyard at the bottom of your screen here from Bob the Rock. Maybe going to take advantage of that poison being out of cycle. And then top of your screen, we've already seen the Royal Hogs come out. And a good amount of splash damage, including those archers being able to be split in the back to help both the uh, Royal Hogs lanes if they do come in with a dual lane push. And Yusuf decides to go all in on one side. Bomb Tower there to catch and Bob the Rock in a great, great yeah. spot. Yeah, that, that was like, okay, he just spent the Valk on the right hand side and the poison. I'm gonna go in with hogs and I got a little bit scared for Bob until I saw that bomb tower and then I realized why he was okay playing that poison and that Valk. He really doesn't have anything to worry about. When you look at this cycle with the baby dragon, the Valk, the bar barrel and the bomb tower, just so many tools there for those hoggies. Yeah, and that was a really, really nice snowball out of Yusuf. Going to get some damage here from that mortar. One shot will come in, but he had to work really, really hard yeah. for it, Eric. And I don't know how many times he's going to be able to do that throughout this game. And like you said, Bob the Rock just having every response in the book to those Royal Hogs at the moment. Yeah, and here we go with the cannon card and the bomb tower having to be played off high. This is actually a good thing for Yusuf here. He not only takes the cannon card out of cycle, he takes the bomb tower. And now Bob the Rock is on the back foot. You need to get control of this match. You have one of those decks that you're supposed to control the match more than control yes. the damage. Yes, that's a really, really great point that you make. And Bob may be playing just a little bit too aggressive here early on in this game, but still a lot of time left remaining as we are 22 seconds away from overtime. Mortar coming out up high here as a bunch of archers focus on that mortar, try to take it out of play. Yeah, and this is what I want to see out of him. Don't focus too much on your offense right now because all it takes is one good push you take control of the match you cut you catch him out of cycle and then you're good to go what you have to focus on right now is getting the cycle that you want and the one that he doesn't want and that is how you do it you force out the mortar and again i think a little bit too aggressive yeah. here yeah i agree eric i think we both were not looking for that graveyard to come down right there you see bob even going with an offensive poison on top of the muscle no damage top of the princess tower and the cannon cart but yeah as you're saying, man, no damage comes in, and Bob the Rock not really playing this matchup the way that he should, right? You just heard Eric talk about how he needs to slow things down, worry about not taking damage and getting efficient defenses down on the board, then worry about offense when your opponent overextends himself. And right now, Yusuf doesn't really have to do any of the things that Bob needs him to because of the way that Bob is playing at the moment. Yeah, and this time around, this is a lot better, right? Don't just, don't, don't graveyard. You don't need it. You can get that chip from the poison until you have a big build up from the back where you not only have a baby dragon because if it's just a baby dragon they're going to tank it on the bridge you need that valve you need at least a barbell to tank for that graveyard and then make everything else happen but does he get bomb tower in time he does yeah bomb tower coming down here from bob the rock 15 12 to 19 15 in a game that felt like it was kind of slipping out yeah. of bob the rock's controls just a moment ago it does seem like he's kind of done exactly what you talked about what he needed to do eric get in charge of the cycle worry less about offense more about defense and then turn what you can into counter pushes let the game come to you don't go looking for it and this is a good opportunity for him right now oh yeah nope. look at that I yeah, Ooh, the cannon cart going down is a bit of a bummer, but cannon cart back in cycle. Yeah, this Valk is going to go down pretty quick. The, the baby dragon is still taking the spear goblins go down as well. So this is the type of push you want. The bar barrel comes in. The cannon cart is d distracted. Everything is going according to plan. But the problem is how Ooh. far back he is already in the matchup. And that was a really, really nice fireball there from Yusuf with the snowball on the back end, 742 to 1413. And while Bob the Rock had ways to keep those Royal Hogs at bay with the bomb tower, he had the Valk there, he had the baby dragon there, just maybe a little bit out of sync with the way that he needed to play this deck. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in our uh, in between game time, Eric. I'd love for you to break down just a little bit more of what Bob should have done maybe over the first 80 seconds of that game, maybe even the first two minutes of that game that we didn't see him do correctly. Absolutely. I used to play Graveyard uh, the same kind of way that Bob just played it, and I was fortunate enough to team with Diego, who is one of the best Graveyard players in the game. And when it comes to Graveyard decks, you're not looking to win in single elixir. Your deck is so much stronger in double elixir 
your only objective is to survive with the most amount of hp on your towers and the most amount of control in the game you want to make sure the cycle is good you want to make sure that he is not comfortable overspending on just trying to get some chip and add the pressure of okay double elixir i'm gonna suffer so i need to get damage 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 and that's where their mistakes come in on this match bob was the one going aggressive as if he didn't want the double elixir to come right and right. that is a very very big mistake when you're playing graveyard and some small stuff there we saw a couple times bob giving good fireball value out especially at the end of that game instead of going maybe bomb tower to the right hand side of his princess tower and then leaving that cannon cart off of its wheels on the left hand side he kind of stacks them up gives great fireball value which means he has to overspend again and yeah so bob the rock maybe just getting a little bit ahead of himself in game number two feeling himself after game number one but now we are at a best of one for at least one of these guys to take three thousand dollars and go on to the next rate uh, stage of our last chance qualifier one of them will be sent home but will be the man from the netherlands in bob the rock or will it be the italian in yusuf and you know, we talked a lot about Bob the Rock. You know, Yusuf played that game Fair really much. well too, right? Never ever did what Bob needed him to, right? He yeah. never sold out completely on offense and then just let a massive counter push come back through. He never gave way too much poison value. It was all played very, very well by him. Yeah, he always split the musky and the spear goblin. So on that yes. defense there from the graveyards, you had to pick and choose which one you wanted to take out because I'm not giving you both and you're not going to have extra elixir because I'm tanking on the bridge every time you play that Valkyr, every time you play that baby dragon. He was very, very well set up in his mind on what he had to do. And it was very smart play out of him. Obviously, some mistakes here and there from Bob allowed a, an easier road, but he still had to do his part. And now anyone could win. That That's the dangerous thing about, you know, the best of threes you win game number yeah. one you're feeling on top of the world you're like yeah I, I got this you lose game number two and not only is he going in with the momentum to game number three it's a 50 50 shot everything that happened before that doesn't matter it's one match yeah that's a really great point you make about that momentum going into game number three even if you drop game number one so yusuf at the top of your screen bob the rock at the bottom here and you know, talking about the spells that aren't available, I was going to say Yusuf should go to the skies, and he beats me to the draw there. Yeah. As you see Royal Hog come out from Bob and a bit of a tilt to the head. And the reason I was saying that is because Bob the Rock has used Mega Minion, Fireball, Giant Snowball. He's also used poison. Bomb Tower and Poison yeah. and Archers, right? So a lot of great responses to air units, not in the hand of Bob the Rock, but he does have that flying machine, that pesky flying machine, and Yusuf does not have Fireball. He does and he's probably going to be running the zap arrows version of this deck and i don't know it's it's going to be tricky because he can get a lot of value with these recruits it's not like they, they're not valuable at all but the problem is what spell does bob have like you said he used up so many spells already that are important that th this is where the issue lies the skelly dragon's getting a ton of value splitting them each one's getting on some of the recruits they will always get some chip damage just because of the slow uh, pace of their fire rate but at the end of the day it is a very very positive trade when you talk about elixir value wow so a defensive lightning comes out from bob there and then arrow wow. so look at that really really nice cleanup and now we just see an aggressive guards at the bridge bob kind of takes a look at the camera and goes what's that all about i have nothing for that yeah. yeah, really, really great play there by Yusuf and Bob maybe a bit surprised by his opponent's recognition of his cycle. Yeah, Bob's face was like, what are you doing? But at the same time, he got 800 damage out of a set of guards. That was yeah. so smart of him. He recognized, okay, what does he have in cycle? A flying machine, royal recruits, and that's about it. He cannot defend the guards with the royal hogs. He already used the arrows. The zappies are out of cycle as well. I'm just going to throw some guards on the bridge, and that is a very frustrating thing to happen to you. Yeah, that is one of my favorite things in the game is when you see pro players or players at the highest level just go with a naked push at the bridge that just recognizes the cycle. It will never not be satisfying to me, and that was great there for Yusuf as Bob the Rock tries to take the lead on the left-hand side, but Yusuf push coming here on the right. Miner goes to the back of the tower, gets some good damage, bring it down to 917 as that flying machine takes some love there from the arrows but stays on the board. Yeah, and this is where it gets dangerous here for Yusuf. He allowed that flying machine to, to stay up with the those arrows he also gave up too much value on the guards and wow. the lava 
and that's exactly what happened he needed to use the mega minion onto the flying machine to finish it off and bobby is gonna take this game it appears so Ooh, i thought the mega minion was just gonna sneak by but it, it all came down in my opinion the guards worked out very well in the in the solo push but then he right. tried it again under the lava knowing he had arrows which would not only clean up the lava pups but the guards as well he gave up all the value that he had the flying machine stayed up you need to use your mega minion because bob was really smart putting those recruits in front of it to you know add that pressure and as soon as he saw that mega minion go down he know he was clean on elixir let me go royal hogs on the other side exactly that is just spelled out perfectly here from eric in the booth and that's all the things that bob did he saw all those interactions come down he goes this is the way that i win the game that royal hog sent on the left hand side beautiful stuff there and while the skeleton dragons and guards were able to get some good value early on in this game it was the royal recruits in front of those pesky units like the flying machine that really made use of have to overspend in positions he didn't want to great play there by the guards bob was more annoyed by it than i think anything <laughs> and uh you know it is a great hit from yusuf but we see this mega minion i Here, believe those guards right there yeah right those guards they turn around minor goes to the back you know yusuf still in the lead here but that flying machine is the one that stays alive and a second mega minion has to come down yeah second here you see the recruits and there's the mega minion on the right and you see he has no elixir there was two elixir up on the board there with three recruits on the left and a full set of royal hoggies and you don't have a big spell there was no way you were defending that it is actually impossible to do it and then here just really smart you know what i'm not going to take any risk just a straight up defensive lightning yep and that will do it bob the rock closes things out there over yusuf from italy bob the rock will move on to compete tomorrow and see if he can continue this run but it is now time to move on to the next matchup after we talk about these decks. Eric, talk me through game number one. Game number one, really smart deck choice out of Bob. And I actually really like the tombstone pick here because it doesn't take away from other buildings that you might need later on. We see so many people run something like a Tesla, an Infernal Tower, a Goblin Cage, which could be useful depending on what cards the other, uh, what your opponent has already used. Maybe you can snipe in that third game, right? This time around, Bob said, you know, I'm gonna use a Tombstone because I'm not gonna use that for anything else. I leave all my options open. Really smart deck choice out of him. The guards obviously help against uh, Pekka. And just, I really, really like what he did there. Going on to game number two here, it was Bob the Rock who was running Graveyard against these Royal Hogs, and Yusuf did a really good job yeah. of letting Bob the Rock overextend himself earlier in this game than he needed to, making it so that those Graveyard pushes were really a lot less impactful than he wanted them to be just because he needed to wait more on the counter pushes and then maybe would have had a little bit more Elixir to deal with those Royal Hogs from Yusuf. And Towards the end of the game, things started to get a little bit closer, but it was ultimately Yusuf who takes game number two and extends it to game number three, which is what we just saw. Let's take a look at those decks. Yeah, game number three wasn't really all that much about matchup, in my opinion. I think they both had chances. It all came down to getting overly aggressive, which is completely the opposite of what he did in game number two. Yusuf was able to sit back take his chances when he needed to. I think getting that damage from the guards was actually negative mentally because he got, it seems like he got excited with the, the concept of, wait, I can get a lot out of these guards, but he didn't realize the arrows were in cycle, gave up way too much free elixir on that with the lava pups and the guards, then was forced to over defend on that flying machine. And that was about it. Yeah, Bob, Bob played perfect. So let's take a look here at our updated bracket before we go into a CMG civil war between yeah. <laughs> Kasim and Ian, which will be a lot of fun to talk about here. We can see we got three players that have moved on already to join the other from the the other eight on the other side of the bracket. Bob the Rock over and Codigo over and Codigo, the first matchup of the day. Uh, on this side of it, Bob the Rock awaiting the winner of this next set between, like we just said, a CMG Civil War, Ian and Kasim. Eric, what are your thoughts on both of these players? I think they're both really talented players, but I think I give a little bit of the edge over to Ian. I think he has one of those natural talents where his ceiling is just so high that if he can get all the elements together, uh, deck preparation, you know, moving a little bit quicker so onto himself. 
he's he's dealt with a little bit of timing issues in the past but if he can get that along with his natural skill altogether he could be one of the top players that we're going to talk about for a long time in in clash royale he's just starting his crl career yeah, I could not agree more. Ian, a very exceptional player. He's got a number two, a number four, a number three ladder finish. And very, very tough stuff to do there. On the other side of it, Kasim doing great in tournaments. Two number two finishes and a number four finish there. 8.8K personal best out of Kasim and an 8.9K personal best from Ian just behind that world record. Yeah, I mean, we do that also, so no big deal. <laughs> yeah, no big deal. <laughs> Just got to talk about something on broadcast. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but I want to see the matchups here as well, because it's always difficult. I'm glad I never had to deal with this because we played in a team format back then. But when you're going against teammates in an org that is as kind of close knit as CMG, right? They all practice together. They all move together and you play then against them. It's there's already mind games in a duels format. What do you do now? You know, this is someone that you've practice partnered with for a while. He's on your org. You've used the same analyst before. So it's a really, really tough position to be in. <laughs> yeah, and talking about a tough position for the analyst of CMG yeah. or the trading staff, whatever you want to call it, try to figure out how do you help both of our guys out but not give an advantage to either one of them and both of them going very fast cycle here in game number one. Ian going wall breakers, bottom of your screen. Kasim at the top looking like he's just going for control at the moment. And it is Ian who is in the lead damage wise wow. and a little bit of elixir here. Yeah, that was a great fire spirit there by uh, Kasim. He didn't even have to play the skellies. That would have taken out completely the uh, wall breakers push. He played the skellies, I guess, mainly just to cycle, but it was very, very smart play because he knew that the bats would end up going towards the miner, which would end up having the splash damage from the fire spirit and in turn forced out wall breakers. So you no longer have to worry about an offensive play. Very well played there by Kasim. And even uh, though he's still, oh no, well, he's up on damage now. It is a very, very close match, and I love these cycle matches like this. Oh, I know. Quick cycle matchups are absolutely my favorite. You saw there, uh, Kasim misses the Tesla with that first earthquake, but it didn't matter because the Tesla was kind of placed out of range of all the units that it needed to hit, mainly the miner. So 1274 to 1282. Kasim in the lead for just a second as that miner switches things back in Ian's favor. Yeah. And then that's kind of the name of the game, right? Just going and to that same back. spot. Yeah, and now back in the other side, and then uh, this is what we're going to have over and over again, but it's really going to come down to if Ian can get at least one wall breaker to connect, I think that's going to be his out in this match, or who can catch a miner first, because right now they're both really struggling to catch a miner. We know they're exceptional players, but no one is catching miners, and again, from both sides, both miners connect. Obviously, a little more damage done there with the Earthquake, but... They need to, I think that's the only thing that's going to give one person the edge over the other. Yeah, the Earthquake doing a good job there, looking for the Spear Goblins. Once again, Kasim finds the Spear Goblins with that Earthquake. Miner stays alive on the tower. Wallbreaker's coming in, though, for Ian, and it looks like this could be going Kasim's way, but 510 to 350, still anyone's ballgame, especially when you talk about bats getting on the tower, and they do not. Wallbreakers have not come down yet, and there we go. Miner gets that's the it. chip damage in, Earthquake comes down, and Kasim up one game to zero over his teammate. You see Ian kind of smiling a couple times throughout that matchup going, all right, brother, all right, here we are. We're going head to head. <laughs> this team had some nice minor catches early on, but like you said, those minor catches later were much more difficult for Ian when you talk about trying to create offensive pressure with the bats and then trying to defend with the spear goblins because the spear goblins were getting taken off the earthquake. But if he went in with minor bats push on the other lane, or excuse me, minor spear goblins the other lane, it would have been too easy to clean up with the log, with the skellies, or with, I mean, literally anything that Kasim has, the bomber or the fire spirit. So yeah. I understand why Ian had to play defense the way he did and why he tried to create offense the way that he did. But it was Kasim who had a little bit of a better matchup when you talk about just that earthquake being able to find those spear goblins. Yeah. The, the only thing I will say is obviously for Gassim, he has that Valk uh, available. They both have that Valk available. And when you watch the gameplay, if you get the chance and you go back and you watch some of the gameplay from Javi, some of the gameplay from people like CMC and Trainer Chris and all these players I used to play minor, it's great to get chip damage, but their main focus always was to get the chip damage off of their tower and it seemed like ian was just go 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 at the end when he if i think he took his time a little bit more 
that fireball for him is a lot more valuable than the earthquake the earthquake will not get the valk off your miner but a fireball will do that for you right, right. so i think if he would have just played a little more defensive focused on that defensive edge he could have taken this match yeah, I mean, maybe what we need to see then out of Ian instead is looking for Fireball plus minor damage, yeah. not worrying about the bats there, getting the Spear Goblins down on the right-hand side to bait out the log, which is less damage coming in from Kasim, and then the bats come down to defend the miner. Yes, obviously, they're not going to catch the miner, but the Spear Goblins weren't catching the miner either. They were literally yeah. doing nothing other than feeding <laughs> Elixir to the opponent. So that small change-up, and I like what you said there, you know, talking about the old greats of the game and what they were focusing on playing minor decks. It's not just about getting damage on tower since the damage is so minuscule coming in from the miner it's more about preventing damage right we've all played those games with cycle yeah. decks where you're in charge the entire time you're playing a minor deck you're always getting on tower and then they get one good push that comes in like you said eric one wall breaker connecting yeah it levels the playing field and kasim was not about to let that happen Absolutely. Plus it adds frustration. If you miner and it keeps getting caught and caught and caught yeah. and caught again and again and again, it is so frustrating. And in most recent memory, the, the best players that we've had is someone like Javi, who, cat, who I think he caught like 17 miners in a match in yeah. CRL. And it wasn't about offense at all for him. He ended up winning based on how many miners he caught. And that is what the great players do. You you have to have patience. Obviously, both of these players are rookies, so they'll have to learn that as time goes on. And not to take anything away from them, they played a great game of Clash. Yeah. Just a little bit of slight change here and there is what will get you, you know, that world final spot to the LCQ spot. And obviously, I'm sure they're going to work on it. They, they worked very, very hard. And not that this was even the deciding factor, but we did yeah. see that early Valk cycle that caught the miner from Ian. You kind of saw Ian tip his head, give a little bit of a smile, you know, some credit to his teammate there in Kasim. But that idea that Kasim even had that early on in that matchup, knowing, all right, I need to keep these miners off my tower. The Valkyrie's going to be a great way to do it. He can't overspend and take it out in single. And so great recognition there of the matchup in game number one. We saw two very similar looks out of both of these CMG players. Let's see where they go here in game number two. Look at like, uh, oh, you know, the same thing once again, maybe with a little bit of a twist. You, you, you asked something, right, earlier today. <laughs> you said, how does an analyst make this fair? By giving them the same deck, <laughs> giving them the same archetypes. You know what? I work for both of you. You're both going to play the same thing. May the better player win. Good luck. I kind of love that call here. And now we see a bit of a change up, at least for now. There we go. Goblin Cage coming out. On, Ian wants to make sure. Yeah, there you go. Get the archers out. That way we have a, a fair share across the board here. It will be the Fish Boy instead. So maybe we see RG coming out here from Kasim and maybe Ian going to go to Graveyard, although more time to be told. Yeah, and this is going to lock onto the cage first, so it's not going to pull that goblin and that defends everything. A really nice poison there as well. So right now, leg up here to uh, Ian, in my opinion, just on cycle and elixir and all of that, but that fireball evens it up. Yeah, really nice fireball there from Kasim, as you can say, exactly even in Elixir as they both tick to eight right now. 5.5 leaked at the top, 4.3 leaked at the bottom, but an even 10 as they both tick there and a snowball comes out from one, another cage from Kasim. You'll probably see another cage come down here as well. And this is what we're going to see over and over again until someone takes control of the game. Obviously, they're not the same decks, but you will see a lot of the same play style just because of how similar the cards are and the way that, you know, a, a cage, a mega minion and the snowballs and all that are all played the same way, no matter what deck you play them in. Right. So that that's really what it comes down to the poison. If it comes down here, this could be dangerous. Wow, and that cannon cart locks on the Mother Witch. That is going to be trouble for yeah. Kasim. You love the graveyard cannon cart aggro at the bridge the moment that he sees the MK come down opposite lane there for Kasim, and Kasim just caught looking. 1261 remains on that tower, and this Mega Knight, not a threat. Yeah, I think this is going to be game for Ian just because he already has so much damage done, and the defenses for him are actually really good. He has the Knight to cover over onto that Mega Knight. What we see the great players do is not really spend too much or that cage onto the Mega Knight. You just go ahead and Knight, and with the DPS from the Archers as well, you get a lot of damage in. But the Archers being cycled on the right could be a very big problem for him.
And I was just going to say, this does feel like the moment where we probably see Kasim go in with his graveyard. You know, not going to be RG looking back through the cards that he's played. Yeah. Honestly, the Mega Minion kind of gave that away in the very beginning. But with dual format, you're never 100% sure. People might change things up just a bit. But the MK came out. We know it's going to be graveyard. Graveyard does finally come down, but he gets basically nothing out of it. Ian didn't have archers in that lane, but he has a lot of other great responses. The cannon cart, the poison, the snowball, and Kasim is feeling that right now. Yeah, I think the only thing Ian has to be a little bit more careful with here is cycling those archers. He's done it twice already, and obviously he didn't pay the price for it because he uses that poison defensively. But if he's caught without that poison and he does cycle those archers, it could be very, very dangerous game he's playing here. So Archer's used his cannon fodder there once again to protect that goblin cage for just a moment. So as you're talking about, Eric, maybe Ian will start to kind of value that three elixir set of archers just a bit more as a minute and 20 seconds remain here in overtime. Triple elixir coming your way in 15 seconds. And both these guys having very, very strong or heavy beat down decks, the single target DPS coming in different fashions. And it does feel like Ian has that battle won by just a bit. Yeah, no poison though. Fireball has to come in here. There's a fireball this time around. No poison and the snowball is going to slow that down. And now we have a really even match. Yeah. 1495 to 1057. Skeleton damage already yeah, piling up wow. though. And the poison is in. That is game over. Kasim going to drop game number two. All tied up going into game number three for our CMG Civil War here. Match number 12 on the day. Just a handful more coming your way. But it is all about CMG's Kasim and Ian. And, uh, you know, it, an interesting game there, right? Two graveyard yeah. decks. Ian played his a little bit more aggressive throughout. What was the kind of the X factor for you in this matchup, Eric? I think it was this right here. He was caught out without any protection for that Mother Witch, which also didn't force out the poison due to the cannon cart locking onto it. And then he was able to defend the counter push pretty easily because of the poison and not being expended on offense, right? He was just able to use that poison onto his own graveyard. And even though the push was massive, like we saw, no damage was done. I think you're the one that said it. he's like, yeah, it looked great, but no damage was done. And it's because that mother witch just went down to that kind of card. I, and that you talk was a about big turning point. Yeah, yeah. And you talk about the responses there for Ian having a bunch of great graveyard yeah. responses, right? The archers are there, the poison is there, being able to set the line up high. So all things going his way in game number two. Log and fireball out in game one, snowball and poison out in game number two, but no graveyard available for Kasim. Kasim used snowball, fireball in that last game. And of course, log earthquake in game number one. So going into game number three, a lot of potential out there and a lot of spells unavailable. But bait after that set we saw a little bit ago feels just a little bit more uh, precarious to it. play. I'm with it. You know, I'm with the, I'm with the Coligo's bait. I like the one yeah. that he ran because honestly, I think it gives you a little bit more of a cushion on defense than the ones that we've seen out of some other players where they're really just dependent on the princess and a knight or a Valk. And that makes it really scary. Also, the fact that uh, Ian cannot run Valk or knight, if I'm not mistaken, from the first two matchups. He used Valk in the minor deck and he just used knight here as well. So yep. the only bait he could run is a Rascal's version. I don't mind it, but I also wouldn't mind something on the heavier side. You could go a Golem. We saw Bag work with it. I, I don't think it's a bad option. People don't expect it, especially if your teammates maybe try to surprise him. Yeah, I love that call. Even going something gross like Golem or Lava Clone, yeah, right? I mean, why not? Poison's out of play for uh, for both of these guys, or, or excuse me, for just one of these guys in Ian. So that could be an opportune pull to bust out the clone at this moment. It is tough, though, right? When you find yourself with those kind of gimmicky decks at the highest level, you might get one hit early on, but sometimes one is all that it takes. Yeah. And one thing that I think is really interesting and, and kind of uh, it's something that you and I have talked about a lot over the last few weeks, Eric, is, you know, that double spawner deck we saw it kind of today open up with that deck i believe it was tico that ran it against pompeo yeah. to start our day at the highest level in crl we've cast royale masters we cast game stars they're not crl this is the biggest brightest league out there for clash royale those types of decks just do not fare well at the highest level those no win condition overwhelmed decks where you're expecting your opponent to make mistakes i don't think either of them are going to run that in this game it was just kind of a, an aside yeah. that i was remembering it's also very scary to run it right now i think if you run it it has to be game one just mm -hmm. because you maybe catch him with the spell 
that he doesn't want to have maybe a lava with arrows but right now if you look at ian's hand right because if you're kasim and you're gonna play that he has lightning earthquake or arrows available to him so two out of the three you lose that matchup instantly you and don't wonder... want to yeah go ahead I was going to say, and I wonder if Arrows just becomes kind of a must pull in game three at this point. If you haven't already played it in games one or two, the amount that Arrows can stack up well against yeah. Lava Hound that can do well against Bait, which has been something that people have liked to play. It does seem like Arrows is something that has to be played in every set. Yeah, I really think Arrows made a comeback and for a good reason. It just it gets so much value on everything with the with the Arrows of the past compared to the Arrows of now. They are so good at just dealing with any type of troop that even troops that you think aren't really affected by arrows still go down to them. I want to see here, Ian maybe listen to you, but on Ian's side, he doesn't have to worry about the earthquake at least. Yeah, and that was actually something that was interesting when you were talking. I was like, well, you know, Earthquake's out of cycle. Maybe the double spotter actually comes in because, you know, you'd have to put your yeah. opponent on lightning or something like that. But Kasim does have poison, which will fare well he missed it. against one of the buildings. Yes, he did. <laughs> on the on the tower, which is not ideal. Yeah, not how you want to start. And Earthquake here out of Ian is exactly how you want to start. That is why I said it's kind of risky for Kasim here to use any type of spawner deck. And he's going with the oh, double wow. spawner deck here. And that is a very risky play. Yeah, not the person who I thought would rock the double spawner. You know, Ian did have Earthquake available uh, and just kind of a really, really tough spot to be in. Obviously, that's a very, very specific matchup. But Murphy's Law, here we are. Yeah, it's it's just simply a probability i think i i never actually got to coach into the duels format but the way i would look at it is probabilities and the probability of him using lightning or earthquake is about 80 percent right really to be honest and both of those match up very well so i just don't think it was the play but right now he's still doing okay i just don't see in the long term how he's able to hold on plus the fact that if ian plays this a smart way you get rid of that furnace and then you allow the goblin hut to actually play into your mother witch to then pull out the poison from kasim and then you have a free flying machine right yeah so it's a full chess match here where the furnace is the only thing that actually bothers you that's a really really great breakdown from one of the best coaches that's ever done it and eric maybe that's something that ian can look for as this game moves forward it is really really important to think that far ahead you got it not just a couple steps ahead you got to think a whole cycle ahead and the idea of baiting out that poison from the mother which so you can get a free flying machine on the board would be devastating to kasim and we'll see if ian's going to take advantage of that as at all as he's having a little bit of trouble dealing with these pushes yeah, those arrows came in way too soon. I think he was just trying to get some chip damage, but he doesn't need it. You're up in the game right now. There's the earthquake. Beautiful. You always want to get rid of that furnace. That is what's going to give you the most trouble and beautifully played again. Exactly what he has to do, but that flying machine just not needed in my opinion. You want to give some value there to your mother witch before she goes down. Poison does come down like you were talking about, Eric, but now Flying Machine not in cycle. So we'll see if Ian can work his way all the way back around. Royal Hogs now coming out instead. No building there. Earthquake down already. And just like that, Ian screams into a commanding lead. Yeah, he does, but Earthquake is out of cycle when you're playing a double spawner deck. He's lucky that he went full offense here. I think if Kasim would have just played a little bit more patient and got the Furnace down, he could have really impacted the game with no EQ available to him. And those Royal Recruits really going to eat up all those Fire Spirits, get no value. And Kasim is going full Wedo mode here on the bridge path. <laughs> yeah, that first cannon cart almost stays alive long enough to be a huge threat. But now the second cannon cart comes down. We'll deal with that Mother Witch, then get pushed to the hut, back and forth, yeah. back and forth they go, and the Mother Flying Witch machine. stays on the board. Flying Machine does not connect the poison back in here for Kasim. Now gonna have to deal with maybe a Royal Hogs push. Six Elixir uh -oh. in the tank here, and the Flying Machine does connect. That's a big connection. That is a huge connection there from him, but he still needs to defend this. This is too much damage oh for him gosh. here. This is, oh man, it's who can cycle quicker at this point. He needs to go Hoggies, he needs to go Fly Machine. Go, go, go. Arrows missed the tower. Earthquake yeah. gonna come in soon. Yeah, this is, 
this is I can't I can't imagine being chastised right now. Man. <laughs> <laughs> I love the call with the high arrows there. They didn't need to get on the tower. Yeah. He knew Earthquake would do it. He didn't want to have to worry about the flying machine. You could see Kasim feeling the hurt. It's gotta suck to lose, but then losing to a teammate maybe makes it just a little bit better, or does it make it a little bit worse, Eric? I think it makes it worse. And you know, I, I was like, I'm a super competitive person, but mainly with my friends. Like I'll sit there and I'll play Mario Kart with my friends and I will be more competitive than anyone. But then I go online and I don't care if I win or lose. But right. you, like, losing to people that you then have to interact to it is the worst feeling, and especially at 100 uh, HP. It, it, it's gonna hurt, it's gonna sting for a while. And the toughest thing here for uh, for Kasim from CMG is now his teammate can kind of lord that over him for the entire next year as Kasim has now been eliminated. Ian, doing work here in game number three. Those Royal Hogs pushes coming in. That first one was devastating. Bring that tower down to 680, and then we get a sneak by with just an earthquake to boot, and that is going to do it in the game here. This bar barrel, not where Kasim yeah. wanted it. Honestly, that bar barrel, when we watched it come down, just one tile too far to the right, should have just been one more to the left, would have dealt with probably two less hog hits there, which then make it so that the arrows and the earthquake have to earthquake have to come down on the tower. Could have still ended up being the exact same result, done the exact same way, but still something that Kasim would want to have to look back on the game tape and maybe clean up in the future. It's It was a really, really well played match by both of them. I think Ian yeah. got a little ahead of himself when he cycled that EQ without any building being there. And that's what allowed Kasim back in the game. And also a heads up play by Kasim to realize that and say, okay, he's not, he doesn't have this elixir. He can't take away my furnace and all that. Let me go in, bridge spam, bridge spam, bridge spam. And he almost brought it back, but every single game in this set was very very close yeah they were fascinating and, and to start here with two quick minor cycle decks and although one of the decks here on the screen has more spell power has minor wall yep. breakers and and all that good stuff it was really about kasim just getting his minor on tower and controlling the game with the earthquake and never letting damage come in on the right hand side obviously he didn't mitigate 100 percent of it but he mitigated more than ian did let's go to game number two Two more similar looks here, but it was Ian who completely controlled the graveyards coming in from Kasim, and you can see why, right? You look at the responses yeah. he has, even just the poison and archers is more than enough. Snowball to boot, and then Kasim on the other side of it. He did have his Mother Witch, but much slower cycle and much less single target DPS, which led us to game number three. And yeah, yeah, I mean, again, Hoggies versus Hoggies. We saw Graveyard versus Graveyard, Miner versus Miner. So it's not <laughs> that anyone had a huge advantage. But, uh, one spawner here for Ian, and I think that's the right call. On the other end, Kasim took a very, very big risk on knowing what spells were left for Ian and still going with it. And it, I don't think it was the correct choice. Maybe if you just had one and something more of like Ian's deck, he would have had a little more success. So I do give a slight advantage deck-wise to Ian. And you talked about it, Eric, you know, with the spells that were remaining and how much we've seen Earthquake and Lightning today, there's about an 80% chance that Kasim was going to run into one of those two spells. He did run into Earthquake and that ended up really helping Ian out. So there we go. Three quarters of the way through the day and a lot of players have been eliminated, but a lot more still remain. Vitor and Ta up next, then Koka and Osama, Framcito and Boss, and then Hugo and Ali to close out your day. That is match 13. Whew coming at you and so as much as i would love to just sit here and do this all day long and i'm going to be back once again you and i are going to say goodbye <laughs> for a moment rich and josh are going to take over and eric i believe that's going to be the last time we see you at least casting a match today brother awesome having you here for the lcq any big standouts to you before we throw it over to rich and josh i think that earlier in the day that oh all right yeah, yeah, no, I, they, just that, I'll, I'll give it to one play. That NATO Electro Dragon uh, playback was amazing, and I'll leave it at that because I've taken enough camera time already today. I don't want to overdo it, you know. Have fun, Rich and Josh. Hey, yeah, shout out to our producers. There's a lot of moving pieces yeah. going on. We have nothing but love for them. I'll be back. We'll see you in a little bit, Eric. Let's go to Rich and Josh.
And we're on this time. There we go. Hey, everybody. Hurry up, Eric. <laughs> yeah, come on, Eric, please. I mean, how many points does one guy need to make? Uh, speaking of how many do you, one guy need to make, Josh, uh, we only have um, 15 to 30 more players from CMG coming up throughout this tournament, so we'll get to them in just a little bit. But first up, we have a really fun matchup for you and I, uh, a guy you've played against out of Pain Gaming previously in the Portuguese player Vitor. And uh, the the so far one-hit wonder looking to see if he can make another gold record. That's going to be Ta coming out trying to see if he can uh, can take another big shot and maybe shock people again with a big-time performance. So I'm going to go to you, to you first here, Josh. Ta and Vitor, does Ta find that matchup magic again, or does Vitor find the form that we saw him in for Portugal and an Orange Crown League? Yeah, not going to make any crazy predictions for this one. Uh, I definitely have to side with Vitor on this one. I'd love to see Ta, you know, pull out something special, but I think Vitor is just too consistent, too solid, too strong. And, I mean, unless something goes crazy, I, I see it being a clean 2-0, actually. Yeah, I, I think I'm on the same page with you here. This this is a matchup that Vitor should win, but the X Factor is whoever is going into the future and picking decks for Ta, because when we saw him win that monthly championship, might have been the greatest run of matchups that we've ever seen uh, at, a, at a monthly final. Really excellent analysis. If you can find that same form here, that could be a big factor, of course. We're going to go and check that one out in just a couple of moments. Vitor is a guy that you personally are very familiar with, uh, of course, having seen him around the Clash Royale scene for a long time long time part of that insular portuguese scene that doesn't that didn't really branch out as much until the last couple of years but of course you had some time against him in crl and uh yeah both our predictions down there for vitor uh your thoughts on vitor's strengths and weaknesses coming into this one uh strengths uh just overall composure uh you know he's a solid player he's very young um so you know that is something that especially with all this money on the line that can be a problem um but you know when you look at the matchup that is something that's going to help him you know a lot in this overall event just the fact that he is probably going to believe that he's the stronger player he knows that he can take a deep breath hey look even if you know he gets one matchup i'll be able to get the second i'll be able to get the third like that's okay as long as his composure is good he should be good uh, because overall, he's a strong player. He, he really doesn't have a lot of weaknesses, and I, I feel really good about him. Vitor certainly does have plenty of experience, both in and outside of Clash Royale League. Ta, on the other hand, is a guy who we've really pretty much seen here, right? If you look at Ta's list of accomplishments, it's the appearances he's made in Clash Royale League and some work in the Star Championship uh, in the Japanese Open. But other than that, Ta, not a guy with a ton of competitive experience. Yeah, I mean, look, if you want to have just a little bit of competitive experience under your belt, uh, making a run and finishing number one in a month final, you know, if you have to choose one, that would be a good one to choose. And you can see that we do have a CMG player in here, and no big surprises there. Other side of it, Rising Sun Esports, an organization out of Japan, supporting Japanese players both at home and abroad, and they've done a lot for the Japanese esports scene over the last couple of years as well. And at the moment, it is Vitor with the lead, although a nice chunk taken out by Ta on that left-hand tower. Yeah, surprising move from Ta. He goes in with a miner in the back instead of on top of the Iwas, and it's gonna force out the guards in this situation. And oh my goodness, that one error of him going with a miner in the back is gonna allow his own tower to get down to 574. The difference between going for the Ewiz and the tower is the difference of 700 HP. That's absolutely insane. So now Todd does have to reset. And just so you guys know, uh, the gameplay is opposite the screen, so it is Ta on the bottom and Vitor on the top. From a gameplay perspective, as uh, you see Vitor once again send that miner in, not picked up, and playing defense here at the bridge against this Lava Bush. Yeah, I like the defensive poison. I'm not sure how I feel about the defensive view wizard. I guess his thought process is, look, I have this game pretty much locked up. I just need to make a few more plays. It's okay if I don't make great elixir trades because I just need to hold out for a little bit longer. And right there, we see it as we see everything get flopped. His defense is so strong. Mega Minion plus Tesla plus um, 
the Royal Delivery. I, I don't know if he was expecting to go against Lava. I think he was probably just expecting a tank deck. And then him going against Lava, easy matchup for him. And yes, just so you know, now the gameplay has flipped. So Vitor at the bottom of your screen and Ta at the top. And at this point, Vitor content to throw some poisons down there. Ta waving the white flag. And that is an easy game number one for the Portuguese player. Yeah, I mean, he defended correctly, but there's not a lot of difficulty in that. Uh, going in with the Dark Prince, how he was supposed to, trying to create a little bit of pressure, but then also have enough Elixir to defend. Uh, pretty simple, but, you know, just strong gameplay in game number one. You know, we haven't seen a ton of Lava today. We've seen some, we saw some earlier, but we haven't seen as much Lava as maybe you would expect. It's been so popular as a go-to lately. Any thoughts on why we're not seeing so much of it, or is it just natural day-to-day -day meta shifts? Uh, yeah, a lot of these players... I mean, you know, the reason why they're up here is because they believe in their skills. And so a lot of these players, I, I don't, I think it's three reasons. One, they kind of think they're too good for Lava. Uh, two, they want to use like decks that they're familiar with. And three, you know, they want it to be as skillful as possible, you know, high cycle, all that stuff. And so I think it's kind of a collection of everything. Um, but I think kind of the main thing is that a lot of these players think they're too good for Lava and they want to use like these more skillful archetypes. And it appears that they should be doing that because Lava has just not had a lot of success today. So game number one going towards Vitor with a nice little bit of control here. And Lava Hound, I mean, look, having Royal Delivery and Poison against a Lava Hound deck plus Tesla, certainly nice stuff for <laughs> Vitor in game number one. Very control focused on this one. Is that what you expected from Vitor to go with such a control based deck? I mean, definitely not that exact one, but I definitely love the deck choice. I mean, he's got to assume that his opponent is not feeling all too confident, so he's going to go in with E-Giant or Lava or Golem, one of those kind of decks. That deck that he used right there, going to match up well against them all, but match up very well against Lava, as we saw. So poison out on both sides, and we didn't see, uh, we talked to the Tesla on Vitor's side, but on Ta's side, uh, just the Goblin Cage. So we'll see if they do go into a building direction. We've seen a lot of no building play uh, today, and we saw one in particular of that really rough Royal Hogs game earlier on. It seems like one of those questions, and this might be a question more for some of the, the mid-game players, deciding to go without a building does seem like a defensive risk for a lot of players. What are some of the reasons why they might go without one in some of these matchups? Uh, I think, well, okay, so some of the reasons why, uh, first one, you know, you can always have Fisherman or Tornado. If you have one of those two, you don't really need to add a building to it. Um, another reason is if you find your deck is very well composed and you have quick cycle but you also have hunter so you have that strong dps for one of those tanks you technically can get away with not having one and so a lot of these players especially in the dual format hey i can get away with not needing a building well i can just save that for the next game and that's one more thing they have to worry about so i think i think it has a lot to do with either Fisherman, NATO, or if they have a very high DPS card, that can target Eric. And so a bit of a staring contest here. Haven't had many of these, and I saw a question earlier in chat today about why players might not play and wait this first two minutes, and one reason might be that they have a deck that succeeds heavily in double and triple elixir and is not as good in single. Another one might be the starting hand of one of these two players. They might not like what they see in starting hand and might not want to be the first person to make a move. So a couple big reasons why we might see a staring contest here. And uh, Josh, it used to be all about beatdown, but starting hand has become more and more of a reason why you know, we might see these delays. Yeah, and so starting hand, if we see anybody place a troop within the next like five seconds, then you know it's because of starting hand. And there you go, right there, it's... You, you want to set yourself up for double elixir when you're running these heavier decks. And so that's why we saw him cycle at that specific time, because he's trying to set himself up. Once double elixir happens, now I can reset and actually be in a good position to play. Ebarb's in on the cannon cart and NATO to clean up some of that graveyard, but that's going to leave a fair number of skeletons to go right on tower here. As Vitor plays a fairly easy defense, does take one Ebarb shot but 22-16 does the Mega Minion swipe, and it doesn't 
And here we go. Ta taking that chance to golem up. Yeah, I'm really excited to see the last two cards for Ta. I would assume we have Lightning as one of the cards and then probably Baby Dragon as the other. But the crazy thing about Golem, and that's the reason why I love it so much, you can go Baby Dragon and Electro Dragon. You can go Electro Dragon Skeleton Dragons. You can do Pump Skeleton Dragons. Like, there are so many different options. I really like that he's using a deck. Not necessarily, you know, as a... I want Todd to, like, to win. It's, like, as a viewer right now, it's fun that he's using this version of this goal. This Electro Dragon just wreaking havoc on Vitor's defense. Cannon Cart trying to get involved and not doing as much. The first one did break down and stave off some of the damage, but, man, this huge swing towards a Japanese pro. Yeah, and I really like what Todd's doing. Uh, we saw it in the first push, and we're probably going to see it again, but we might not. Oh, and he is going to be using Fireball. All right, that's going to be valuable for him to try and get, or try and NATO everything together and try and get value through that. Um, but he went with the E-Barb's opposite lane. That way, his opponent would have to force out Elixir on the left, kind of put him in these awkward spots. It, it's very important that you don't stack too much, you give too much Fireball value, all that sort of thing. So I like how he did that. This defense so far, really strong from top. Graveyard in, getting a lot of damage though, and that does narrow the gap a bit. 12-13 to 8-42. Ta with plenty of elixir though, and Golem's up high and aggressive in front of that Electro Dragon. Yeah, very high, very aggressive right here. Does he get the correct timing right there? He does, and it's gonna lock back onto the Skeleton Dragon. That's the problem with Golem at the bridge. Yes, you have, you know, four elixir on the floor, and you have, you know, a 10 to four elixir advantage, but it doesn't really matter. Golem is so susceptible to like an easy defense where you clean everything up with just one spell. And so that was a huge hit there. He's giving up a lot of damage. But look at the left side. What a gamble here from Vitor. Oh. And he throws the chips on the table, goes all in, and gets a huge win. Decides to eat the E-barbs and says, I will beat you to the finish line. Portugal, on through to the next round. I did not think... I, I I did not think he was going to let that left lane go, and then I did not know that the right lane was actually going to take. That is so wild that both of those happened at the exact same time. I mean, Vitor, I think, found himself in a position where he did not know how he was going to get this one back. And he decided, <laughs> hey, this is as good a gamble as any, and this is early on. This was a, a pretty big moment of damage here. Uh, and a couple times we saw Ta go with the, the NATO defense, and it gave up 400, 500 HP. That's not insignificant. Yeah, I mean, it stacks so quickly. You do 500 three times, and then your opponent can just go all out on the final one. It's, and, you know, we, we see it. Bar Barrel, Fireball, Nado. He doesn't have a great response when his opponent goes Valk Bridge, Graveyard, then Snowball. The Snowball stacked with the Valk in Graveyard just confirm that it's going to get at least 500 damage every single time they have that actual push going. And what a crazy full send this is here. The NATO doesn't kill the baby dragon. The E-barbs go in. Archers come out late. But it's just a complete, absolute gamble. Vitor knows I have a game to win. I have a game to give, and I'm already in a position where I'm probably not going to win this game unless I go big. Vitor goes big, and he's on to the next round. <laughs> what a wild finish. I don't know how I keep getting games where they have the most insane endings ever, but just love what happened. And it really comes down to play the NATO too early. If he tries to do that NATO on defense against the Graveyards one last time and gets the timing right, we could have seen a different result. That was absolutely insane. Let's take a look at the matchups from this one. Game number one, it was Lava Miner Guards. This is one of the more popular variants. Of course, people play a lot of Skeleton Dragons in this deck right now as well, up against Vitor's Miner Control deck. And this was just a deck where you went, hey, how many counters to Lava can we put in one deck? Yeah, I mean, you, you only need a Mega Minion plus Delivery plus Tesla. And then he also added e -Wiz and Fire Spirit. And it's crazy to say this, but I consider Dark Prince a counter to the lava you you always force out you know a certain amount of elixir you force out a certain card you force out this you force out that with the dark prince and so if you can force out responses and allow your troops to 
you know, get the DPS that they're meant to do. I consider that a counter. I think he counters with seven of the eight cards in his deck. Uh, yeah, it's pretty. Yeah, only the minor isn't actually a counter here, and of course, minor <laughs> requires a lot of responses as well. And then Ta goes from lava to golem, so it goes from beat down to beat down, and plays golem here. And it looked like Ta was in a great position early on. It looked like he was in a great position throughout pretty much the entire match, but a couple of times, a, a little bit of extra graveyard damage, and that put Vitor in a chance to take the game back. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's the same push every single time. Valk, Graveyard, Snowball. It, it is so difficult to defend. I liked what Tal was doing. He was putting the E-Barbs on the left lane. He wasn't stacking too much. He was trying his own NATO fireball plays. Um, but, I mean, it's just... Graveyard is so good because it can really defend against any kind of push. And right there we saw it. It was just able to defend one last time. And... Uh, yeah, he was able to get the victory for game number two as well. And that puts Vitor through on to our next round, so we will see him back tomorrow where he will await the winner of our next matchup of Coca RX and Osama. So we'll be getting to that one in just a moment, but congratulations, Vitor, on not just upping your prize money from 1,000 to 3,000, but taking yourself one step closer to a World Finals berth. And of course, all of those decisions will be made tomorrow. Same place right here. We have three more matches left, but make sure you're back here tomorrow, of course, to see the culmination and what eight players will make it into our next stage. So, Josh, one part of this group down. Now on to our next part. And this is an interesting matchup between two players that, again, you're very familiar with. One, the young player out of Brazil, Coca RX, and Osama, who's been around the game for a long time, who actually is, according to Royale API, ranked and I think the top 30 or 40 all-time players on ladder in terms of their finishes. Uh, that's going to be a great one, but one moment while we're waiting there, we do have one more match of the day. Uh, to close things out, we will have the Frenchman Hugo against Ale out of Argentina. Go ahead and vote in the chat right now. Hashtag Hugo or hashtag A-L-E-E -E to decide who you think will win that matchup, and we'll have those results for you later. But back to what we're talking about right now. It's Coca RX versus Osama. Thoughts on this matchup? Uh, let's see, Coca, I mean, he, he's been really good at Mortar, he's been really good at, at a wide variety of decks, I think, and and then we go over to Osama, and I think Osama might be my favorite player in this overall bracket, um, not because of like personal connections or anything like that, just because he's the one guy who is willing to use three Musketeers when no one else was able to do so. And I just have the utmost respect for him. I can't wait to see what he uses in this. And hopefully it's not, he's gonna use Royal Hogs in one other deck. Hopefully he do, like actually surprises some players right now. And drill Fire Spirit for Coco to the right hand side. Does get some opening damage and Osama going Lava Hound. Immediate push with the Valkyrie to the left hand side. Controlled, picked up by the Miner. Yeah, that push is so strong. We saw it when it was uh, Bet Boss. When he was going against the RG deck, that, you know, that three or four Elixir Troop, you know, the Knight or the Valk plus Skellies, it is so scary because if you leave that alone, that's taking tower quickly and easily. That Inferno Dragon not getting touched at all by the defense as Fireball comes in and Tesla does finally switch over. Well defended here by Koka, had a lot in his face, able to stand up to it and comes out with the lead 1526 to 2189. Yeah, and this is where it gets kind of weird for the Lava players. Do you want to, you know, tank the damage from the bomb, or do you want to take the damage from the Fire Spirit now? He's going to choose not to. I, I, I know if you ask 20 different Lava players, all 20 of them would have given it a different response on why you should do this and why you shouldn't. Right here, sets up with the Lava. 1505 already his tower is at, but looks like he's just trying to get this counter push going and trying to take a tower. Oh, I've talked with Osama a bit about Lava Hound, and uh, he talks a lot about making the choices of when you take damage on tower and when you don't, how critical that is for Lava. And you see there, wanted to mitigate the damage so he didn't lose a tower, but not overcommit and try to stop all of it with that Valk on the left-hand side. And then right here, this push just gets stopped so easily. He goes in with the Lava plus the Miner, defends with the Tesla... Fire Spirit and Skellies. I mean, it's a 10 for 6, so it's not that terrible of a trade, but it's just so hard to gather the correct troops in order for these pushes, especially now that Koka RX is trying to also get damage on the left side, not allowing him to stack correctly. I don't know how he's going to choose to do this. 
goes in with the Inferno Dragon prediction on top of the should have been Knight or should have been Val. And that's a huge mistake. 27 seconds left. He's got to do something quick. 613 on the left hand side. Flying Machine now down in the middle. And that pulls out the, fi the Fireball, which sends the Skeleton Dragons untouched behind that Lava Hound. Second Tesla down, though, to control here. And this just gets around so quickly on the side of Coco. Yeah, I mean, it's impossible. I mean, 613, that's just, you know, two drills, two fireballs, two logs, and he can do that in about two seconds. So it's so difficult for him at this point. Nice timing on the fireball. Should almost get one shot. I thought, oh, oh man, he does oh, get oh. the shot. This is, this is going to be game. Minor Skeleton Dragon's in. That's all a fireball value there on the right-hand side. It says to go fireball on the tower to finish it off instead, because that makes a whole lot more sense. <laughs> GG, well played. And Koka, I think he has an issue with his phone, maybe. There's something wrong. He was uh, yelling at his phone. Uh, maybe he's angry at... I'm guessing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go with there's no bad blood between him and Osama. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, hopefully not. Hopefully not. Um, yeah, I mean, able to get the victory. He played it well. Um, you know, great pressure throughout the game. Really good usage of the Valk Skelly's pushes, really good usage of, you know, the Fireball. Even though he's doing Drill plus Fireball on top of Guards, he's still getting a lot of value because he's pushing them off and it's allowing the Goblins to get more value. Um, yeah, I mean, just exactly how you're supposed to play it. Osama, I mean, this is the reason why so many people don't really like Lava. He kind of went into the game, played a fairly perfect game, and it didn't really matter because his opponent played it well and didn't give him an opportunity. And Koka, known for cycle play, known for as a long time as a mortar player. You see him going with a different cycle variation here and having a great bit of success with it. Cycle versus beatdown, cycle coming out on top here in game number one. And there's Koka getting fired up with that big <sighs> game win, game one win. And we're moving on to game number two with him having the advantage. Yeah, you're certainly allowed to do that when uh, when you play a game as clean as that. So I don't know what he's going to want to do because he's known for drill. He's known for mortar. I don't think he wants to go to mortar right after going with drill. Um, so he could, you know, try and mix it up going with Royal Hogs. And then on the other side, Osama, he needs to get a victory. He needs to go in with something he's confident with. But... A lot of the decks he's confident with, everybody knows he plays those decks. So it's this it's this tough choice of trying to find something he's good with that won't be easily snipeable. Yeah, I mean, do you do you play? Look, that's a big question. Osama has to make a choice right now, right? Of all the people who shouldn't go comfort, Three Musketeers feels like one that maybe you shouldn't do here. Yeah, I mean, and and the uh, the worst part is that not only is Three Musketeers a comfort deck. But Royal Hogs is a comfort deck. These are the two easiest decks where if you're planning for it, look, okay, you're running that, let me use Mega Knight. Like, it, it, you can list off counters with just one card, and that can just win that matchup. That's the craziest thing about those two decks. Well, we'll see what he has planned for game number two. Now, on the side of Coca, right, we, we just saw him run one version of Cycle and Drill. We're seeing it being coming back a little bit after its nerf kind of disappearing for a while. And uh, I'm curious to see if he goes Cycle again here. And Miner, does he, also, does he also go with Mortar? Yeah, could be Mortar, could be Wall Breakers. That's the great thing about... Uh, these cycle variations is that you can mess around with a lot of these things and then always come to a different deck. And a big shout out to the, the juicy one is the one who I got that tip on Lava Hound from as I was remembering in the middle of that one. I think I said Osama. <laughs> and that would make more sense. Juicy definitely known as a, uh, as a Lava player himself. Osama, more of a 3M guy. Koka going to be running a weird candy cart variation. I wonder what made him believe that candy cart is like what needs to be in this deck. Maybe he was expecting, you know, it could be possible that he was expecting a matchup like this. Maybe expecting mortar. I uh, I don't know why he did it, and I really want to ask him, but I really like, you know, the innovation behind it. I wonder if this was a hedge, right? Because you see the bomb tower in here for the potential hogs matchup. You see it also from Osama as well. And then the cannon cart gives you that, not only gives you that second building if you need it when it breaks down, but that nice single target damage. Yeah, and for a hedge, this is a pretty well-balanced deck so far, you know, doing okay. Gave up a lot of early damage, but those shots from the wall breakers are going to really bring him back into it. 
So first minute 40 seconds gone, and at the moment, it is Osama with the lead, and this Valk will tank a little bit. Bats come out to take care of the graveyard. Snowball ready for that one. And this is going to be a nice little extra chunk of damage. Not devastating, but still going to give a nice piece there to Osama as we go into double elixir time. Yeah, 500 HP separating the two. The problem is with this deck, the reason why this kind of deck isn't a real meta deck Every time he's going against this Mega Minion, the Mega Minion is getting so much value. Swiping on the Knight, then it's swiping down on the Cannon Cart, and you can't play the Bats on top of it because then you have the Mother Wolves. This is a very difficult scenario for him because every single time he can have an answer, it's going to allow Osama to have an easy response to that answer. And good job there, Koka, varying up his defense, going with troops to soak up the damage rather than playing the Bats and uh, does avoid the snowball to stop the bats, put a whole lot more damage on there. 778 to 1079. Koka does have to contend with this cannon cart on the left, choosing to mostly tank it and set up for his next push. Yeah, I like that. Right here, he needs to go in aggressive, go in with that, and I like that push. You cannot afford to go in with the bats on top. You know your opponent is going to snowball. What do you do in this scenario? You wow. go in aggressive, and that might be game just like that. It has to get back to EQ, and that's going to be a game over. Did just use it on Graveyard. Puts the Miner down. Miner doesn't get picked up. And Koka is pumped up. He <laughs> is ready to go for tomorrow. Oh, my goodness. Huge mistake from Osama, and brilliant job from Koka. You know your opponent is going to go in with a snowball. So what do you do? You defend in a different way. You go aggressive. You go in with the Miner bats. You go in with the Wall Breakers as well. He doesn't have enough elixir. He doesn't have the snowball. He doesn't have enough elixir for the building. It's just exactly what you need to do. All you got to do in these scenarios, you got to give yourself a chance. That's exactly what he did, and that's exactly why he won. Koko just played a... Uh, this was a tough situation, right? Like, you look at the, the bats for the graveyard and go, oh, well, that's an easy 2-2. And we saw it a couple of times where he played the bats on defense and got them wiped off. But like we were talking about, the adjustment on defense to play troops to soak up damage, he was way behind, did an excellent job of battling back. Yeah, I mean, just making the right plays every single time. And I mean, Osama just giving up way too much damage uh, from the wall. I mean, it was consistent damage that he was giving up from that, and that just can't happen. And then at the end, I, I think it was just too aggressive to go in with a prediction snowball. I. You, you understand your opponent is trying to work around your offense that you've been doing every single time. And so oh, it just makes sense that he would try a new variation, a new way of doing things. It's not like obvious or anything, but you, you don't really harm yourself by delaying it an extra two seconds. And that two seconds would have helped him understand that that's not the play that he can make. The wall breakers were huge, the miner was huge, and you saw in that last sequence, the defensive earthquake against the graveyard. It takes out those skeletons, does a great job, and it's one of those ones where you as a player, you, f you almost feel bad not getting tower damage with an earthquake, but a nice call there from Koka to allow troops to go and get in the mix on the left-hand side and defend very cheaply, but not one that can be killed with the snowball with the earthquake against that graveyard. So a clean 2-0 there. And now Koka RX moving on through. And it was just two. It was one great matchup in game number one and then great gameplay in game number two. Game number one, look, it's a great matchup, but you also have to play it fairly well. He goes in with Valve Skellies. He goes in with the Bomber Drill. He goes in with the Drill Fire Spirit Fireball. There was a lot of different things that he did right there. And... You know, some of them are pretty obvious. Some of them are pretty difficult to pull off consistently with the right exact timing. And he was getting the correct timing every single time. Osama, he, he tried. He he did a lot of different things. He had different pushes. He tried flying machine behind the lava. He tried skeleton dragons behind the lava. He tried baiting out fireballs. It just wasn't enough. His defense was too solid in game number one. Then on game number two, you have this graveyard deck, and man, that I am consistently impressed by the, the defense here. So many players will get caught in a bad rhythm playing this defense, going having trouble getting past the snowball, getting past the bomb tower, but really good variation on the side of Coca on both sides of the board to get this win. Yeah, and I, I feel like we didn't see him use the delivery all that often, and that's kind of surprising. It would have gotten a decent amount of value on top of the Mother Witch, but I guess his play was 
it's not going to get enough value where the Valk is going to take it out, Mega Minion's going to take it out. Koka, I mean, all his decisions were very well thought out, especially for it only being a three minute match. And you'll see moving on to face Vitor, it's going to be Brazil versus Portugal, common language, but definitely going to be adversaries tomorrow when we decide which one will go on to world finals and now we're moving down to our final two matches of the day Framcito versus boss and hugo versus ale to close things out on day one of our last chance qualifier josh it's been a whole lot of fun today any last thoughts before we send you to the sidelines to uh, be a spectator as we close out our saturday uh, not really. I've just, I've loved all the games. I've been grateful that all these exciting games are for me. Um, just gotta say, it's a bummer because I was really rooting for Bag. Unfortunately, he wasn't able to make it. And then I was really rooting for Lopkins and he didn't make it as well. So it's a bummer that some of my favorite players didn't do that. But hey, you know, that that's part of the reason why it's so fun to watch. You don't know who's going to make it. It's the last chance qualifier. Everything's on the line. And, you know, it, it doesn't work out for some. It works out for, you know, it works out for others. Well, glad to have you here, even if you uh, didn't get all the ones that you wanted. Great time casting with you. We're going to say goodbye to Josh and wrap up our day with our final two matches as I am joined by my longtime co-caster and good friend, Andrew Guy, to close things out today. Uh, Andrew, Josh was just talking about players that you want to see, really excited to see. And coming up next, we have a true fan favorite uh, in our home country, the U.S. of A. It's going to be Boss facing off against Fram Sito. This should be a fascinating one. Yeah, longtime content creator, longtime guy in the space is Boss there on the right-hand side of your screen representing the U.S. Fram Sito on the other side of it from Argentina. Maybe just a little bit of a favorite when you look at what they've done this season. Fram Sito's been in our top 32 numerous times. Boss has only made it through once. And it does seem like Boss in 2021 has struggled to kind of put in the success that he's found in his career uh, throughout his career, I should say, in the individual format in 2021. And you see the cage to control here early from Framcito, who's playing, uh, I'm going to guess that's his uh, local football club that he has on the green screen in the background, showing some local flavor in this matchup. Yeah, both these guys, 8.8K players, although Boss has a beat by just a bit, 88.63 to an 88.04. And Boss has been running a lot of Royal Giant on ladder, but it's been the Royal Giant Archer Queen version, which is not available today. The other thing he's been doing, he's running a lot of Lava Clone, which is probably not going to be as appealing right now in this format. But you see here, going with Lava Guards, that's everywhere. And mine are going to go right to that Musketeer, and oh, oh no wow. for Fram, the Inferno Dragon gets a full connection. Bye-bye, Tower. Bye-bye, game number one. Yeah, interesting drop there of the delivery coming down early before the Lava Pups spawn, so maybe just trying to get a tank out for that Inferno Dragon, but none of those interactions went the way of Framcito as he's already down here in game number one. And yeah, probably just going to be it for game number one, realistically, because this deck from Boss does actually defend pretty well, especially when you consider that cage plus fireball for those Royal Hogs. You know, we're obviously going to see this in the replay. I'm wondering if Framcito just kind of got caught between a rock and a hard place there, right? Like, didn't know what to do about the Inferno, saw that the Miner was coming to the Musketeer, and maybe just kind of got uh, indecisive with how he wanted to play that delivery to either defend the Musketeer or try to deal with the Inferno Dragon and that moment's hesitation changing the game. Yeah, and we've all been there before, and unfortunately for Framcito, that moment's hesitation, he actually does neither of the things that he really wanted to do in protecting the Musketeer or stopping that Inferno Dragon. This time around, it's going to be the same thing, except for that delivery actually comes in when Framcito wants. But again, with only 42 seconds remaining, this is going to be a very, very tough out for the man from Argentina. And Musketeer does control the action on the right hand side boss has to make some decisions here musky's taken care of has to shut down that cannon car on the left will do so with the guards up high and barring a major mistake by boss this should be a game one sewn up should have fireball ready and no goes cage instead for those picks and that one spear goblin getting a lot of value getting tanked for by that cannon cart then getting tanked for by the piggies brings it down to 866 and you know, Boss just taking as much damage as he can to ensure that all bases are covered. And he's got him covered well here in game number one. So a comfort pick from Boss in game one. A big deep breath taken 
Happy he didn't get sniped in this one, and that's one step closer to World Finals for Boss here with that Lava win in Game 1. So Piggy's out for Framcito. Uh, Lava Miner guards done for Boss. And, uh, man, this is a, a big decision coming up next for both these players. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those situations, right? When you're playing against very quick cycle decks, you make a mistake defensively. You might take a few hundred damage, but you can usually recuperate. Against a deck like this, with this big of a mistake, it's all downhill from there. You see the delivery comes in right now to stop that Inferno from getting on tower. But it's too late. It's too, too late to stop the Inferno, too early to help with the pups, and too far to the right to stop that Miner. So it just ends up kind of doing nothing for Fram other than costing him elixir and costing him a tower this right here is a much more like what he wanted that first defense to look like and as you can see this game maybe looks closer you know back in the record books than it truly was as boss does a great job there taking a lot of damage in both lanes to make sure he always had enough elixir just in case his opponent decided to sell out now framcito with an uphill back down one we're going to find a lot out about boss i think in this next game from his mentality. This is a guy who's been so close so many times. Top five finish, his best finish on ladder, which is unbelievable, but he's been in that range where he's felt like he has a shot at number one, and then tilt has been a challenge for him on occasion with those ladder pushes. He's done well in some competitions, but again, still looking for that big moment. This is a big one for Boss here. A win would, of course, please the fans watching at home. He has a huge fan base who are blowing up chat right now, uh, but also it'd be a big one for him to be able to get that sort of get that big moment and grasp it when it's there in front of you. And I want to see just a little bit more adversity offered from Framcito, even if he doesn't end up winning this set. He should be testing Boss just a little bit more, right? Because we have no idea if Boss does win this set, how he's going to fare tomorrow. And you want to make sure you're warmed up, you're ready to go. The LCQ, it's all win or go home, right? There's not a lot of forgiving moments. So while Boss, I'm sure, is very happy of how game one went, it is really important that he is competing at the level that all these other players have. Now, again, this isn't about the way that Boss played. It was just about what his opponent did, kind of giving him that game early on. So here we go. Game number two. Fram opens up with the snowball cycle onto that right-hand tower and gets his Valkyrie down, feeling graveyard-like out of Framcito. The not often seen, except until today, Hunter making another appearance. And Fram already looking like he's going to Graveyard. And of course, the Mother Witch might have created one of the most seismic shifts in how you view basics of the meta for two, three years. Graveyard was inextricably tied to Poison. Those two cards came together like salt and pepper. And then the introduction of the Mother Witch changed it and Fireball became a major part of GY decks. Yeah, it's just one of those things where Poison is just not fast enough to deal with that Mother Witch when she's cleaning up that graveyard. And here we go, MK plus Balloon Push, hyper aggressive here from Boss. Archer's distracted, Inferno Dragon comes down late, and that's going to be a drop. That's a big hit here. You see both players kind of touching their mouth, maybe a little bit of a nervous gesture on both sides. A lot of pressure on this moment. Skeletons to control that Inferno Dragon, but... Princess Tower not on the Inferno, and the Valkyrie getting plenty of swings. Yeah, nice slow there with the Inferno as well. They're going to get into that sizzle stage. 9.35 remains, and I got to admit, Framcito, I mean, I haven't watched him a lot on camera, but it looks like he's a little bit more in his head than he needs to be. I'm sure he's really upset with how that interaction went in game number one, but he's doing a great job here in game two. He needs to stay with it. Mental fortitude is something we've talked about season after season in CRL, and right now is that testing moment for Framcito. I mean, these arrows are certainly something that he's happy about when it comes to the archers, which are one of the main counters. But, you know, you still have Inferno Dragon to deal with. You still have Snowball and you still have Fireball plus the cage. There's a whole lot. And wow, arrows lightning from Boss. I don't know if he's been talking to uh, his co-American, his co-American, his countryman <laughs> bag uh, in deck construction here, but arrows lightning, certainly a little bit different. Yeah, and that, what a great pull for him, right? You see right there, arrows going on top of everything on the board for Framcito, and then the ability to lightning these units away when necessary, whether it's defending or when you're trying to create that offense. So Boss getting a great draw here on spell power in game number two. And great placement and timing from Framcito as that Mother Witch walks up into the fireball and out of King Tower activation range, which would, of course, be a big blow to the Argentinian if that happened in this graveyard matchup. Here we go. Fisherman in, 
balloon down. Arrows to the archers. Not enough elixir for the lightning, but the balloon gets away from this Inferno Dragon. I don't think he doubles down here, no. He does! And he doubles down to stop the push coming across the bridge. I actually like that, Rich, because he didn't use it too early to try to create offense. It was more about stopping this pressure coming in from Framcito. As you can see, Boss really struggling with dealing with the graveyard, so getting those tanks out of play beforehand is actually a really, really nice heads-up lightning, but still a lot being spent in that specific moment. Yeah, Boss didn't need those arrows on that last defense. I understand why he spent them. I think most of us would have out of uh, wanting to pre preserve that tower. But those arrows were three elixir. He would have loved to have back. Tough situation either way. And we're going to game number three here between Framcito and Boss. What a back and forth battle so far. A blowout in game one in favor of Boss. Some back and forth action in game number two. And now we're going to the third and final. Yeah, we saw this great push come early on from Boss, knowing that that Inferno Dragon was out of cycle, or at least maybe coming back into cycle, but kind of thirsting on Elixir. But Framcito does get it down in time, and then he actually creates a great bit of offense with that same Electro Dragon, or uh, Inferno Dragon, excuse me. He comes in with a great snowball, slows that Princess Tower down, gets the damage in, and then just kind of stays in the driver's seat for the rest of this game, doing a good job controlling. I really liked the high Inferno and the high Gob Cage to opposite sides of the, of the pathway there and made it so that lightning was really hard to come down uh, when you talk about boss creating offense and then we did see him use it defensively to take those two units I just spoke about out of play as tanks but then he had a lot to deal with here on the back end graveyard wise and you just saw those arrows come in there to prevent that last little chunk of damage you know it's hard to know if they were necessary or if they were a bit of an overspend but that's three elixir that he wouldn't get back and now we go to game number three and this is interesting let's take a look at the the decks that they use so far on the side of Framcito. we had the uh the royal hogs deck in game number one then graveyard in game number two and then of course we went between lava and the then loon deck here so far it's been all to the skies out of boss in these first two matchups game number three no lightning no fireball so we gotta think about what matches well with uh poison most likely or is he maybe going in an eq direction you know one thing that would be kind of cool to see out of boss is i know he liked playing giant for a long time giant double prince in this build is actually really really strong he hasn't used those cards that overlap a lot it'd be kind of cool to see something like that a beat down on the ground as it's clear that he does like to play just a little bit heavier and then what i liked what i saw there out of framcito in that game was obviously the gameplay was great he won but it was at the end of the game we finally saw a smile from him right you mm. love this game for a reason you're one of the best in the world for the reason game one didn't go your way as so many games on last and in grand challenges and in competitions go so what do you do you reset i like that he was aggressive with that snowball on the inferno after he took the bomb drop and then it seemed like he finally found his comfort zone you know we talk about grit we talk about boss and those moments that have slipped away other side of it framcito is no stranger to success in his gameplay. Framcito uh, won the No-Tilt League with Re Cream Royale Betis Cantera, won the Royal Crown Cup with Arena Casito a long time ago, WRO wins, and those are just his team victories. He also has done really well open qualifying into a lot of the things like Bren Chong Cup, Queso Cup, and performing very well in those competitions. So a nice lineup there two times for that Magic Archer. Once on the first unit, the second one there on that Mother Witch gets a ton of damage in. And I'll be honest, the moment that Boss dropped that Giant down, so I had half of it, right? It was just an Electro Giant, not a full Giant. You can see Fram kind of looking a bit perturbed by it and maybe not gonna have a lot of great ways to control that Electro Giant. He does have that Fish Boy, but you know Boss is gonna be trying to protect that Fisherman Pull. Yeah, we'll see what Boss's plan is for that, because Framcito certainly is going to be looking for that. We'll see what those options are. This is going to be a nice little Royal Giant push. There's going to be at least one, not two, but does force out the expenditure, and now Boss has to decide if he wants to protect this Magic Archer or let it go across on its own. <laughs> So a fish boy does come out here trying to get that King Tower activation. Does Fram really, really nicely played? Yeah, I'm curious about 
That, I mean, here's the thing is that King Tower activation might be more impactful in this matchup than one might think as Framcito tries to pull that Electro Giant into the middle of the board with the Fisherman. Exactly. Yeah, a great call there, Risk, because that really is going to be what Fram's all about. Now, right here, he's in a good spot in the sense of getting single target DPS and slows and stuns in, but the overspend on the slow stuns means so that this Mega Minion is untouched and on tower, and that is a huge, huge moment for Boss here in this game number three. Yeah, that Mega Minion was absolutely massive, and now you see setting up defense right now is Boss trying to figure out what he wants to cycle as the Royal Ghost and Mega Minion come down on the opposite side. And that's a nice Magic Archer to get to the to get to the Mother Witch. Lightning comes out to take him off the board. Yeah, threading the needle there is Boss, and Framcito wants nothing to do with that as the Royal Ghost connects, and this Mother Witch that did stay alive gets not really much out of it. Lightning not back here for Framcito as we're down to 240 on his tower, 740 on Boss's side as the Royal Ghost comes out with the log, get a bit more chip damage, and maybe that Ghost gonna make a beeline for that tower. Boss being forced to spend quite a lot here to prevent that. And I like what Boss is doing. He's spending all of his Elixir on defense, now gets the Earthquake out, right? But he misses the tower. Oh. Wow, that is a devastating miss here. And Rich, that could be the game. We'll find out. Lightning should come in, but he doesn't have the Elixir for it. A pile up at the bridge, and while Framcito had a bit of an opening, he doesn't use his best option in that Lightning. Boss might have just avoided disaster. He has to defend this next push to get this win. Let's see if he goes high Tesla here. And he's oh, late with he's the, Tesla. the Tesla. He's and late with the it. Tesla. Oh my god, 44 HP remains. Log comes in. Boss just needs to get damage on the tower. 66 HP in. Oh my goodness, Rich. That is some of the craziest gameplay I have ever seen. Oh my goodness word. Framcito is absolutely elated and I just can't even I can't even believe it. Boss boss misses the if he makes that first earthquake, that's game over. He misses the earthquake. That he went for the magic archer lineup. It was off by half a tile. Just how many things can go wrong in the final moments there and boss out Framcito through to the next round. All of the things, Rich, that is the answer. How many things? All of the things could go wrong. The missed EQ cycle was shocking in and of itself. Then you get the aggressive magic archer. I can't believe it's off by that tile that you call. And then the missed Tesla. My goodness, that was some of the hardest CR I've ever had to watch. It was all sewn up. I mean, this really looked like, you, you see it here and you're like, boss has this thing nailed down. The lightning was certainly an X factor here early but he did a good job late of keeping the lightning off the board. Framcito, what I like here is that Framcito didn't quit. Framcito stayed dialed in. You know, he he, he knew, I think that he knew a few things. One, that, hey, if I walk away, I get $1,000. If I play, I might get three, right? That's yep. one basic thing that he knew. Even at this moment, when the Mega Minion's swinging, I think he also knew here that he's in a situation where he knows boss is nervous and there's a real chance an opening will open up. And man, he, he just stepped right through that door. And there was that first cycled earthquake that did get on tower. And now it's about the next two that come down. The NATO pulls everything back. 240 remains, right? That's it. Just a couple cycles away. Well, the first one comes down, misses the tower. And here we have those final moments. Look at that magic archer lineup, not on top. Lightning comes down and I have never seen a game get stolen from someone like that. And you know, boss is going to be feeling that at least he's able to shrug it off. He puts his hands up, which is what you need to do in this moment. But wow, that's got to hurt for him and all the fans. Well, you, you, you think about nerves in this moment, right? You, you get into that big moment. You're being watched by everyone on CRL. And, you know, there's a, a couple little plays there. You know, you, here's the thing is you miss that EQ and that's that jumps your nerves up one level. Yep. Right. And then the Tesla's late. Every single one of those, you know, he got more and more stressed as each one went wrong. Right. So the each mistake, as we, we've talked about this a lot, going back to 2018, when Hazard said mistakes beget mistakes. And we just saw that here. Yeah, the incredible snowball effect that is Clash Royale at its best and at its worst. Framcito drops game number one here with a big missed interaction, not knowing where to drop that delivery. Do I stop the Inferno Dragon? Do I try to get on the pups or do I stop the Miner? How about none of those things? Boss takes the tower and rides that on to game number two. Game number two also.
also didn't start off great for the Argentinian, but then held on, created some great moments with his snowball earlier in the game. And then, of course, those graveyards later on where Boss was having trouble defending and having to overspend, which got us to that breathtaking, shocking game number three. I mean, what a what a crazy way to finish this one up. If we go into those decks for for game number three, it just it's it's one of those things where we've all we've all had it happen where one thing goes wrong, another thing goes wrong, another thing goes wrong, and it's just hard to get yourself back on track here. And Framcito, the the beneficiary of uh, of that sequence, and he comes out with a big game one or match one win, and now Fram is one away from going to a World Finals for Clash Royale League, and here you go. What an interesting deck from Boss. Yeah. Um, Electro Giant, Magic Archer, EQ. Like, there's a lot of a lot of stuff that's great here and worked out well for him, but in the end, did not pull it out. You know, Fram had a lot of great responses, right? He's got the Electro Spirit, he's got the Log, the Lightning to come down, help clean up those units as the RG is working down the board, but just... Whew, some big misplays by his opponent. Let's Fram skate on through to the next round. Our last group to come through, Framcito, is awaiting the winner of Hugo and Ale. And this is going to be a great last set of the day. I'm still trying to catch my breath and recollect my thoughts from what we just saw. My heart goes out to Boss. I've been watching him for years. I love to watch him play, and it hurts to watch anyone lose a game like that. But that was then. This is now Rich. They're asking for our predictions, and I'm going to go with Hugo here. The only reason why is I've become a big fan of him through the other events that I've cast. I love that he plays Mortar. I love that he plays a lot of minor control. That's my pick for this final set of the day. Yeah, I'm going to go with you on Hugo as well here. You know, he's he's one of the better players out of France right now. You have to include, of course, uh, Viper, who's going to be in World Finals as well. But he was one of the better French players we have in Clash Royale overall. And he's a guy who's been, again, just on the edges of that top tier with all of the competitions he's been in. So, uh, yeah, I think I'm going to join you here, and I'm curious to see what our voters have for their picks between Hugo and LA. So we'll have that information here in just a couple of moments. I'm keeping an eye on it. And here we go. And pretty much right down the middle here. In wow. fact, slightly for LA. And, um, you know, it might be that it's late night in France and a lot of, lot more of the Latin American voters are here checking things out. Or it might just be that's how the community sees it. Either way, we only have one way to decide this for real, Andrew. And that's going to happen here in a couple moments. That's right. Our last best of three of the day, which means that there are a lot of more matches to come your way tomorrow. You heard Rich say it before, same time, same place. We will go from 16 down to eight. And yes, we will be giving away a lot of money to all of those players. The minimum that anyone can get tomorrow is 3,000. The maximum is $5,000. And that golden ticket to World Finals, eight players will make their way through. So make sure you're here, subscribe to the channel, and you have those notifications turned on so you do not miss a second of action as we get the last bit of action of the day here. I'll lay top of your screen, Hugo at the bottom. It's not only a great battle of Clash Royale, but a great battle of roof architecture. Beautiful settings <laughs> for both of these players. Yeah, Alay's got quite the setup there in the background, and looks like he's going to come out with a furnace early on here, and Hugo maybe shying away from what he's known most for, goes for some split lane pressure and some fireball bait. I don't know, are you more into exposed brick or exposed beams? I'm torn. I honestly think I have to go with the exposed beams on this one, Rich. Yeah, I know. It's I was just letting people have their own opinions. <laughs> so first 40, 50 seconds away, and Hugo looking very fireball baity. Three fireball bait cards so far. I expect one more in the form of four pigs wearing hats. And Ali setting up with some double spawner to kick off his CRL last chance qualifier. Yeah, and we'll see if this is a guy that will allow that to break on through. It doesn't feel like it will be. Hugo is a pretty calculated dude. He likes to play slow and controlled games, and I think Ale might be in a tough matchup here in game number one, but we'll have to find out and see. Ale is known for playing Balloon. He is the number one player of players by win condition with Balloon here on his profile. He's got 144 GC wins, and otherwise ladder, he's done okay. He's got some top 100 finishes, but nothing... To write home about. Mother Witch sets up behind the furnace. Lots of requests for a fireball right there, but not going to be delivered on the part of Hugo as he sets up a Mother Witch of his own behind his tower to the left. And Goblet Hunt goes opposite lane as the Mother Witches meet here on Hugo's side of the board. He's 
Zappies to the right. Zappies, this is going to be a very slow game here. Both these decks are styled off of really, really methodical, built-from-the-back gameplay. So I expect this one to go right down to the wire, barring any major mistakes. Yeah, I couldn't agree more with you. And honestly, it does really feel like it's Hugo's game to lose at this point. It seems like he has great control with dual lane pressure. He's got the Mother Witch there to spawn piggies if he needs. He's got the MK to meet his opponent's MK. And of course, those fireballs to get on top of the flying machines and on top of those buildings when he can. But Ale going to try to play a little bit of Sim City over on his side of the map, and we'll see where the next building decides to go down. And good fireball on the side of LA to get a decent amount of value and decent response as well. Mega Knight. Wow. Yeah, shot out of the air, but the cannon cart on tower anyway. Yep, cannon cart gets on tower as Hugo was maybe a bit distracted by the MK. And exactly what I thought probably wouldn't happen is happening in spades. You see there Ale nodding, knowing that this is the time he's going to take the tower. Cannon cart came down late, Mother Witch in to defend, and Hugo drops game number one. Wow, that overwhelm happened fast here. And let's keep this in mind that Ale has one chance to move, has a chance to move on to tomorrow. He was not originally meant to be here. He's a replacement right? player as one player had to drop out. He was 57th and got bumped up. And right now, at least for the moment, he's making the best of that opportunity. Yeah, that's a really, really great point that you bring up there, Rich. Talk about getting that gift from the Clash Royale gods to make your appearance here at the LCQ. It had to hurt missing by one spot, but here he is proving his worth, playing a deck that really no one had had much success with here at this level. And a lot of it was maybe this interaction right here. Fireball comes down and it hits a lot of stuff. It doesn't hit the MK. It doesn't hit that cannon cart. And that cannon cart stays on its wheels, which then allows this Mother Witch to come down. And then the bridge spam, second cannon cart comes in behind this push. You can see there, Ale knows, oh wow, I just won that game. Awesome. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he's he's in, he's in rhythm right here feeling. You can see he's feeling. I don't know if he's listening to music or listening to the gameplay there, but he's certainly feeling it in that moment. And, you know, that's one of the things about this deck, right? You saw Hugo maybe a little bit distracted. That deck doesn't just spawn. It spams. It fills yep. the board with so much. When you're trying to play defense and mount on offense against that deck, it's just it's sensory overload. There's 5,000 things on the board at once, and it's so hard to keep track of all of them. You know, I almost wonder if because we have seen Hugo play so much uh, Mortar Minor Control that Ale kind of called his bluff in game number one. Because if Hugo had the spell power in the Fireball and the Minor to either get on tower or to help take those buildings out of play or to set up his Mortar to help with defense, he would have been in a much better position than he was in in this game, as you saw getting overwhelmed there late game by not having enough stuff on the ground. I wonder if that was just a great call by Ale in game number one, thinking that there's no way Hugo busts out comfort this early. It's very possible, and either way, it worked out very well for the young man. He is one win away from adding an extra $2,000 to his money and joining us back here tomorrow for a chance to qualify again. We are now down to our final nine. We will get that... Uh, sorry, we're down to our final uh, 17. We'll get that 16th player locked in here in just a couple of games. And of course, then we'll see them back here again tomorrow to decide who joins our top 24 at Clash Royale League World Finals. And man, it's it's been a Ooh. stressful day. So much back and forth. And one thing I'm enjoying right now is not so much from Higo's side. Ale seems so much more relaxed than so many people we've seen today. It's the pressure, right? When you talk about having nothing to lose, he just barely gets into the qualifier and he just wants to make the most out of it. Hugo may be expecting more out of himself, hoping that he should have a big advantage here in this set. Struggles in game number one and maybe a bit of a surprise there. Not stoked to see that for Ale, seeing the arrows come out when he's playing Firecracker. Uh, we'll see how critical that is for him. Hugo, an 8.8K player out of France. He most recently won Game Stars Season 1. He got 6th place in Bren Chong back in August. Who cast Game Stars? Uh, I don't know. Who cast Bren Chong? Fair enough. <laughs> Firecracker goes to the left-hand side, and the Inferno Dragon comes out to meet it with two minutes left in regulation time. And... Not super worried about the King Tower activation is LA. Not, not looking like he's up against a Fisherman and that RG gonna go ahead and try to power on through on the right hand side. Cage and Musketeer to stop, but we'll still get one shot. Yeah, Hugo looking like he is gonna go Graveyard here and that would be a great pull for him. He's got that 
arrows to deal with the firecracker and of course the earthquake and log can help clean up along with the skeletons but just really not what Ale would like in response if that is what Hugo has which it feels like it has to be as he takes those few musketeer shots they're separated by 10 right now with Ale still in the lead yeah, this will be interesting because he wants to keep that that firecracker on the board. He wants to get it involved, but Kigo's just going to sit on those arrows. Those arrows have no other real target unless maybe the uh, an errant skeleton set of skeletons gets away and he has to deal with them. But yeah, the snowball for that. So I'm very curious to see what Ale's choice of uh, decision making process goes to with that firecracker as time goes on. And you see there the firecracker played a little bit higher this time around. Maybe a little bit harder to pinpoint exactly where those arrows need to go down and still hits what Hugo wants. Yeah, I'm curious if he maybe starts to play it really high and on the outside and try to see if he can either... Yeah, see, so he's now going really high with it, maybe trying to hope that he can force out troop responses rather than arrows. Yeah, and that Tesla coming down already, while I like the idea of protecting your firecracker there, it felt like the Tesla was a bit of an overspend and his opponent hadn't really tried to take that firecracker out of play yet so something that both these players are going to have to look out for Ale maybe being a little bit slower on the draw and Hugo going to have to look out for that protection as Ale sets up another Tesla here for defense and the first graveyard comes down look for maybe Ale to go great earthquake here yep exactly there we go going earthquake here on the defense knows that firecracker isn't going to be fast enough and it'll get killed quickly the he want this would be an interesting game here of how often he goes that direction and these Inferno Dragons are going to be curious here as well, as that one gets way into enemy territory. Yeah, the nice thing about controlling those Infernos for Ale is he has the cards that are cheap to distract it in the Skeletons and that Electro Spirit, and of course, the Firecracker to kite it around. But yeah, that Inferno is going to continue to be a nuisance, as you can see once again. Sizzles that Tesla away, Firecracker has to come down out up high as Ale takes damage down by his Princess Tower from that graveyard. Lane switch from Ale, Hugo up to the task, although that Dark Prince not going to do much on the left-hand side, and the RG not going to do a ton on the right-hand side. RG not going to do a ton on the left-hand side. So right now, it feels like the momentum might be shifting towards Hugo. Snowball comes in. It's a little bit more damage for Hugo. 1292 to 1562, and it feels like Ale is just trying to find out how to break on through with just one minute remaining. Yeah, the he's having a challenge because... You know, you think that maybe you're against the Inferno Dragon with the Royal Giant, but instead you're getting caged and then pile up on troops, and that's fine. That's a fine spend because it's going to force Hugo, uh, Ale to go back the opposite direction. And really, there's just no clear path for a Royal Giant to get on tower at this stage. Yeah, and you talk about the spells that Ale has at his disposal, just not doing anything for that Inferno, the Valkyrie, or that Musketeer. And Hugo oh, is now no. riding this towards glory with only 25 seconds remaining. What better way to close out our day, Rich, than a game three as long as he can defend? RG getting stuck on that left-hand side. EQ trying to break on through for it. Not going to happen here in any meaningful way. RG gets one shot, but not two shots. That's 522 to 1178. No way of coming back here, folks. You're right, Andrew. We are going to game number three, and this is going to be a fascinating showdown for our last spot in tomorrow's final. I'm very curious to see what Ale comes out with here in game three. No snowball, no arrows, no fireball no goblin cage for Hugo, which means you could go to the skies, but you also might want to go to bait, right? Either one of those seem pretty appealing. The Royal Delivery is still in play, which is going to be a lot more effective against Lava, but Royal Delivery a lot harder to time against bait. So we'll see what's going to happen in game number three from Ale. Yeah, this is interesting, right? Ar arrows being gone, you know, you think about, your, I think the two, er two options as you put it down, it's lava or it's bait. Those are the two best options in terms of the spell situation. But then you start thinking about that mind game, right? Is Hugo thinking those are the two best options? And what can he do that tries to bridge the gap between those two? And Hugo has not yet played Mortar or Miner in this set, which... You know, could be even it could be a good idea to go to his comfort, and then if he did do that, then Ale would be even in a better spot if he did go to the skies. So I think that's what I do if I'm the Argentinian. I try to go to the skies. It puts Hugo in a spot comfort-wise and what he has available in his arsenal to match yourself up in a pretty good spot. That's maybe what I would do. I would probably see Hugo coming out with his comfort, and I would think Ale should go to the skies. Well, we'll see if that's the, the the decision here in a few minutes. And as you can see, 
all tied up one and one in this one. The Fast Cycle deck not paying things off here for Ale, and it's Hugo taking the the big win here. And man, that's one of those things, you know, we talk about certain certain situations in Clash Royale, uh, especially in dual mode, right? You talk about Fireball being gone, how often Flying Machine becomes easily abusable after that. Uh, yeah. Well, it's also one of those things where you talk about the arrows, you know, when you when, when arrows are available, when you pull them and you pull them up against Firecracker, Archers, yeah. or Guards, that does so much for you. But now think about this, that Guards now become a significantly more devastating situation here for Ale, Ale to play and we were just talking about lava being an option for it. yeah and, and and honestly i really do think that's the way to go even if it is the most predictable based off what your opponent has at their disposal it just seems like it has a better chance for outplayability and a matchup situation but there's still a lot out there right there's a lot of other decks we haven't talked about that have been popular this weekend you know there's other win conditions that have not been played yet by ale right royal hogs is still an option for him those have been pretty successful today we saw hugo come out with them already and with fireball not being available it is another one of those situations but we have seen bomb tower come out a little bit more mm. looking for those royal hogs so again that's just why i think that ale goes to the skies will hugo though be able to bust out a deck that kind of has his number you know even a mortar minor deck deck with delivery, which is something that is worked in pretty regularly, could be great. We see Spear Goblins early on. Could be leaning that way. Yeah, Spear Goblins, definitely the more popular of the, the two Triple Goblin pairs. Of course, we have seen some classic Goblins today in Hog Rider, and it is Lava Hound for LA. So if we can call it, did Hugo do it too? Wow, and he did. So he does go to Mortar, which is kind of what Ale even would have wanted just a little bit because Mortar can't match up difficultly. And Hunter is there looking for the skies. So looks like they kind of all saw it coming and they didn't blink. Were they listening to our conversation? Is that how they made their <laughs> deck picks? We're just casters, guys. We're not coaches. Mortar gets some good damage in there as this Miter comes down and there's the delivery. Wow, I think this is maybe just my best moment. <laughs> And LA calling the good game here. Didn't get that one spear at the end. And wow, that's an early call here. He's just looking at the matchup, right? The hunter is there. The delivery is there. He has poison. He has another option to get damage on uh, air units with the spear goblins that will then bait out a spell. There's just so many things at Hugo's disposal. And this is one of those things that I feel like Ale should have seen. And Rich, you called it. I would have loved to see a flying machine out of him as well in this matchup. But the problem was is he used it in game number one. Mm. Yep, that's the one of the hard parts about dual mode. You only get one chance with each card. and. If it goes, then that's bye-bye. Let's see if he goes minor here. Poison offensively to make some cleanup. This is actually a really nice poison. Of course, on the back end, that Lava Hound not going to get much once that delivery's back in cycle. Yeah, yeah, really good point there, and that's maybe why Hugo was happy to play the poison there. Just clean up that push, or excuse me, Ale played the poison there. It was a really nice poison, but still going to have a lot of options when you talk about dealing with this DPS, and instead of the delivery, he just goes straight with another mortar down. And delivery now. Interesting, Mortar gets distracted opposite direction. I almost thought that a minor guards push opposite opposite lane might have been nice, but take a look at this. Ale's back in the match here. That Mortar shot going to be a huge factor, though. And does it get one more? No, it dies, but down to 515 to 1158 in favor of the Frenchman. Yeah, Ale just needs to just pedal to the metal in the right-hand lane, just ignore what else happens on the board. Hugo does need to take this tower on the right-hand side with only 25 seconds remaining. There's not enough firepower in his deck to take the left-hand tower, so Ale just needs to make sure that he himself can take the tower in this moment, as defending through these poisons and miners is going to be really difficult. This at, this whole sequence actually went really well for Ale. Caught the miner on the backside with the guards. I was able to, to, to distract the mortar for a minute, but still, like he, he played everything in the last 20 seconds as it's supposed to happen, and you still see him in a situation where he goes, man, I don't think I can win this one. Yeah, I mean, Hugo's deck selection was just perfect in this scenario. He knew exactly what his opponent was going to play. There's the Miner, plus the Poison, going to take the guards out of play. Now something else needs to come down to catch the Cannon Cart. An overspend from Ale, and it looks like the Frenchman will move on to tomorrow. You've got to go Miner Guards Poison maybe here. Anything to beat out that cycle. Miner goes to the back, Poison in. Delivery comes down to take care of the Miner, and yeah, that's a GG well played. Good opportunity for Ale. Hugo, though, says you'll get one bit of luck, but no extra from me. GG, well played. Hugo going on through to our top 16.
16 best of threes in the books on this Saturday. We knew the LCQ was going to be nuts. We knew it was going to be exciting. We saw some incredible stuff from the beginning of the day. Close finishes all the way to the end where crazy misplays decided our uh, second to last set, we'll say there. And then, of course, that great deck selection out of Hugo in game number three. Everything on the line. He will be continuing on to tomorrow. And this is one of those situations where we saw this same the same thing earlier. We saw it where we saw Poison and Royal Delivery up against a Lava Hound deck. And man, that's just going to generally be absolutely brutal for you. And again, it's it's so crazy to think that you and I were sitting here talking about this is probably the right matchup. This is probably the right matchup. And uh, man, it's one of those one of those questions where if like we said it before, we'll say it again. If you and I can find it, then you can bet these players are doing it too. <laughs> yeah, it, it is unfortunate because it, it always feels nice that when we call stuff like that, the problem is, is that we should always be wrong in those scenarios, right? Yeah. If you and I <laughs> call a matchup, that means that they should already be thinking about that and have sh and gone to the next level. Whatever that looks like here from Ale, whether it is in the skies or not, it just seemed too obvious and Hugo had every response he needed. Now, Got to give credit where it's due. Ale did make this a close game. It was decided by less than 300 HP, but Hugo had all the answers he needed. And that's where Dexmanship in duels is so important. There it is. Dexmanship, the word of the duel. And you see Hugo taking the 2-1 win, and he will join the rest of our winners. Of course, we'll go take a look at that in just a few minutes to see who's moving on to tomorrow and who will have one more best of three. Everyone has about 18 to 24 hours to analyze their opponent and come through with the very best possible deck picks they can make in these matchups. So here we go, taking a look at the deck matchups from game number one. And this looked really good for Ali. He went with, or Ali, he went with the double spawner deck, ended up getting a really good matchup. Yeah, you know, it was one of those things where we've kind of talked over and over at this level. This deck does not really work. And then today, of course, once a caster says it, it needs to happen the exact opposite way. And Ale played this perfectly. That overwhelm late game, recognizing what was in cycle and what wasn't from his opponent. That little bit of an errant fireball out of Hugo makes it so that Ale gets that great cannon cart push in two cannon cart connections. And we're on to game number two where Hugo was able to bounce back. And this was a, a nice swing here for Hugo. And Ale found himself in just a really, really tough spot. There was no path for the Royal Giant, right? I think he needed to get more damage here in single than he did. And by the time that they got the double elixir, no matter which direction he went, one side would be a Goblin Cage plus, other side would be Inferno Dragon, meant no way through. And of course, arrows for a Firecracker. Absolute death here. And Higo carried game number two to send us to game number three in our final day, our final game of the day. And uh, yeah, this we, we picked the deck. You can guarantee that Hugo is thinking the exact same thing, looking at the cards that were played, and Ale just got shut down. Yeah, yeah, I mean, that's really all there is to it. You talk about the matchup here, just completely, perfectly drawn up by Hugo and his team, and he eliminates Ale, who had a nice run for a moment, but was not able to make it on through. Our 57th ranked player in the world gets a little bit of uh, love from one of his other competitors, gets to make it on through to the LCQ. He will walk away with $1,000 and bragging rights to making it here, but he will not move on to Sunday. Well, all the players who did win today do guarantee themselves $3,000 and then a shot at 5K and, of course, a trip to World Finals. And, of course, we had a lot of players make it through. And, Andrew, you're going to take a moment here and have an interview with one of them, get some thoughts on what we saw today. So let's go ahead and jump into this, uh, this moment here with Andrew as we see uh, who it is who he's actually interviewing with. Who could it possibly be out there in the world? Well, maybe one of our most incredible matches of the day. Framcito, welcome. Congratulations on a great set played over Boss. Let's just start from top to bottom. How are you feeling coming into this set, knowing Boss being one of the most popular players in the world? Hi, Andrew. Thank you for inviting me. Um... I was very nervous at the start because this was something pretty new for me because I'm not used to play with the gun, just in my bed, um, relaxed. But a new experience for me is something more professional and I really like it. At the start I was very nervous 
but uh, with the pass of the time I could get uh, more focused on the game and that's it. Yeah, it, honestly, we could see you on camera kind of starting to relax as that set went on. So let's talk really quickly about game number one. We could see that Royal Delivery came in. It had no idea where to go. What were you thinking in that moment? The Miner was coming in. The Inferno was there. There was so much for you to deal with, and it felt like you couldn't deal with any of it. Yeah, um, the intention of that delivery was to distract the Inferno Dragon and somehow can defend the Lava Pops and the Miner as well, so I think that was the only option I had, but it worked bad, sadly. <laughs> Yeah, and that, and that just happens sometimes, right? So yeah. then going into game number two, this is where I even said on camera, we saw a smile out of you. It looked like you loosened up a little bit. Was it because you found yourself in a better matchup or do you think you just played better and got a little bit more calm in game number two? Um, the game number two for me was the best played by me. Uh, for two reasons. The first is that I didn't get first played by him, like in the first and the third game he threw the lava and a giant in mm -hmm. the four five first cards, so that broke me so hard. But in the second I think uh, he couldn't attack uh, in the first card, so I, had, I could um, enter to the game and be more solid in the defenses. Yeah, so then you talked about game number three, that Electro Giant came down. I saw that you looked maybe a little annoyed by that. Talk to me about your matchup in game number three, and then talk to me about those final moments of that insane back and forth. Yeah, um, the third game, probably the coach say him that if you see a Mad Witch and a Fisher, because I'm known for playing RG, the Royal Giant Giant, um, if you see that, you have to do the Giant Fuse play because that is the way you can beat the RG easily. Um, so I was a little bit angry because it's not too healthy for the game to do that play, but anyway, it's a strategy, so it's important. So what happened in those final moments? It looked like Boss kind of had your number. He lined up that magic arch archer earlier on. You were down in damage, like you said. It seemed like Boss knew the matchup. What happened in those final seconds? I don't remember. I just remember when <laughs> the game finished and I could throw the lightning. Um, when I saw the magic archer hitting the other side, it was so happy and uh, I don't know. <laughs> Well, congratulations, man. You have a big day ahead of you tomorrow. I'm sure there's a lot of work that you need to put in. How are you feeling about your opponent that you're going to be facing against tomorrow? Um, I prefer to I prefer to be uh, to play against Ali because he's my friend. I know him like uh, three, four years ago, so it was a little bit funnier. But uh, I don't know. He's a good player. He's I can see a little bit better than Boss. So we'll be even harder. Um, that's it. All right, man. Well, hey, maybe you can get a little bit of revenge there for your countrymen. Thank you so much for taking time to sit down and talk to me. Great job today. And you gave us probably the most exciting matchup out of all 16. So once again, congratulations, man. We're excited to see you tomorrow. Thank you, man. <laughs> I just had to know, man. I mean, right? How could you not ask what happened in those final moments? And he didn't yeah. really have much to offer me either. <laughs> No, every once in a while you just black out and try to make it happen, and that's what uh, that's what he did there. And you know, it's that it's it's better to have that work out than the opposite. So you <laughs> yeah. know, nice work, way to get the win, and move on to join our final sixteen. But Andrew, it's a nice win, it's a nice bit of money, but it's only half the journey. And now he has to go join the remainder, of the other fifteen players, and only half of them are going on. Yeah, it's crazy, man. This LCQ format is grueling. It is unforgiving, but I got to admit, I absolutely love it. Every single day, we're dropping half of the competitors remaining, right? We go from 32 to 16 today. Tomorrow, it's from 16 to 8, and those 8 will go to World Finals.
and we have some great matchups there. And of course, you can be a part of that by tuning in tomorrow, wherever you're watching right now, YouTube, Twitch, go ahead and come back again. Manana, manana will be at the same time. It's going to be half the, half the length. There's only eight matches rather than 16, but it's going to be eight phenomenal matches. And of course, we'll give you a ton of information about Clash Royale League World Finals yes. tomorrow if you're right back here. I cannot wait for World Finals. It's going to be a massive prize pool. And you know, at least half the guys that you see standing still at the end of the day will be there, at least in the beginning of our World Finals as the other 24 wait in the wings for their potential opponents we are almost at the end of the year we are almost at the end of crl 2021 but still so much incredible gameplay left on the horizon if you haven't yet if you're on youtube subscribe if you're on twitch follow and heck why not subscribe as well make sure you're back here for all of it there's so much more clash around to be played for andrew guy eric benamu joshua ah crap sharon and myself rich slayton thanks so much for watching we'll see you back here tomorrow as always be excellent to each other. Bye.